The Cask of Amontillado by Edgar Allan Poe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The thousand injuries of Fortunato I had borne as best I could, but when he ventured upon insult, I vowed revenge. You, who so well know the nature of my soul, will not suppose, however, that I gave utterance to a threat. At length I would be avenged. This was a point definitively settled, but the very definitiveness with which it was resolved precluded the idea of risk. I must not only punish, but punish with impunity. A wrong is unredressed when retribution overtakes its redresser. It is equally unredressed when the avenger fails to make himself felt as such to him who has done the wrong. It must be understood that neither by word nor deed had I given Fortunato cause to doubt my good will. I continued, as was my wont, to smile in his face, and he did not perceive that my smile now was at the thought of his immolation. He had a weak point, this Fortunato, although in other regards he was a man to be respected and even feared. He prided himself on his connoisseurship in wine. Few Italians have the true virtuoso spirit, for the most part their enthusiasm is adopted to suit the time and opportunity to practice imposture upon the British and Australian millionaires. In painting and gemmary, Fortunato, like his countrymen, was a quack. But in the matter of old wines, he was sincere. In this respect, I did not differ from him materially. I was skillful in the Italian vintages myself and bought largely whenever I could. It was about dusk one evening, during the supreme madness of the carnival season, that I encountered my friend. He accosted me with excessive warmth, for he had been drinking much. The man wore motley. He had on a tight-fitting, party-striped dress, and his head was surmounted by the conical cap and bells. I was so pleased to see him that I thought I should never have done wringing his hand. I said to him, "'My dear Fortunato, you are luckily met.' How remarkably well you are looking today, but I have received a pipe of what passes for Amontillado, and I have my doubts. How, he said, Amontillado? A pipe? Impossible. And in the middle of carnival. I have my doubts, I replied, and I was silly enough to pay the full Amontillado price without consulting you in the matter. You were not to be found, and I was fearful of losing a bargain. Amontillado? I have my doubts. Amontillado? and I must satisfy them. Amontillado! As you are engaged, I am on my way to Lucchesi. If any one has a critical turn, it is he. He will tell me. Lucchesi cannot tell Amontillado from Sherry. And yet some fools will have it that his taste is a match for your own. Come, let us go. Whither? To your vaults. My friend, no. I will not impose upon your good nature. I perceive you have an engagement. Lucchesi, I have no engagement. Come. My friend, no, it is not the engagement, but the severe cold with which I perceive you are afflicted. The vaults are insufferably damp. They are encrusted with nitre. Let us go, nevertheless. The cold is merely nothing. Amontillado. You have been opposed upon, and as for Lucchesi, he cannot distinguish Sherry from Amontillado. Thus speaking, Fortunato possessed himself of my arm. Putting on a mask of black silk and drawing a role clair closely about my person, I suffered him to hurry me to my palazzo. There were no attendants at home. They had absconded to make merry in honor of the time. I had told them that I should not return until morning, and had given them explicit orders not to stir from the house. These orders were sufficient. I well knew to ensure their immediate disappearance, one and all, as soon as my back was turned. I took from the sconces two flambeaux, and giving one to Fortunato, bowed him through several suites of rooms to the archway that led into the vaults. I passed down a long and winding staircase, requesting him to be cautious as he followed. We came at length to the foot of the descent, and stood together on the damp ground of the catacombs of the Montressors. The gait of my friend was unsteady, and the bells upon his cap jingled as he strode. The pipe, said he. It is farther on, said I but observe the white web work which gleams from these cavern walls. He turned towards me and looked into my eyes with two filmy orbs that distilled the room of intoxication. Nitre? 
he asked at length. Nitre, I replied. How long have you had that cough? <coughs> My poor friend found it impossible to reply for many minutes. It is nothing, he said at last. Come, I said with decision. We will go back. Your health is precious. You are rich, respected, admired, beloved. You are happy as I once was. You are a man to be missed. For me, it is no matter. We will go back. You will be ill, and I cannot be responsible. Besides, there is Lucchesi. Enough, he said. The cough is a mere nothing. It will not kill me. I shall not die of a cough. True. True, I replied. And indeed, I had no intention of alarming you unnecessarily. But you should use all proper caution. A draft of this Madoc will help defend us from the damps. Here, I knocked off the neck of a bottle, which I drew from a long row of its fellows that lay upon the mold. Drink, I said, presenting him the wine. He raised it to his lips with a leer. He paused and nodded to me familiarly, while his bells jingled. I drink, he said, to the buried that repose around us, and I to your long life. He again took my arm, and we proceeded. These vaults, he said, are extensive. The Montressors, I replied, were a great and numerous family. I forget your arms. A human foot d'or in a field of azure, the foot crushes a serpent rampant whose fangs are embedded in the heel. And the motto? Nemo me impune la cessit. Good, he said. The wine sparkled in his eyes and the bells jingled. My own fancy grew warm with the madoc. We had passed through the walls of piled bones, with cacks and punchons intermingling, into the inmost recesses of the catacombs. I paused again, and this time I made bold to seize Fortunato by an arm above the elbow. The nitre, I said. See, it increases. It hangs like moss upon the vaults. We are below the river's bed. The drops of moisture trickle among the bones. Come, we will go back ere it is too late. Your cough. It is nothing, he said. Let us go on. But first, another draught of the Madoc. I broke and reached him a flagon of de Grave. He emptied it at a breath. His eyes flashed with a fierce light. He laughed and threw the bottle upwards with a gesticulation I did not understand. I looked at him in surprise. He repeated the movement, a grotesque one. You do not comprehend, he said. Not I, I replied. Then you are not of the Brotherhood. How? You are not of the Masons. Yes, yes, I said. Yes, yes. You? Impossible. A Mason? A Mason, I replied. A sign, he said. It is this, I answered, producing a trowel from beneath my roll eclair. You jest, he reclaimed, recoiling a few paces. But let us proceed to the Amontillado. Be it so, I said, replacing the tool beneath the cloak and again offering him my arm. He leaned upon it heavily. We continued our route in search of the Amontillado. We passed through a range of low arches, descended, passed on, and descending again, arrived at a deep crypt, in which the foulness of the air caused our flambeau rather to glow than flame. At the most remote end of the crypt there appeared another, less spacious. Its walls had been lined with human remains, piled to the vault overhead, in the fashion of the great catacombs of Paris. Three sides of this interior crypt were still ornamented in this manner. From the fourth, the bones had been thrown down and lay promiscuously upon the earth, forming at one point a mound of some size. Within the wall, thus exposed by the displacing of the bones, we perceived a still interior recess, in depth about four feet, in width three, in height six or seven. It seemed to have been constructed for no special use in itself, but formed merely the interval between two of the colossal supports of the roof of the catacombs, and was backed by one of their circumscribing walls of solid granite. It was in vain that Fortunato, uplifting his dull torch, endeavored to pry into the depths of the recess. Its termination, the feeble light did not enable us to see. Proceed, I said, herein is the Amontillado. As for Lucchesi, he is an ignoramus, interrupted my friend as he stepped unsteadily forward, while I followed immediately at his heels. In an instant he had reached the extremity of the niche, and finding his progress arrested by the rock, stood stupidly bewildered. 
A moment more and I had fettered him to the granite. In its surface were two iron staples, distanced from each other about two feet horizontally. From one of these depended a short chain, from the other a padlock. Throwing the links about his waist, it was but the work of a few seconds to secure it. He was too much astounded to resist. Withdrawing the key, I stepped back from the recess. Pass your hand, I said, over the wall. You cannot help feeling the nitre. Indeed, it is very damp. Once more, let me implore you to return. No? Then I must positively leave you. But I must first render you all the little attentions in my power. The Amontillado! ejaculated my friend, not yet recovered from his astonishment. True, I replied, the Amontillado. As I said these words, I busied myself among the pile of bones of which I had before spoken. Throwing them aside, I soon uncovered a quantity of building stone and mortar. With these materials, and with the aid of my trowel, I began vigorously to wall up the entrance of the niche. I had scarcely laid the first tier of the masonry when I discovered that the intoxication of Fortunato had in a great measure worn off. The earliest indication I had of this was a low moaning cry from the depths of the recess. It was not the cry of a drunken man. There was then a long and obstinate silence. I laid the second tier, and the third, and the fourth, and then I heard the furious vibrations of the chain. The noise lasted for several minutes, during which, that I might hearken to it with the more satisfaction, I ceased my labors and sat down upon the bones. When at last the clanking subsided, I resumed the trowel and finished without interruption the fifth, sixth, and seventh tier. The wall was now nearly upon a level with my breast. I again paused, and holding the flambeau over the mason work, threw a few feeble rays upon the figure within. A succession of loud and shrill screams, bursting suddenly from the throat of the chained form, seemed to thrust me violently back. For a brief moment I hesitated. I trembled. Unsheathing my rapier, I began to grope with it about the recess, but the thought of an instant reassured me. I placed my hand upon the solid fabric of the catacombs and felt satisfied. I reapproached the wall. I replied to the yells of him who clamored. I re-echoed. I aided. I surpassed them in volume and in strength. I did this, and the clamorer grew still. It was now midnight, and my task was drawing to a close. I had completed the eighth, ninth, and the tenth tier. I had finished a portion of the last and the eleventh. There remained but a single stone to be fitted and plastered in. I struggled with its weight. I placed it partially in its destined position. But now there came from out of the niche a low laugh that erected the hairs upon my head. It was succeeded by a sad voice, which I had difficulty in recognizing as that of the noble Fortunato. The voice said, <laughs> A very good joke indeed, an excellent jest. We will have many a rich laugh about it at the palazzo. <laughs> Over our wine. <laughs> The Amontillado, I said. Oh, <laughs> yes, the Amontillado. But it is not getting late. Will they not be awaiting us at the Palazzo? The Lady Fortunato and the rest? Let us be gone. Yes, I said. Let us be gone. For the love of God, Montressor. Yes, I said. For the love of God. But to these words I hearkened in vain for a reply. I grew impatient, and I called aloud. Fortunato! No answer. I called again. Fortunato! No answer still. I thrust a torch through the remaining aperture and let it fall within. There came forth in return only a jingling of the bells. My heart grew sick, on account of the dampness of the catacombs. I hastened to make an end of my labor. I forced the last stone into its position. I plastered it up. Against the new masonry, I re-erected the old rampart of bones. For the half of a century, no mortal has disturbed then. In pace, requisca. End of the Cask of Amontillado. Recording by Daily Blanton. Beyond the Door by Paul Souter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Beyond the Door by Paul Souter
You haven't told me yet how it happened, I said to Mrs. Malkin. She set her lips and eyed me sharply. Didn't you talk with the coroner, sir? Yes, of course, I admitted. But as I understand you found my uncle, I thought... Well, I wouldn't care to say anything about it, she interrupted with decision. This housekeeper of my uncle's was somewhat taller than I, and much heavier, two physical preponderances which afford any woman possessing them an advantage over the inferior male. She appeared a subject for diplomacy rather than argument. Noting her ample jaw, her breadth of cheek, the unsentimental glint of her eye, I decided on conciliation. I placed a chair for her, there in my Uncle Godfrey's study, and dropped into another myself. At least, before we go over the other parts of the house, suppose we rest a little, I suggested, in my most unctuous manner. The place rather gets on one's nerves, don't you think so? It was sheer luck, I claim no credit for it. My chance reflection found the weak spot in her fortifications. She replied to it with an undoubted smack of satisfaction. It's more than seven years that I've been doing for Mr. Sarston, sir, bringing him his meals regular as clockwork, keeping the house clean, as clean as he had let me, and sleeping at my own home o' nights. And in all that time I've said over and over, there ain't a house in New York the equal of this for queerness. Nor anywhere else, I encouraged her with a laugh, and her confidence is opened another notch. You're likely right in that too, sir. And as I've said to poor Mr. Sarston many a time, it's all well enough, says I, to have bugs for a hobby. You can afford it, and being a bachelor and by yourself, you don't have to consider other people's likes and dislikes, and it's all well enough if you want to, says I, to keep thousands and thousands of them in cabinets all over the place, the way you do. But when it comes to pinning them on the walls in regular armies, I says, and on the ceiling of your own study, and even on different parts of the furniture, so that a body don't know what awful thing she's a-going to find under a hand of a sudden when she does the dusting, why, then, I says to him, it's driving a decent woman too far. And did he never try to reform his ways when you told him that? I asked, smiling. To be frank with you, Mr. Robinson, when I talked like that to him, he generally raised my pay. And what was a body to do then? I can't see how Lucy Lawden stood the place as long as she did, I observed, watching Mrs. Malkin's red face very closely. She swallowed the bait and leaned forward, hands on knees. Poor girl, it got on her nerves. But she was the quiet kind. You never saw her, sir. I shook my head. One of them slim, faded girls with light hair and hardly a word to say for herself. I don't believe she got to know the next-door neighbour in the whole year she lived with your uncle. She was an orphan, wasn't she, sir? Yes, I said. Godfrey Sarston and I were her only living relatives. That's why she came from Australia to stay with him after her father's death. Mrs. Malkin nodded. I was hoping that, by putting a cheek on my eagerness, I could lead her on to a number of things I greatly desired to know. Up to the time I had induced the housekeeper to show me through this strange house of my Uncle Godfrey's, the whole affair had been a mystery of lips which closed and faces which were averted at my approach. Even the coroner seemed unwilling to tell me just how my uncle had died. Did you understand she was going to live with him, sir? asked Mrs. Malkin looking hard at me. I confined myself to a nod. Or so did I. Yet after a year back she went. She went suddenly, I suggested. So suddenly that I never knew a thing about it until after she was gone. I came to do my chores one day and she was here. I came the next and she had started back to Australia. That's how sudden she went. They must have had a falling out, I conjectured. I suppose it was because of the house. Maybe it was and maybe it wasn't. You know of other reasons? I have eyes in my head, she said, but I'm not going to talk about it. Shall we be getting on now, sir? I tried another lead. I hadn't seen my uncle in five years, you know. He seemed terribly changed. He was not an old man by any means, yet when I saw him at the funeral, I paused expectantly. To my relief, she responded readily. He looked that way for the last few months, especially the last week. I spoke to him about it two days before, before it happened, sir, and told him he'd do well to see the doctor again, but he cut me off short. My sister took sick the same day and I was called out of town. The next time I saw him, he was... She paused and then went on, sobbing. To think of him, 
lying there in that awful place and calling and calling for me, as I know he must, and me not around to hear him. As she stopped again, suddenly, and threw a suspicious glance at me, I hastened to insert a matter-of-fact question. Did he appear ill on that last day? Not so much ill as... Yes, I prompted. She was silent for a long time, while I waited, afraid that some word of mine had brought back her former attitude of hostility. Then she seemed to make up her mind. I oughtn't say another word. I've said too much already. But you've been liberal with me, sir, and I know something you've a right to be told, which I'm thinking no one else is a-going to tell you. Look at the bottom of this study door a minute, sir. I followed her direction. What I saw led me to drop to my hands and knees, the better to examine it. Why should he put a rubber strip on the bottom of his door? I asked, getting up. She replied with another enigmatical suggestion. Look at these, if you will, sir. You remember that he slept in this study? That was his bed over there in the alcove. Bolts, I exclaimed, and I reinforced sight with touch by shooting one of them back and forth a few times. Double bolts on the inside of his bedroom door. An upstairs room at that. What was the idea? Mrs. Malkin portentously shook her head and sighed, as one unburdening her mind. Only this I can say, sir. He was afraid of something. Terribly afraid, sir. Something that came in the night. What was it? I demanded. I don't know, sir. It was in the night that... It happened, I asked. She nodded. Then, as if the prologue were over, as if she had prepared my mind sufficiently, she produced something from under her apron... She must have been holding it there all the time. It's his diary, sir. It was lying here on the floor. I saved it for you, before the police could get their hands on it. I opened the little book. One of the sheets near the back was crumpled, and I glanced at it idly. What I read there impelled me to slap the covers shut again. Did you read this? I demanded. She met my gaze, frankly. I looked into it, sir, just as you did. I only just looked into it. Not for worlds would I do even that again. I noticed some reference here to a slab in the cellar. What slab is that? It covers an old dried-up well, sir. Will you show it to me? You can find it for yourself, sir, if you wish. I'm not going down there, she said decidedly. Ah, well, I've seen enough for today, I told her. I'll take the diary back to my hotel and read it. I did not return to my hotel, however. In my one brief glance into the little book... I had seen something which had bitten into my soul, only a few words, but they had brought me very near to that queer solitary man who had been my uncle. I dismissed Mrs. Malkin and remained in the study. There was the fitting place to read the diary he had left behind him. His personality lingered like a vapour in that study. I settled into his deep Morris chair and turned it to catch the light from the single narrow window. The light doubtless by which he had written much of his work on entomology. That same struggling illumination played shadowy tricks with hosts of wall erucified insects, which seemed engaged in a united effort to crawl upward in sinuous lines. Some of their number, impaled to the ceiling itself, peered quiveringly down on the aspiring multitude. The whole house, with its crisp dead rustling in any vagrant breeze, brought back to my mind the hand that had pinned them, one by one, on wall and ceiling and furniture. A kindly hand, I reflected, though eccentric, one not to be turned aside from its single hobby. When quiet, peering Uncle Godfrey went, there passed out another of those scientific enthusiasts, whose passion for exact truth in some one direction had extended the bounds of human knowledge, could not his unquestioned merits have been balanced against his sin? Was it necessary to even-handed justice that he die face to face with horror, struggling with the thing he most feared? I ponder the question still, though his body, strangely bruised, has been long at rest. The entries in the little book began with the 15th of June. Everything before that date had been torn out. There, in the room where it had been written, I read my Uncle Godfrey's diary. It is done. I am trembling so that the words will hardly form under my pen. But my mind is collected. My course was for the best. Suppose I had married her. 
she would have been unwilling to live in this house. At the outset her wishes would have come between me and my work, and that would have been only the beginning. As a married man I could not have concentrated properly. I could not have surrounded myself with the atmosphere indispensable to the writing of my book. My scientific message would never have been delivered. As it is, though my heart is sore, I shall stifle these memories in work. I wish I had been more gentle with her, especially when she sank to her knees before me tonight. She kissed my hand. I should not have repulsed her so roughly. In particular, my words could have been better chosen. I said to her, bitterly, Get up, and don't nuzzle my hand like a dog. She rose without a word and left me. How was I to know that within an hour uh, I am largely to blame? Yet, had I taken any other course afterward than the one I did, the authorities would have misunderstood. Again, there followed a space from which the sheets had been torn, but from the 16th of July all the pages were intact. Something had come over the writing, too. It was still precise and clear, my Uncle Godfrey's characteristic hand, but the letters were less firm. As the entries approached the end, this difference became still more marked. Here follows, then, the whole of his story, or as much of it as will ever be known. I shall let his words speak for him, without further interruption. My nerves are becoming more seriously affected. If certain annoyances do not shortly cease, I shall be obliged to procure medical advice. To be more specific, I find myself at times obsessed by an almost uncontrollable desire to descend to the cellar and lift the slab over the old well. I never have yielded to the impulse, but it has persisted for minutes together with such intensity that I have had to put work aside and literally hold myself down in my chair. This insane desire comes only in the dead of night, when its disquieting effect is heightened by the various noises peculiar to the house. For instance, there often is a draught of air along the hallways, which causes a rustling among the specimens impaled on the walls. Lately, too, there have been other nocturnal sounds, strongly suggestive of the busy clamour of rats and mice. This calls for investigation, I have been at considerable expense to make the house proof against rodents, which might destroy some of my best specimens. If some structural defect has opened a way for them, the situation must be corrected at once. July 17th. The foundations and cellar were examined today by a workman. He states positively that there is no place of ingress for rodents. He contented himself with looking at the slab over the old well without lifting it. July 19th. While I was sitting in this chair late last night writing, the impulse to descend to the cellar suddenly came upon me with tremendous insistence. I yielded, which, perhaps, was as well, for at least I satisfied myself that the disquiet which possesses me has no external cause. The long journey through the hallways was difficult. Several times I was keenly aware of the same sounds perhaps I should say, the same impressions of sounds that I had erroneously laid to rats. I am convinced now that they are mere symptoms of my nervous condition. Further indications of this came in the fact that, as I opened the cellar door, the small noises abruptly ceased. There was no final scamper of tiny footfalls to suggest rats disturbed their occupations. Indeed, I was conscious of a certain impression of expectant silence, as if the thing behind the noises, whatever it was, had paused to watch me enter its domain. Throughout my time in the cellar, I seemed surrounded by the same atmosphere. Sheer nerves, of course. In the main, I held myself well under control. As I was about to leave the cellar, however, I unguardedly glanced back over my shoulder at the stone slab covering the old well. At that, a violent tremor came over me, and, losing all command, I rushed back up the cellar stairs, thence to this study, my nerves playing me sorry tricks. 
July 30th. For more than a week, all has been well. The tone of my nerves seems distinctly better. Mrs. Malkin, who has remarked several times lately upon my paleness, expressed a conviction this afternoon that I am nearly my old self again. This is encouraging. I was beginning to fear that the severe strain of the past few months had left an indelible mark upon me. With continued health, I shall be able to finish my book by spring. July 31st. Mrs. Malkin remained rather late tonight in connection with some item of housework, and it was quite dark when I returned to my study from bolting the street door after her. The blackness of the upper hall, which the former owner of the house inexplicably failed to wire for electricity, was profound. As I came to the top of the second flight of stairs, something clutched at my foot, and, for an instant, almost pulled me back. I freed myself and ran to the study. August 3rd. Again, the awful insistence. I sit here with this diary upon my knee, and it seems that fingers of iron are tearing at me. I will not go. My nerves may be utterly unstrung again. I fear they are. But I am still their master. August 4th. I did not yield last night. After a bitter struggle, which must have lasted nearly an hour, the desire to go to the cellar suddenly departed. I must not give in at any time. August 5th. Tonight, the rat noises, I shall call them that for want of a more appropriate term, are very noticeable. I went to the length of unbolting my door and stepping into the hallway to listen. After a few minutes, I seemed to be aware of something large and grey watching me from the darkness at the end of the passage. This is a bizarre statement, of course, but it exactly describes my impression. I withdrew hastily into the study and bolted the door. Now that my nervous condition is so palpably affecting the optic nerve, I must not much longer delay seeing a specialist, but... How much shall I tell him? August 8th. Several times tonight while sitting here at my work, I have seemed to hear soft footsteps in the passage. Nerves again, of course. Or else some new trick of the wind among the specimens on the walls. August 9th. By my watch it is four o'clock in the morning. My mind is made up to record the experience I have passed through. Calmness may come that way. Feeling rather fatigued last night from the strain of a weary day of research, I retired early. My sleep was more refreshing than usual, as it is likely to be when one is genuinely tired. I awakened, however. It must have been about an hour ago. With a start of tremendous violence, there was moonlight in the room. My nerves were on edge, but, for a moment, I saw nothing unusual. Then... Glancing toward the door, I perceived what appeared to be thin, white fingers thrust under it, exactly as if someone outside the door were trying to attract my attention in that manner. I rose and turned on the light, but the fingers were gone. Needless to say, I did not open the door. I write the occurrence down, just as it took place, or as it seemed, but I cannot trust myself to comment upon it. August 10th have fastened heavy rubber strips on the bottom of my bedroom door. August 15th. All quiet, for several nights. I am hoping that the rubber strips, being something definite and tangible, have had a salutary effect upon my nerves. Perhaps I shall not need to see a doctor. August 17th. Once more, I have been aroused from sleep. The interruptions seem to come always at the same hour. About three o'clock in the morning... I had been dreaming of the well in the cellar, the same dream, over and over. Everything black except for the slab and the figure with bowed head and averted face sitting there. Also, I had vague dreams about a dog. Can it be that my last words to her have impressed that on my mind? I must pull myself together. In particular, I must not, under any pressure, yield and visit the cellar after nightfall. August 18th. I'm feeling much more hopeful. Mrs. Malkin remarked on it while serving dinner. This improvement is due largely to a consultation I've had with Dr. Sartwell, 
the distinguished specialist in nervous diseases. I went into full details with him, accepting certain reservations. He scouted the idea that my experiences could be other than purely mental. When he recommended a change of scene, which I had been expecting, I told him positively that it was out of the question. He said then that with the aid of a tonic and an occasional sleeping draught, I am likely to progress well enough at home. This is distinctly encouraging. I erred in not going to him at the start. Without doubt, most, if not all, of my hallucinations could have been averted. I have been suffering a needless penalty from my nerves for an action I took solely in the interests of science. I have no disposition to tolerate it further. From today, I shall report regularly to Dr. Sartwell. August 19th. Used the sleeping draught last night with gratifying results. The doctor says I must repeat the dose for several nights until my nerves are well under control again. August 21st. All well. It seems that I have found the way out, a very simple and prosaic way. I might have avoided much needless annoyance by seeking expert advice at the beginning. Before retiring last night, I unbolted my study door and took a turn up and down the passage. I felt no trepidation. The place was as it used to be, before those fancies assailed me. A visit to the cellar after nightfall will be the test for my complete recovery but I am not yet quite ready for that. Patience. August 22nd. I have just read yesterday's entry, thinking to steady myself. It is cheerful, almost gay, that there are other entries like it in preceding pages. I am a mouse in the grip of a cat. Let me have freedom for ever so short a time, and I begin to rejoice at my escape. Then the paw descends again. It is four in the morning. The usual hour. I retired rather late last night, after administering the draught, instead of the dreamless sleep which heretofore has followed the use of the drug, the slumber into which I fell was punctuated by recurrent visions of the slab, with the bowed figure upon it. Also, I had one poignant dream in which the dog was involved. At length I awakened, and reached mechanically for the light switch beside my bed, when my hand encountered nothing, I suddenly realized the truth. I was standing in my study, with my other hand upon the doorknob. It required only a moment, of course, to find the light and switch it on. I saw then that the bolt had been drawn back. The door was quite unlocked. My awakening must have interrupted me in the very act of opening it. I could hear something moving restlessly in the passage outside the door. August 23rd. I must beware of sleeping at night. Without confiding the fact to Dr. Sartwell, I have begun to take the drug in the daytime. At first Mrs. Malkin's views on the subject were pronounced, but my explanation of doctor's orders has silenced her. I am awake for breakfast and supper, and sleep in the hours between. She is leaving me each evening, a cold lunch to be eaten at midnight. August 26th. Several times I have caught myself nodding in my chair. The last time I am sure that, on arousing, I perceive the rubber strip under the door bend inward, as if something were pushing it from the other side. I must not, under any circumstances, permit myself to fall asleep. September 2nd. Mrs. Malkin is to be away because of her sister's illness. I cannot help dreading her absence. Though she is here only in the daytime, even that companionship is very welcome. September 3rd. Let me put this into writing. The mere labor of composition has a soothing influence upon me. God knows I need such an influence now as ever before. In spite of all my watchfulness, I fell asleep tonight across my bed. I must have been utterly exhausted. The dream I had was the one about the dog. I was patting the creature's head over and over. I awoke at last to find myself in darkness and in a standing position. There was a suggestion of chill and earthiness in the air. While I was drowsily trying to get my bearings, I became aware that something was nuzzling my hand, as a dog might do. Still saturated with my dream, I was not greatly astonished. 
I extended my hand to pat the dog's head. That brought me to my senses. I was standing in the cellar. The thing before me was not a dog. I cannot tell how I fled back up the cellar stairs. I know, however, that as I turned, the slab was visible, and in spite of the darkness with something sitting upon it, all the way up the stairs hands snatched at my feet. This entry seemed to finish the diary, for blank pages followed it, but I remembered the crumpled sheet near the back of the book. It was partly torn out, as if a hand had clutched it convulsively. The writing on it, too, was markedly in contrast to the precise, albeit nervous, penmanship of even the last entry I had perused. I was forced to hold the scrawl up to the light to decipher it. This is what I read. My hand keeps on writing, in spite of myself. What is this? I do not wish to write, but it compels me. Yes, yes, I will tell the truth. I will tell the truth. A heavy blot followed partly covering the writing. With difficulty, I made it out. The guilt is mine, mine only. I loved her too well, yet I was unwilling to marry. Though she entreated me on her knees, though she kissed my hand, I told her my scientific work came first. She did it herself. I was not expecting that. I swear I was not expecting it. But I was afraid the authorities would misunderstand. So I took what seemed the best course. She had no friends here who would inquire. It is waiting outside my door. I feel it. It compels me. Through my thoughts, my hand keeps on writing. I must not fall asleep. I must think only of what I am writing. I must... Then came the words I had seen when Mrs. Malkin had handed me the book. They were written very large. In places, the pen had dug through the paper. Though they were scrawled, I read them at a glance. Not the slab in the cellar. Not that. Oh, my God, anything but that. Anything. By what strange compulsion was the hand forced to write down what was in the brain, even to the ultimate thoughts, even to those final words? The grey light from outside, slanting down through two dull little windows, sank into the sodden hole near the inner wall. The coroner and I stood in the cellar, but not too near the hole. A small, demonstrative dark man, the chief of detectives, stood a little apart from us, his eyes intent, his natural animation suppressed. We were watching the stooped shoulders of a police constable who was angling in the well. "'See anything, Walters?' inquired the detective raspingly. The policeman shook his head. The little man turned his questioning to me. "'You're quite sure?' he demanded. "'Ask the coroner. He saw the diary.' I told him. Oh, I'm afraid there can be no doubt, the coroner confirmed in his heavy, tired voice. He was an old man with lacklustre eyes. It had seemed best to me on the whole that he should read my uncle's diary. His position entitled him to all the available facts. What we were seeking in the well might especially concern him. He looked at me opaquely now, while the policeman bent double again. Then he spoke like one who reluctantly and at last does his duty. He nodded toward the slab of grey stone, which lay in the shadow to the left of the well. It doesn't seem very heavy, does it? He suggested, in an undertone. I shook my head. Still, it's stone, I demurred. A man would have to be rather strong to lift it. To lift it, yes. He glanced about the cellar. Ah, I forgot, he said abruptly. It is in my office. As part of the evidence, he went on half to himself. A man, even though not very strong, could take a stick, for instance, the stick that is now in my office, and prop up the slab. If you wish to look into the well, he whispered. The policeman interrupted, straightening again with a groan and laying his electric torch beside the well. It's breaking my back, he complained. There's dirt down there. It seems loose, but I can't get through it. "'Somebody'll have to go down,' the detective cut in. "'I'm lighter than you, Walters. I'm not afraid, sir.' "'Didn't say you were,' the little man snapped. "'There's nothing down there anyway, though we'll have to prove that, I suppose.' He glanced truculently at me, but went on talking to the constable. "'Rig the rope around me and don't bungle the knot. I've no intention of falling into the place.' 
There is something there, whispered the coroner slowly to me. His eyes left the little detective and the policeman carefully tying and testing knots and turned again to the square slab of stone. Suppose, while a man was looking into that hole, with the stone propped up, he should accidentally knock the prop away. He was still whispering. A stone so light that he could prop it up wouldn't be heavy enough to kill him, I objected. No, he laid a hand on my shoulder. Not to kill him. To paralyze him, if it struck the spine in a certain way, to render him helpless, but not unconscious. The post-mortem would disclose that through the bruises on the body. The policeman and the detective had adjusted the knots to their satisfaction. They were bickering now as to the details of the descent. Would that cause death? I whispered. You must remember that the housekeeper was absent for two days. In two days, even that pressure, he stared at me hard to make sure that I understood. With the head down, again the policeman interrupted, I'll stand at the well if you gentlemen will grab the rope behind me. It won't be much of a pull. I'll take the brunt of it. We led the little man down with the electric torch strapped to his waist and some sort of implement, a trowel or a small spade in his hand. He seemed a long time before his voice, curiously hollow, directed us to stop. The hole must have been deep. We braced ourselves. I was second, the coroner last. The policeman relieved his strain somewhat by snagging the rope against the edge of the well, but I marvelled, nevertheless, at the ease with which he held the weight. Very little of it came to me. A noise like muffled scratching reached us from below. Occasionally, the rope shook and shifted slightly at the edge of the hole. At last, the detective's hollow voice spoke. What does he say? The coroner demanded. The policeman turned his square, dogged face toward us. I think he's found something, he explained. The rope jerked and shifted again. Some sort of struggle seemed to be going on below. The weight suddenly increased, and as suddenly lessened, as if something had been grasped, then had managed to elude the grasp and slip away. I could catch the detective's rapid breathing now, also the sound of inarticulate speech in his hollow voice. The next words I caught came more clearly. They were a command to pull up. At the same moment, the weight on the rope grew heavier and remained so. The policeman's big shoulders began straining rhythmically. All together, he directed. Take it easy. Pull when I do. Slowly, the rope passed through our hands. With each fresh grip that we took, a small section of it dropped to the floor behind us. I began to feel the strain. I could tell from the coroner's laboured breathing that he felt it more, being an old man. The policeman, however, seemed untiring. The rope tightened suddenly, and there was an ejaculation from below, just below. Still holding fast, the policeman contrived to stoop over and look. He translated the ejaculation for us. Let down a little. He stuck with it against the side. We slackened the rope, until the detective's voice gave us the word again. The rhythmic tugging continued. Something dark appeared, quite abruptly at the top of the hole. My nerves leapt in spite of me, but it was merely the top of the detective's head, his dark hair. Something white came next, his pale face with staring eyes. Then his shoulders bowed forward, the better to support what was in his arms. Then I looked away. But as he laid his burden down at the side of the well, the detective whispered to us, He had her covered up with dirt! Covered up! He began to laugh, a little high cackle, like a child's, until the coroner took him by the shoulders and deliberately shook him. Then the policeman led him out of the cellar. It was not then, but afterward, that I put my question to the coroner. Tell me, I demanded. People pass there at all hours. Why didn't my uncle call for help? I have thought of that he replied. I believe he did call, I think. Probably he screamed, but his head was down and he couldn't raise it. His screams must have been swallowed up in the well. You are sure he didn't murder her? He had given me that assurance before, but I wished it again. Almost sure, he declared, though it was on his account undoubtedly that she killed herself. Few of us are punished as accurately for our sins as he was. One should be thankful even for crumbs of comfort, I am thankful. But there are times when my uncle's face rises before me. After all, we were the same blood. Our sympathies had much in common. Under any given circumstances, 
Our thoughts and feelings must have been largely the same. I seemed to see him in that final death march along the unlighted passageway, obeying an imperative summons, going on, step by step, down the stairway to the first floor, down the cellar stairs at last, lifting the slab. I try not to think of that final expiation. Yet was it final, I wonder? Did the last door of all, when it opened, find him willing to pass through, or was something waiting beyond that door? End of Beyond the Door Burial of the Rats by Bram Stoker This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Burial of the Rats by Bram Stoker Leaving Paris by the Orléans Road, cross the Enceinte, and, turning to the right, you find yourself in a somewhat wild and not at all savory district. Right and left, before and behind, on every side rise great heaps of dust and waste, accumulated by the process of time. Paris has its night as well as its day life, and the sojourner who enters his hotel in the Rue de Rivoli or the Rue Saint-Honoré late at night, or leaves it early in the morning, can guess, in coming near Montrouge, if he has not done so already, the purpose of those great wagons that look like boilers on wheels, which he finds halting everywhere as he passes. Every city has its peculiar institutions, created out of its own needs, and one of the most notable institutions of Paris is its rag-picking population. In the early morning, and Parisian life commences at an early hour, may be seen in most streets standing on the pathway opposite every court and alley and between every few houses, as still in some American cities, even in parts of New York, large wooden boxes into which the domestics or tenement holders empty the accumulated dust of the past day. Round these boxes gather and pass on, when the work is done, to fresh fields of labor and past with which they turn over and probe and examine in the minutest manner the dust bins. They pick up and deposit in their baskets, by aid of their rakes, whatever they might find, with the same facility as a Chinaman uses his chopsticks. Paris is a city of centralization, and centralization and classification are closely allied. In the early times, when centralization is becoming a fact, its forerunner is classification. All things which are similar or analogous become grouped together, and from the grouping of groups rises one whole or central point. We see radiating many long arms with innumerable tentaculi, and in the center rises a gigantic head with a comprehensive brain and keen eyes to look on every side, and ears sensitive to hear, and a voracious mouth to swallow. Other cities resemble all the birds and beasts and fishes whose appetites and digestions are normal. Paris alone is the analogical apotheosis of the octopus. Product of centralization carried to an ad absurdum, it fairly represents the devil fish, and in no respects is the resemblance more curious than in the similarity of the digestive apparatus. Those intelligent tourists who, having surrendered their individuality into the hands of Messrs. Cook or Gaze, do Paris in three days, are often puzzled to know how it is that the dinner, which in London would cost about six shillings, can be had for three francs in a café in the Palais Royal. They need have no more wonder if they will but consider the classification, which is a theoretic speciality of Parisian life, and adopt all round the fact from which the chiffonnier has his genesis. The Paris of 1850 was not like the Paris of today, and those who see the Paris of Napoleon and Baron Haussmann can hardly realize the existence of the state of things forty-five years ago. Amongst other things, however, which have not changed, are those districts where the waste is gathered. Dust is dust all the world over, in every age, and the family likeness of dust heaps is perfect. The traveller, therefore, who visits the environs of Montrouge can go back in fancy without difficulty to the year 1850. In this year I was making a prolonged stay in Paris. I was very much in love with a young lady who, though she returned my passion, 
so far yielded to the wishes of her parents that she had promised not to see me or to correspond with me for a year. I too had been compelled to accede to these conditions under a vague hope of parental approval. During the term of probation I had promised to remain out of the country and not to write to my dear one until the expiration of the year. Naturally the time went heavily with me. There was not one of my own family or circle who could tell me of Alice, and none of her own folk had, I am sorry to say, sufficient generosity to send me even an occasional word of comfort regarding her health and well-being. I spent six months wandering about Europe, but as I could find no satisfactory distraction in travel, I determined to come to Paris, where, at least, I would be within easy hail of London in case any good fortune should call me thither before the appointed time. That hope deferred maketh the heart sick was never better exemplified than in my case, for in addition to the perpetual longing to see the face I loved, there was always with me a harrowing anxiety, lest some accident should prevent me showing Alice in due time that I had, throughout the long period of probation, been faithful to her trust and my own love. Thus every adventure which I undertook had a fierce pleasure of its own, for it was fraught with possible consequences greater than it would have ordinarily borne. Like all travellers, I exhausted the places of most interest in the first month of my stay, and was driven in the second month to look for amusement whithersoever I might. Having made sundry journeys to the better-known suburbs, I began to see that there was a terra incognita, in so far as the guidebook was concerned, in the social wilderness lying between these attractive points. Accordingly, I began to systemize my researches, and each day took up the thread of my exploration at the place where I had on the previous day dropped it. In the process of time, my wanderings led me near Montrouge, and I saw that hereabouts lay the Ultima Thule of social exploration, a country as little known as that round the source of the White Nile, and so I determined to investigate philosophically the chiffonnier, his habitat, his life, and his means of life. This job was an unsavory one, difficult of accomplishment, and with little hope of adequate reward. However, despite reason, obstinacy prevailed, and I entered into my new investigation with a keener energy than I could have summoned to aid me in any investigation leading to any end, valuable or worthy. One day, late in a fine afternoon, toward the end of September, I entered the Holy of Holies in the City of Dust. The place was evidently the recognized abode of a number of chiffoniers, for some sort of arrangement was manifested in the formation of the dust heaps near the road. I passed amongst these heaps, which stood like orderly sentries, determined to penetrate further and trace dust to its ultimate location. As I passed along, I saw behind the dust heaps a few forms that flitted to and fro, evidently watching with interest the advent of any stranger to such a place. The district was like a small Switzerland, and as I went forward my tortuous course shut out the path behind me. Presently I got into what seemed a small city of a community of chiffoniers. There were a number of shanties or huts, such as might be met with in the remote parts of the Bog of Allen, rude places with wattled walls, plastered with mud, and roofs of rude thatch made from stable refuse, such places as one would not like to enter for any consideration, and which even in watercolor could only look picturesque if judiciously treated. In the midst of these huts was one of the strangest adaptations, I cannot say habitations, I had ever seen. An immense old wardrobe, the colossal remnant of some boudoir of Charles the Seventh or Henry the Second, had been converted into a dwelling house. The double doors lay open so that the entire menage was open to public view. In the open half of the wardrobe was a common sitting room of some four feet by six, in which sat smoking their pipes round a charcoal brazier, no fewer than six old soldiers of the First Republic, with their uniforms torn and worn threadbare. Evidently they were of the mauvais sujet class. Their bleary eyes and limp jaws told plainly of a common love of absinthe, and their eyes had that haggard, worn look of slumbering ferocity which follows hard in the wake of drink. The other side stood as of old, with its shelves intact, save that they were cut to half their depth, and in each shelf, of which there were six, was a bed made with rags and straw. The half-dozen of worthies who inhabited this structure looked at me curiously as I passed, and when I looked back after going a little way, 
I saw their heads together in a whispered conference. I did not like the look of this at all, for the place was very lonely, and the men looked very, very villainous. However, I did not see any cause for fear, and went on my way, penetrating further and further into the Sahara. The way was tortuous to a degree, and from going round in a series of semicircles, as one goes in skating with the Dutch roll, I got rather confused with regard to the points of the compass. When I had penetrated a little way, I saw, as I turned to the corner of a half-made heap, sitting on a heap of straw, an old soldier with threadbare coat. Hello, I said to myself. The First Republic is well represented here in its soldiery. As I passed him, the old man never even looked up at me, but gazed on the ground with solid persistency. Again I remarked to myself, See what a life of rude warfare can do. This old man's curiosity is a thing of the past. When I had gone a few steps, however, I looked back suddenly, and saw that curiosity was not dead, for the veteran had raised his head and was regarding me with a very queer expression. He seemed to me to look very like one of the six worthies in the press. When he saw me looking, he dropped his head, and without thinking further of him I went on my way, satisfied that there was a strange likeness between these old warriors. Presently I met another old soldier in a similar manner. He too did not notice me whilst I was passing. By this time it was getting late in the afternoon, and I began to think of retracing my steps. Accordingly I turned to go back, but could see a number of tracks leading between different mounds, and could not ascertain which of them I should take. In my perplexity I wanted to see someone of whom to ask the way, but could see no one. I determined to go on a few mounds further, and so tried to see someone, not a veteran. I gained my object, for after going a couple of hundred yards, I saw before me a single shanty such as I had seen before, with, however, the difference that this was not one for living in, but merely a roof with three walls open in front. From the evidences which the neighborhood exhibited, I took it to be a place for sorting. Within it was an old woman, wrinkled and bent with age. I approached her to ask the way. She rose as I came close, and I asked her my way. She immediately commenced a conversation, and it occurred to me that here, in the very center of the kingdom of dust, was the place to gather details of the history of Parisian rag-picking, particularly as I could do so from the lips of one who looked like the oldest inhabitant. I began my inquiries, and the old woman gave me most interesting answers. She had been one of the Setuses who sat daily before the guillotine, and had taken an active part among the women who signalized themselves by their violence in the revolution. While we were talking, she said suddenly, "'But monsieur must be tired standing,' and dusted a rickety old stool for me to sit down. I hardly liked to do so for many reasons, but the poor old woman was so civil that I did not like to run the risk of hurting her by refusing, and moreover the conversation of one who had been at the taking of the Bastille was so interesting that I sat down, and so our conversation went on. While we were talking an old man, older and more bent and wrinkled even than the woman, appeared from behind the shanty. "'Here is Pierre,' said she. "'Monsieur can hear stories now if he wishes, for Pierre was in everything from the Bastille to Waterloo.' The old man took another stool at my request, and we plunged into a sea of revolutionary reminiscences. This old man, albeit clothed like a scarecrow, was like any one of the six veterans. I was now sitting in the center of the low hut, with the woman on my left hand and the man on my right, each of them being somewhat in front of me. The place was full of all sorts of curious objects of lumber, and of many things that I wished far away. In one corner was a heap of rags, which seemed to move from the number of vermin it contained, and in the other a heap of bones, whose odor was something shocking. Every now and then, glancing at the heaps, I could see the gleaming eyes of some of the rats which infested the place. These loathsome objects were bad enough, but what looked even more dreadful was an old butcher's axe with an iron handle, stained with clots of blood, leaning up against the wall on the right-hand side. Still, these things did not give me much concern. The talk of the two old people was so fascinating that I stayed on and on till the evening came and the dust heaps threw dark shadows over the veils between them. After a time I began to grow uneasy. 
I could not tell how or why, but somehow I did not feel satisfied. Uneasiness is an instinct and means warning. The psychic faculties are often the sentries of the intellect, and when they sound alarm, the reason begins to act, although perhaps not consciously. This was so with me. I began to think me where I was and by what surrounded, and to wonder how I should fare in case I should be attacked. And then the thought suddenly burst upon me, although without any overt cause, that I was in danger. Prudence whispered, Be still and make no sign. And so I was still and made no sign, for I knew that four cunning eyes were on me. Four eyes, if not more. My God, what a horrible thought! The whole shanty might be surrounded on three sides with villains. I might be in the midst of a band of such desperados as only half a century of periodic revolution can produce. With a sense of danger, my intellect and observation quickened, and I grew more watchful than was my wont. I noticed that the old woman's eyes were constantly wandering towards my hands. I looked at them, too, and saw the cause. My rings! On my little left finger I had a large signet, and on the right a good diamond. I thought that if there was any danger, my first care was to avert suspicion. Accordingly, I began to work the conversation round to rag-picking, to the drains, of the things found there, and so by easy stages, to jewels. Then, seizing a favorable opportunity, I asked the old woman if she knew anything of such things. She answered that she did a little. I held out my right hand, and, showing her the diamond, asked her what she thought of that. She answered that her eyes were bad and stooped over my hand. I said as nonchalantly as I could, "'Pardon me, you will see better thus,' and taking it off, handed it to her. An unholy light came into her withered old face as she touched it. She stole one glance at me, swift and keen as a flash of lightning. She bent over the ring for a moment, her face quite concealed as though examining it. The old man looked straight out of the front of the shanty before him at the same time fumbling in his pockets and producing a screw of tobacco in a paper and a pipe, which he proceeded to fill. I took advantage of the pause and the momentary rest from the searching eyes on my face to look carefully round the place, now dim and shadowy in the gloaming. There still lay all the heaps of varied, reeking foulness, there the terrible blood-stained axe leaning against the wall in the right-hand corner, and everywhere, despite the gloom, the baleful glitter of the eyes of the rats. I could see them even through some of the chinks of the boards at the back, low down close to the ground. But stay! These latter eyes seemed more than usually large and bright and baleful. For an instant my heart stood still, and I felt in that whirling condition of mind in which one feels a sort of spiritual drunkenness, and as though the body is only maintained erect in that there is no time for it to fall before recovery. Then, in another second, I was calm, coldly calm, with all my energies in full vigor, with a self-control which I felt to be perfect, and with all my feeling and instincts alert. Now I knew the full extent of my danger. I was being watched and surrounded by desperate people. I could not even guess how many of them were lying there on the ground behind the shanty, waiting for the moment to strike. I knew that I was big and strong, and they knew it too. They knew also, as I did, that I was an Englishman and would make a fight for it. And so we waited. I had, I felt, gained an advantage in the last few seconds, for I knew my danger and understood the situation. Now, I thought, is the test of my courage, the enduring test. The fighting test may come later. The old woman raised her head and said to me in a satisfied kind of way, a very fine ring indeed, a beautiful ring. Oh, me, I once had such rings, plenty of them, and bracelets and earrings. Oh, for in those fine days I let the town a dance. But they've forgotten me now. They've forgotten me. They? Why, they never heard of me. Perhaps their grandfathers remember me. Some of them and she laughed a harsh, croaking laugh. And then I am bound to say that she astonished me, for she handed me back the ring, with a certain suggestion of old-fashioned grace, which was not without its pathos. 
The old man eyed her with a sort of sudden ferocity, half rising from his stool, and said to me suddenly and hoarsely, Let me see. I was about to hand the ring when the old woman said, No, no, do not give it to Pierre. Pierre is eccentric. He loses things. And such a pretty ring. Cat, said the old man savagely. Suddenly the old woman said, rather more loudly than was necessary, Wait, I shall tell you something about a ring. There was something in the sound of her voice that jarred upon me. Perhaps it was my hypersensitiveness, wrought up as I was to such a pitch of nervous excitement, but I seemed to think that she was not addressing me. As I stole a glance round the place, I saw the eyes of the rats in the bone heaps, but missed the eyes along the back. But even as I looked, I saw them again appear. The old woman's, Wait! had given me a respite from attack, and the men had sunk back to their reclining posture. I once lost a ring, a beautiful diamond hoop that had belonged to a queen, and which was given to me by a farmer of the taxes, who afterwards cut his throat because I sent him away. I thought it must have been stolen and taxed my people, but I could get no trace. The police came and suggested that it had found its way to the drain. We descended, I in my fine clothes, for I would not trust them with my beautiful ring. I know more of the drain since then, and of rats too. But I shall never forget the horror of that place. Alive with blazing eyes, a wall of them just outside the light of our torches. Well, we got beneath my house. We searched the outlet of the drain, and there in the field found my ring, and we came out. But we found something else also before we came. As we were coming toward the opening, a lot of sewer rats, human ones this time, came towards us. They told the police that one of their number had gone into the drain, but had not returned. He had gone in only shortly before we had, and, if lost, could hardly be far off. They asked help to seek him, so we turned back. Not far did we go till we came on something. There was but little water and the bottom of the drain was raised with brick, rubbish, and much matter of the kind. He had made a fight for it, even when his torch had gone out. But they were too many for him. They had not been long about it. The bones were still warm, but they had been picked clean. They had even eaten their own dead ones, and there were bones of rats as well as of the man. They took it cool enough, those other, the human ones, and joked of their comrade when they found him dead, though they would have helped him living. Bah! What matters it, life or death? And had you no fear, I asked her? Fear? She said with a laugh, Me have fear? Ask Pierre. But I was younger then, and as I came through that horrible drain with its wall of greedy eyes, always moving with the circle of light from the torches, I did not feel easy. I kept on before the men, though. It is a way I have. I never let the men get it before me. All I want is a chance and a means. And they ate him up, took every trace away except the bones, and no one knew it. No, no sound of him was ever heard. Here she broke into a chuckling fit of the ghastliest merriment which it was ever my lot to hear and see. A great poetess describes her heroine singing, Oh, to see or hear her singing, scarce I know which is the divinest and I can apply the same idea to the old crone, in all save the divinity, for I scarce could tell which was the most hellish. The harsh, malicious, satisfied, cruel laugh 
or the leering grin, and the horrible square opening of the mouth like a tragic mask, and the yellow gleam of the few discolored teeth in the shapeless gums. In that laugh, and with that grin and the chuckling satisfaction, I knew as well as if it had been spoken to me in words of thunder that my murder was settled, and the murderers only bided the proper time for its accomplishment. I could read between the lines of her gruesome story, the commands to her accomplices. Wait, she seemed to say, bide your time. I shall strike the first blow. Find the weapons for me, and I shall make the opportunity. He shall not escape. Keep him quiet, and then no one will be wiser. There will be no outcry, and the rats will do their work. It was growing darker and darker. The night was coming. I stole a glance round the shanty. Still all the same. The bloody axe in the corner, the heaps of filth, and the eyes on the bone heaps and in the crannies of the floor. Pierre had still been ostensibly filling his pipe. He now struck a light and began to puff away at it. The old woman said, Dear heart, how dark it is. Pierre, like a good lad, light the lamp. Pierre got up and with the lighted match in his hand touched the wick of a lamp which hung at one side of the entrance to the shanty, and which had a reflector that threw the light all over the place. It was evidently that which was used for their sorting at night. Not that, stupid! Not that! The lantern! she called out to him. He immediately blew it out, saying, All right, mother, I'll find it. And he hustled about the left corner of the room, the old woman saying through the darkness, The lantern! the lantern. Oh, that is the light that is most useful to us poor folks. The lantern was the friend of the revolution. It is the friend of the chiffonier. It helps us when all else fails. Hardly had she said the word when there was a kind of creaking of the whole place and something was steadily dragged over the roof. Again I seemed to read between the lines of her words. I knew the lesson of the lantern. One of you get on the roof with a noose and strangle him as he passes out if we fail within. As I looked out of the opening, I saw the loop of a rope outlined black against the lurid sky. I was now indeed beset. Pierre was not long in finding the lantern. I kept my eyes fixed through the darkness on the old woman. Pierre struck his light, and by its flash I saw the old woman raise from the ground beside her where it had mysteriously appeared and then hide in the folds of her gown a long, sharp knife or dagger. It seemed to be like a butcher's sharpening iron, fined to a keen point. The lantern was lit. Bring it here, Pierre, she said. Place it in the doorway where we can see it. See how nice it is. It shuts out the darkness from us. It is just right. Just right for her and her purposes. It threw all its light on my face, leaving in gloom the faces of both Pierre and the woman who sat outside of me on each side. I felt that the time of action was now approaching, but I knew now that the first signal and movement would come from the woman, and so watched her. I was all unarmed, but I had made up my mind what to do. At the first movement I would seize the butcher's axe in the right-hand corner and fight my way out. At least I would die hard. I stole a glance round to fix its exact locality so that I could not fail to seize it at the first effort, for then, if ever, time and accuracy would be precious. Good God! It was gone! All the horror of the situation burst upon me, but the bitterest thought of all was that if the issue of the terrible position should be against me, Alice would infallibly suffer. Either she would believe me false, and any lover or anyone who has ever been one can imagine the bitterness of the thought or else she would go on loving long after I had been lost to her and to the world, so that her life would be broken and embittered, shattered with disappointment and despair. The very magnitude of the pain braced me up and served me to bear the dread scrutiny of the plotters. I think I did not betray myself. The old woman was watching me as a cat does a mouse. She had her right hand hidden in the folds of her gown, clutching, I knew, that long, cruel-looking dagger. Had she seen any disappointment in my face, she would, I felt, have known that the moment had come and would have sprung on me like a tigress, certain of taking me unprepared. I looked out into the night, and there I saw new cause for danger. 
before and around the hut were, at a little distance, some shadowy forms. They were quite still, but I knew that they were all alert and on guard. Small chance for me now in that direction. Again I stole a glance round the place. In moments of great excitement and of great danger, which is excitement, the mind works very quickly, and the keenness of the faculties, which depend on the mind, grows in proportion. I now felt this. In an instant I took in the whole situation. I saw that the axe had been taken through a small hole made in one of the rotten boards. How rotten they must be to allow of such a thing being done without a particle of noise. The hut was a regular murder trap and was guarded all around. A garroter lay on the roof, ready to entangle me with his noose if I should escape the dagger of the old hag. In front the way was guarded by I know not how many watchers, and at the back was a row of desperate men. I had seen their eyes still through the crack in the boards of the floor when last I looked, as they lay prone waiting for the signal to start erect. If it was to be ever, now for it! As nonchalantly as I could, I turned slightly on my stool so as to get my right leg well under me. Then, with a sudden jump, turning my head and guarding it with my hands, and with the fighting instinct of the knights of old, I breathed my lady's name and hurled myself against the back wall of the hut. Watchful as they were, the suddenness of my movement surprised both Pierre and the old woman. As I crashed through the rotten timbers, I saw the old woman rise with a leap like a tiger and heard her low gasp of baffled rage. My feet lit on something that moved, and as I jumped away, I knew that I had stepped on the back of one of the row of men lying on their faces outside the hut. I was torn with nails and splinters, but otherwise unhurt. Breathless, I rushed up the mound in front of me, hearing as I went the dull crash of the shanty as it collapsed into a mass. It was a nightmare climb. The mound, though but low, was awfully steep, and with each step I took, the mass of dust and cinders tore down with me and gave way under my feet. The dust rose and choked me. It was sickening, fetid, awful, but my climb was, I felt, for life or death, and I struggled on. The seconds seemed hours, but the few moments I had in starting, combined with my youth and strength, gave me a great advantage, and though several forms struggled after me in deadly silence, which was more dreadful than any sound, I easily reached the top. Since then I have climbed the cone of Vesuvius, and as I struggled up that dreary steep amid the sulfurous fumes, the memory of that awful night at Montrouge came back to me so vividly that I almost grew faint. The mound was one of the tallest in the region of dust, and as I struggled to the top, panting for breath and with my heart beating like a sledgehammer, I saw away to my left the dull red gleam of the sky, and nearer still the flashing of lights. Thank God! I knew where I was now, and where lay the road to Paris. For two or three seconds I paused and looked back. My pursuers were still well behind me, but struggling up resolutely and in deadly silence. Beyond, the shanty was a wreck, a mass of timber and moving forms. I could see it well, for flames were already bursting out. The rags and straw had evidently caught fire from the lantern. Still silence there, not a sound. These old wretches could die game anyhow. I had no time for more than a passing glance, for as I cast an eye round the mound preparatory to making my descent, I saw several dark forms rushing round on either side to cut me off on my way. It was now a race for life. They were trying to head me on my way to Paris, and with the instinct of the moment I dashed down to the right-hand side. I was just in time, for, though I came as it seemed to me down the steep in a few steps, the wary old men who were watching me turned back, and one, as I rushed by into the opening between the two mounds in front, almost struck me a blow with that terrible butcher's axe. There could surely not be two such weapons about. Then began a really horrible chase. I easily ran ahead of the old men, and even when some younger ones and a few women joined in the hunt, I easily distanced them. But I did not know the way, and I could not even guide myself by the light in the sky, for I was running away from it. I had heard that, unless of conscious purpose, hunted men turn always to the left, and so I found it now, and so, I suppose, knew also my pursuers, who were more animals than men, and with cunning or instinct had found out such secrets for themselves, for on finishing a quick spurt, after which I intended to take a moment's breathing space, I suddenly saw ahead of me two or three forms swiftly passing behind a mound to the right. I was in the spider's web now, indeed." but with the thought of this new danger came the resource of the hunted, and so I darted down the next turning to the right. I continued in this direction for some hundred yards, and then, making a turn to the left again, felt certain that I had, at any rate, avoided the danger of being surrounded. 
but not of pursuit, for on came the rabble after me, steady, dogged, relentless, and still in grim silence. In the greater darkness the mounds seemed now to be somewhat smaller than before, although, for the night was closing, they looked bigger in proportion. I was now well ahead of my pursuers, so I made a dart up the mound in front. Oh, joy of joys! I was close to the edge of this inferno of dust heaps. Away behind me the red light of Paris was in the sky, and towering up behind rose the heights of Montmartre, a dim light with here and there brilliant points like stars. Restored to vigor in a moment, I ran over the few remaining mounds of decreasing size and found myself on the level land beyond. Even then, however, the prospect was not inviting. All before me was dark and dismal, and I had evidently come on one of those dank, low-lying waste places which are found here and there in the neighborhood of great cities, places of waste and desolation, where the space is required for the ultimate agglomeration of all that is noxious, and the ground is so poor as to create no desire of occupancy even in the lowest squatter. With eyes accustomed to the gloom of the evening, and away now from the shadows of those dreadful dust heaps, I could see much more easily than I could a little while ago. It might have been, of course, that the glare in the sky of the lights of Paris, though the city was some miles away, was reflected here. Howsoever it was, I saw well enough to take bearings for certainly some little distance around me. In front was a bleak, flat waste that seemed almost dead level, with here and there the dark shimmering of stagnant pools. Seemingly far off on the right, amid a small cluster of scattered lights, rose a dark mass of Fort Montrouge, and away to the left in the dim distance, pointed with stray gleams from cottage windows, the lights in the sky showed the locality of Bicetre. A moment's thought decided me to take to the right and try to reach Montrouge. There at least would be some sort of safety, and I might possibly long before come on some of the crossroads which I knew. Somewhere, not far off, must lie the strategic road made to connect the outlying chains of forts circling the city. Then I looked back. Coming over the mounds, and outlined black against the glare of the Parisian horizon, I saw several moving figures, and still away to the right, several more deploying out between me and my destination. They evidently met to cut me off in this direction, and so my choice became constricted. It lay now between going straight ahead or turning to the left, stooping to the ground so as to get the advantage of the horizon as a line of sight. I looked carefully in this direction, but could detect no sight of my enemies. I argued that, as they had not guarded or were not trying to guard that point, there was evidently danger to me there already, so I made up my mind to go straight on before me. It was not an inviting prospect, and as I went on, the reality grew worse. The ground became soft and oozy, and now and again gave way beneath me in a sickening kind of way. I seemed somehow to be going down, for I saw around me places seemingly more elevated than where I was, and this in a place which from a little way back seemed dead level. I looked around, but could see none of my pursuers. This was strange, for all along these birds of the night had followed me through the darkness as well as though it was broad daylight. How I blamed myself for coming out in my light-colored tourist suit of tweed. The silence and my not being able to see my enemies, whilst I felt that they were watching me, grew appalling, and in the hope of someone not of this ghastly crew hearing me, I raised my voice and shouted several times. There was not the slightest response, not even an echo rewarded my efforts. For a while I stood stock still and kept my eyes in one direction. On one of the rising places around me I saw something dark move along, then another and another. This was to my left, and seemingly moving to head me off. I thought that again I might, with my skill as a runner, elude my enemies at this game, and so with all my speed darted forward. Splash! My feet had given way in a mass of slimy rubbish, and I had fallen headlong into a reeking, stagnant pool. The water and the mud in which my arms sank up to the elbows was filthy and nauseous beyond description, and in the suddenness of my fall I had actually swallowed some of the filthy stuff which nearly choked me and made me gasp for breath. Never shall I forget the moments during which I stood at trying to recover myself, almost fainting from the fetid odor of the filthy pool, whose white mist rose ghost-like around. Worst of all, with the acute despair of the hunted animal when he sees the pursuing pack closing on him, I saw before my eyes whilst I stood helpless the dark forms of my pursuers moving swiftly to surround me. 
It is curious how our minds work on odd matters, even when the energies of thought are seemingly concentrated on some terrible and pressing need. I was in momentary peril of my life. My safety depended on my action, and my choice of alternatives coming now with almost every step I took. And yet I could not but think of the strange, dogged persistency of these old men, their silent resolution, their steadfast, grim persistency, even in such a cause commanded, as well as fear, even a measure of respect. What must they have been in the vigor of their youth? I could understand now that whirlwind rush on the bridge of Ariola, that scornful exclamation of the old guard at Waterloo. Unconscious cerebration has its own pleasures, even at such moments, but fortunately it does not in any way clash with the thought from which action springs. I realized at a glance that so far I was defeated in my object. My enemies as yet had won. They had succeeded in surrounding me on three sides and were bent on driving me off to the left hand where there was already some danger for me, for they had left no guard. I accepted the alternative. It was a case of Hobson's choice and run. I had to keep the lower ground, for my pursuers were on the higher places. However, though the ooze and broken ground impeded me, my youth and training made me able to hold my ground, and by keeping a diagonal line I not only kept them from gaining on me, but even began to distance them. This gave me new heart and strength, and by this time habitual training was beginning to tell, and my second wind had come. Before me the ground rose slightly. I rushed up the slope and found before me a waste of watery slime, with a low dike or bank looking black and grim beyond. I felt that if I could but reach that dike in safety, I could there, with solid ground under my feet and some kind of path to guide me, find with comparative ease a way out of my troubles. After a glance right and left, and seeing no one near, I kept my eyes for a few minutes to their rightful work of aiding my feet whilst I crossed the swamp. It was rough, hard work, but there was little danger, merely toil, and a short time took me to the dike. I rushed up the slope exulting, but here again I met a new shock. On either side of me rose a number of crouching figures. From right and left they rushed at me. Each body held a rope. The cordon was nearly complete. I could pass on neither side, and the end was near. There was only one chance, and I took it. I hurled myself across the dike, and escaping out of the very clutches of my foes, threw myself into the stream. At any other time, I should have thought that water foul and filthy, but now it was as welcome as the most crystal stream to the parched traveller. It was a highway of safety. My pursuers rushed after me. Had only one of them held the rope, it would have been all up with me, for he could have entangled me before I had time to swim a stroke, but the many hands holding it embarrassed and delayed them, and when the rope struck the water, I heard the splash well behind me. A few minutes' hard swimming took me across the stream. Refreshed with the immersion and encouraged by the escape, I climbed the dike in comparative gaiety of spirits. From the top I looked back. Through the darkness I saw my assailants scattering up and down along the dike. The pursuit was evidently not ended, and again I had to choose my course. Beyond the dike where I stood was a wild, swampy place very similar to that which I had crossed. I determined to shun such a place, and thought for a moment whether I would take up or down the dike. I thought I heard a sound, the muffled sound of oars. So I listened, and then shouted. No response. But the sound ceased. My enemies had evidently got a boat of some kind. As they were on the upside of me, I took the down path and began to run. As I passed to the left of where I had entered the water, I heard several splashes, soft and stealthy, like the sound a rat makes as he plunges into the stream, but vastly greater, and as I looked, I saw the dark sheen of the water broken by the ripples of several advancing heads. Some of my enemies were swimming the stream also. And now behind me, up the stream, the silence was broken by the quick rattle and creak of oars. My enemies were in hot pursuit. I put my best leg foremost and ran on. After a break of a couple of minutes, I looked back, and by a gleam of light through the ragged clouds, I saw several dark forms climbing the bank behind me. The wind had now begun to rise, and the water beside me was ruffled and beginning to break in tiny waves on the bank. I had to keep my eyes pretty well on the ground before me, lest I should stumble, for I knew that to stumble was death. After a few minutes, I looked back behind me. On the dike were only a few dark figures, but crossing the waste swampy ground were many more. What new danger this portended I did not know, could only guess. Then as I ran, it seemed to me that my track kept ever sloping away to the right. I looked up ahead and saw that the river was much wider than before, and that the dike on which I stood fell quite away, and beyond it was another stream on whose near bank I saw some of the dark figures now across the marsh. I was on an island of some kind. 
My situation was now indeed terrible, for my enemies had hemmed me in on every side. Behind came the quickening roll of the oars, as though my pursuers knew that the end was close. Around me on every side was desolation. There was not a roof or light, as far as I could see. Far off to the right rose some dark mass, but what it was I knew not. For a moment I paused to think what I should do. Not for more, for my pursuers were drawing closer. Then my mind was made up. I slipped down the bank and took to the water. I struck out ahead so as to gain the current by clearing the backwater of the island, for such I presume it was, when I had passed into the stream. I waited till a cloud came driving across the moon and leaving all in darkness. Then I took off my hat and laid it softly on the water, floating with the stream, and a second after dived to the right and struck out under water with all my might. I was, I suppose, half a minute under water, and when I rose, came up as softly as I could, and turning, looked back. There went my light brown hat floating merrily away. Close behind it came a rickety old boat, driven furiously by a pair of oars. The moon was still partly obscured by the drifting clouds, but in the partial light I could see a man in the bows, holding aloft ready to strike what appeared to me to be that same dreadful poleaxe which I had before escaped. As I looked, the boat drew closer, closer, and the man struck savagely. The hat disappeared. The man fell forward, almost out of the boat. His comrades dragged him in, but without the axe, and then, as I turned with all my energies, bent on reaching the further bank, I heard the fierce whir of the muttered, Sacre! which marked the anger of my baffled pursuers. This was the first sound I had heard from human lips during all this dreadful chase, and full as it was of menace and danger to me, it was a welcome sound, for it broke that awful silence which shrouded and appalled me. It was as though an overt sign that my opponents were men, and not ghosts, and that with them I had, at least, the chance of a man, though but one against many. But now that the spell of silence was broken, the sounds came thick and fast. From boat to shore, and back from shore to boat, came quick question and answer, all in the fiercest whispers. I looked back, a fatal thing to do, for in the instant someone caught sight of my face, which showed white on the dark water, and shouted— Hands pointed to me, and in a moment or two the boat was under way and following hard after me. I had but a little way to go, but quicker and quicker came the boat after me. A few more strokes and I would be on the shore, but I felt the oncoming of the boat and expected each second to feel the crash of an oar or other weapon on my head. Had I not seen that dreadful axe disappear in the water, I do not think that I could have won the shore. I heard the muttered curses of those not rowing and the labored breath of the rowers. With one supreme effort for life or liberty, I touched the bank and sprang up it. There was not a single second to spare, for hard behind me the boat grounded and several dark forms sprang after me. I gained the top of the dike and, keeping to the left, ran on again. The boat put off and followed down the stream. Seeing this, I feared danger in this direction, and quickly turning, ran down the dike on the other side, and after passing a short stretch of marshy ground, gained a wild, open, flat country, and sped on. Still behind me came on my relentless pursuers. Far away below me, I saw the same dark mass as before, but now grown closer and greater. My heart gave a great thrill of delight, for I knew that it must be the fortress of Bicetra, and with new courage I ran on. I had heard that between each and all of the protecting forts of Paris there are strategic ways, deep sunk roads where soldiers marching should be sheltered from an enemy. I knew that if I could gain this road I would be safe, but in the darkness I could not see any sign of it, so, in blind hope of striking it, I ran on. Presently I came to the edge of a deep cut, and found that down below me ran a road, guarded on each side by a ditch of water, fenced on either side by a straight high wall. Getting fainter and dizzier, I ran on. The ground got more broken, more and more still, till I staggered and fell and rose again and ran on in the blind anguish of the hunted. Again the thought of Alice nerved me. I would not be lost and wreck her life. I would fight and struggle for life to the bitter end. With a great effort, I caught the top of the wall. As, scrambling like a catamount, I drew myself up, I actually felt a hand touch the sole of my foot. I was now on a sort of causeway, and before me I saw a dim light. Blind and dizzy, I ran on, staggered and fell, rising, covered with dust and blood. Halt la! The words sounded like a voice from heaven. A blaze of light seemed to enwrap me, and I shouted with joy. Kiva la! The rattle of musketry, the flash of steel before my eyes. Instinctively I stopped, though close behind me came a rush of my pursuers. 
A word or two, and out from a gateway poured, as it seemed to me, a tide of red and blue as the guard turned out. All around seemed blazing with light, and the flash of steel, the clink and rattle of arms, and the loud, harsh voices of command. As I fell forward, utterly exhausted, a soldier caught me. I looked back in dreadful expectation, and saw the mass of dark forms disappearing into the night. Then I must have fainted. When I recovered my senses, I was in the guard room. They gave me brandy, and after a while I was able to tell them something of what had happened. Then a commissary of police appeared, apparently out of the empty air, as is the way of the Parisian police officer. He listened attentively, and then had a moment's consultation with the officer in command. Apparently they were agreed, for they asked me if I were ready now to come with them. "'Where to?' I asked, rising to go. "'Back to the dust heaps. We shall perhaps catch them yet.' "'I shall try,' said I. He eyed me for a moment keenly and said suddenly, "'Would you like to wait for a while, or till tomorrow, young Englishman?' This touched me to the quick, as perhaps he intended, and I jumped to my feet. "'Come now,' I said. "'Now! Now! An Englishman is always ready for his duty!' The commissary was a good fellow, as well as a shrewd one. He slapped my shoulder kindly. "'Brave garçon,' he said. "'Forgive me, but I knew what would do you most good. The guard is ready. Come!' And so, passing right through the guard room and through a long vaulted passage, we were out into the night. A few of the men in front had powerful lanterns. Through courtyards and down a sloping way, we passed out through a low archway to a sunken road, the same that I had seen in my flight. The order was given to get at the double, and with a quick springing stride, half run, half walk, the soldiers went swiftly along. I felt my strength renewed again, such is the difference between hunter and hunted. A very short distance took us to a low-lying pontoon bridge across the stream, and evidently very little higher up than I had struck it. Some effort had evidently been made to damage it, for the ropes had been all cut, and one of the chains had been broken. I heard the officer say to the commissary, "'We are just in time. A few more minutes, and they would have destroyed the bridge. Forward! Quicker still!' And on we went. Again we reached a pontoon on the winding stream. As we came up, we heard the hollow boom of the metal drums as the effort to destroy the bridge was again renewed. A word of command was given, and several men raised their rifles. Fire! A volley rang out. There was a muffled cry, and the dark forms dispersed. But the evil was done, and we saw the far end of the pontoon swing into the stream. This was a serious delay, and it was nearly an hour before we had renewed ropes and restored the bridge sufficiently to allow us to cross. We renewed the chase. Quicker, quicker we went toward the dust heaps. After a time, we came to a place that I knew. There were the remains of a fire. A few smoldering wood ashes still cast a red glow. But the bulk of the ashes were cold. I knew the sight of the hut and the hill behind it up which I had rushed, and in the flickering glow, the eyes of the rats still shone with a sort of phosphorescence. The commissary spoke a word to the officer, and he cried, Halt! The soldiers were ordered to spread around and watch, and then we commenced to examine the ruins. The commissary himself began to lift away the charred boards and rubbish. These the soldiers took and piled together. Presently he started back, then bent down, and rising, beckoned me. See, he said. It was a gruesome sight. There lay a skeleton, face downward, a woman by the lines, an old woman by the coarse fibre of the bone. Between the ribs rose a long, spike-like dagger made from a butcher's sharpening knife, its keen point buried in the spine. "'You will observe,' said the commissary to the officer, and to me as he took out his notebook, "'that the woman must have fallen on her dagger. The rats are many here. See their eyes glistening among that heap of bones. And you will also notice—' I shuddered as he placed his hand on the skeleton. That but little time was lost by them, for the bones are scarcely cold. There was no other sign of anyone near, living or dead, and so, deploying again into line, the soldiers passed on. Presently we came to the hut made of the old wardrobe. We approached. In five of the six compartments was an old man sleeping. 
sleeping so soundly that even the glare of the lanterns did not wake them. Old and grim and grizzled they looked, with their gaunt, wrinkled, bronzed faces and their white moustaches. The officer called out harshly and loudly a word of command, and in an instant each one of them was on his feet before us and standing at, Attention! What do you hear? We sleep, was the answer. Where are the other chiffoniers? asked the commissary. Gone to work. And you? We are on guard. Peste, laughed the officer grimly, as he looked at the old men, one after the other in the face, and added with cool, deliberate cruelty, Sleep on duty? Is this the manner of the old guard? No wonder, then, a Waterloo. By the gleam of the lantern, I saw the grim old faces look deadly pale, and almost shuddered at the look in the eyes of the old men, as the laugh of the soldiers echoed the grim pleasantry of the officer. I felt in that moment that I was, in some measure, avenged. For a moment they looked as if they would throw themselves on the taunter, but years of their life had schooled them, and they remained still. "'You are but five, said the commissary. "'Where is the sixth? The answer came with a grim chuckle. "'He is there!' And the speaker pointed to the bottom of the wardrobe. "'He died last night. You won't find much of him. The burial of the rats is quick.' The commissary stooped and looked in. Then he turned to the officer and said calmly, "'We may as well go back. No trace here now. Nothing to prove that man was the one wounded by our soldiers' bullets.' Probably they murdered him to cover up the trace. See! Again he stooped and placed his hand on the skeleton. The rats work quickly, and there are many. These bones are warm. I shuddered, and so did many more of those around me. Form! said the officer. And so, in marching order, with the lanterns swinging in front and the manacled veterans in the midst, with steady tramp we took ourselves out of the dust heaps and turned backward to the fortress of Bicetre. My year of probation has long since ended, and Alice is my wife. But when I look back upon that trying twelve-month, one of the most vivid incidents that memory recalls is that associated with my visit to the City of Dust. End of Burial of the Rats Dematerialization by C. Mason From the Black Cat, November 1916 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman Dematerialization by C. Mason A Fair Young Thing with tender blue eyes, entered Woodworth's office, and calmly seated herself. A glance at her portfolio impelled him to seek refuge in the cool brick vault of his neighbor across the passage, Barker, who called himself a banker. But the lady barred the way. No, he said desperately, without waiting to be interrogated. I don't want to subscribe for a history of the war nor the lives of the candidates, nor picturesque anything. But, honored sir, replied the mild, simple, and rather simpering young person, I do not ask you to subscribe to anything, unless, indeed, you would honor me by taking a ticket. Ticket nothing, again interrupted Woodworth. I've no leisure for amusements. My time is all taken up by my profession and science ah that is what drew me thither beamed the beautiful girl i perceive by your sign that you were a lawyer and i have heard that you are a member a prominent one of the psychical research society in one or both capacities i think you can do me an inestimable service woodworth touched at two vulnerable points unbent you see kind sir she continued i am a materialized spirit my manager mr shockton who has stopped at the hotel 
Here is his card. Called me forth from the spirit world by mistake for Martha Washington, with whom I was contemporaneous. Woodworth had noticed the antique style and courtly bearing of his visitor. He delayed so long in endeavoring to correct his error, she went on, that instead of remaining in the misty, indistinct form in which spirits are preferably presented, I became as thoroughly substantial as when I was before on earth, one hundred and forty-six years ago. Upon my word, young lady, or venerable dame, the lawyer corrected with halting courtesy, this is a very extraordinary statement. Do you not know that you render yourself liable for prosecution for obtaining money under false pretenses when you attempt to sell tickets on such a tale as that? She smiled trustingly. No, sir, I did not know that. Indeed, I am only beginning to learn the strange things of your wonderful century. But I like them very much. Though my familiarity with the distaff and spindle, the needle and quill pen, will no longer afford me a livelihood. I have an ardent longing to learn the sewing machine or the typewriter and become a new woman. I am most anxious to resume the life prematurely cut short in 1770 in my eighteenth year, when I died from what was erroneously diagnosed as quinsy. I have reason to believe that had I been properly treated for diphtheria with an antitoxin serum, I should have lived to a good old age. What is to prevent you from doing so now? asked Woodworth touched and interested immeasurably by his singular client because my master for so i must call him mr shockton who brought me from the other world is determined to send me back i hear that from mercenary motives he means to dematerialize me at his very next seance woodworth hurriedly thought of all the known legal processes but neither habeas corpus, ne exet, nor any other writ with which he was familiar, seemed a remedy against the peculiar form of extradition proposed by Shockton. Putting on his hat, he exclaimed, You sit right there while I interview this tyrant, Miss... Amy Allwright was my name before, she answered sweetly. Finding the spiritual manager in his improvised office, at the hotel, the lawyer addressed him by name, saying, I warn you to desist from your persecution of my client, Miss Amy Allwright. She is perfectly satisfied with this mundane sphere, as the reporters call it, and intends to remain here. I shall take steps to enjoin you from making her the subject of further experiment. Take a ticket, was Shockton's cordial response, thrusting out a card. One dollar, please. Seven thirty this evening. We are going to dematerialize that chit this very night. And if it doesn't come off, call me all the liars you like. Next. One moment, Mr. Shockton, said Woolworth severely. I understand you to say that you intend to dematerialize, which I suppose means to disembody to cause to disappear into thin air evaporate vamoose answered the medium in a business-like tone cause to disappear a person now living that my dear sir is murder wrong replied shockton who is this girl where does she hail from she has been dead one hundred and forty-six years can't kill a person twice you know what good is she, anyhow? She's way behind the times. Can't even sell a ticket to her own dematerialization. Then you are determined to dematerialize the lady again? demanded Woodworth, somewhat demoralized. Sure, come and see for yourself. Take a ticket, and one for your wife. I shall certainly come, with the police. You insist on making this preposterous experiment? Fact, but tell you what I'll do. You may take the young woman, lock her up, do anything you like with her, 
and I'll bet you a cool hundred I'll dematerialize her all the same. Woodworth clutched at this proposition. He began to see a way out. The Psychical Research Society was hastily summoned, in special session, and Amy Albright was introduced to President Barker and the members. Her frankness and timidity convinced the most skeptical among them that she, at least, was innocent of collusion with the medium. She appeared terribly to dread the threats of Shockton. Oh, gentlemen, she pleaded, put me underground, put me in some strong place, where it will be impossible to get at me. I'm so tired of being a spirit. Don't let me be dematerialized again. Provided with a lunch from the hotel, wrapped in napkins, she was smuggled into Baker's Bank. It was dignified by that name in the village, and locked into its roomy old brick vault, and a committee signed an affidavit to that effect. Then all the psychical people attended Shockton's seance. It was very long and very mysterious. For two hours the audience, they could not be called spectators, sat in the darkness, listening to soft music, and waiting for Amy Allwright to appear. At last there came a gentle tapping. Aha! exclaimed Shockton. She comes. Who goes there? The spirit of Miss Amy Allwright, who died of the Quincy in 1770. Are you in the flesh or in spirit? A spirit, alas! Oh, woe is me! There you are, gentlemen, said Shockton, switching on the light. Now produce your Amy, if you can. The audience, led by the Psychical Research Committee, trooped back to Barker's bank. Heavens! The man had won his bet. Amy had dematerialized after all. So had the contents of the bank. The only material evidence remaining of the guileless girl and her work were the crumbs of her luncheon, the napkins in which they had been wrapped, and a hotel table knife, snapped short off, which had served as a screwdriver. The big, old-style locks with their screws lay on the floor. The End of Dematerialization by C. Mason From the Memoirs of Satan by Wilhelm Hauf Read by Tony Scheinman This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From the Memoirs of Satan by Wilhelm Hauf In this way the jovial stranger had kept myself and twelve or fifteen other gentlemen and ladies, our fellow guests, in a perpetual whirl of delight. Scarcely any had any special business to detain them at the hotel, and yet none ventured to entertain the mere idea of departure, even at a distant day. On the other hand, after we had slept for some time late on mornings, sat long at dinner, sung and played long of evenings, and drank, chatted, and laughed long of nights, the magic tie which bound us to the hotel seemed to have woven new chains around us. This intoxication, however, was soon to be put an end to, perhaps for our good. On the seventh day of our rejoicings, a Sunday, our friend von Nates was not to be found anywhere. The waiters gave us his apology a short journey. He could not return before sunset, but would certainly be in time for tea and supper. The enjoyment of his society had already become such a necessity that this piece of information made us helpless and ill at ease. The conversation turned naturally on our absent friend and his striking, brilliant apparition among us. It was strange, but I could not get it out of my head that I had already met with him in my walk through life, but in a different shape, and, absurd as the idea was, it still forced itself irresistibly on my mind once and again. I called to mind, from years long gone by, the recollection of a man who, in his whole demeanor, but more especially in his glance, had the greatest resemblance to him. 
the one of whom I now speak was a foreign physician, who occasionally visited my native town, and there lived at first in great retirement, though he soon found a crowd of worshippers collected around him. The thought of this man was always a melancholy one, for it was assumed that some serious misfortune always followed his visits. Still, I could not shake off the idea that Nates resembled him strikingly. In fact, that he was one and the same person. I mentioned to my next neighbor at table the idea that incessantly haunted me, and how unpleasant it was to identify so horrible a being as the stranger who had so afflicted my native city with our mutual friend who had so fully gained my esteem and affection. But it will seem still more incredible when I assure my readers that all my neighbors were full of precisely the same idea, and that all fancied they had seen our agreeable companion in some entirely different shape. "'You are enough to make one downright melancholy,' said Baroness von Thingen, who sat near me. "'You make our friend Nates out to be the wandering Jew, or God knows what more.' A little old man, a professor at Tipsingen, who had joined our circle some days before, and passed his time in quiet, silent enjoyment, enlivened by an occasional deep conference with the Rhine wine, had kept smiling to himself during what he called our comparative anatomy, and twirling his huge snuff-box between his fingers with such skillful rapidity that it revolved like a coach-wheel. "'I cannot longer refrain from a remark I wished to make,' exclaimed he at last. "'Under your favour, gracious lady, I do not look upon him as being precisely the wandering Jew, but still as being a very strange mortal.' As long as he was present, the thought would, it is true, now and then flash up in my mind. You have seen this man before, but pray, where was it? But these recollections were driven away, as if by magic, whenever he fastened upon me those dark, wandering eyes of his. So was it with me. And with me! And with me! exclaimed we all in astonishment. Ahem! <clears throat> smiled the professor. Even now the scales seem to fall from my eyes, and I see that he is the very same person I saw in Stuttgart twelve years ago. What? You have seen him then? And in what circumstances? asked Lady von Thingen eagerly, and almost blushed at the eagerness she displayed. The professor took a pinch of snuff, shook the superfluous grains off his waistcoat, and answered, It may be now about... Twelve years since I was forced by a lawsuit to spend some months in Stuttgart. I lived at one of the best hotels, and generally dined with a large company at the table d'hôte. Once upon a time, I made my first appearance at table after a lapse of several days, during which I had been forced to keep my room. The company were talking very eagerly about a certain Signor Barigi, who for some time past had been delighting the other visitors with his lively wit and his fluency in all languages. All were unanimous in his praise, but they could not exactly agree as to his occupation, some making him out a diplomatist, others a teacher of languages, a third party a distinguished political exile, and a fourth a spy of the police. The door opened, all seemed silent, even confused at having carried on the dispute in so loud a tone. I judged that the person spoken of must be among us, and saw— Who, pray? Under favour, the same person who has amused us so agreeably for some days past. There was nothing supernatural in this, to be sure, but listen a moment. For two days, Signor Barigi, as the stranger was called, had given a new relish to our meats by his brilliant conversation, when mine host interrupted us suddenly. Gentlemen, said he, prepare yourself for a unique entertainment which will be provided for you tomorrow. We asked what this meant, and a grey-headed captain, who had presided at the hotel table many years, informed us of the joke as follows. Exactly opposite this dining-room an old bachelor lives, solitary and alone, in a large deserted house. He is a retired councillor of state. 
lives on a handsome premium, and has an enormous fortune besides. He is, however, a downright fool, and has some of the strangest peculiarities. Thus, for instance, he often gives himself entertainments on a scale of extravagant luxury. He orders covers for twelve from the hotel. He has excellent wines in his cellar, and one or the other of our waiters has the honour to attend table. You think, perhaps, that at these feasts he feasts the hungry and gives drink to the thirsty. No such thing. On the chairs lie old yellow leaves of parchment from the family record, and the old hunks is as jovial as if he had the merriest set of fellows around him. He talks and laughs with them, and the whole thing is said to be so fearful to look upon that the youngest waiters are always sent over. For whoever has been to one such supper will enter the deserted house no more. The day before yesterday he had a supper, and our new waiter, Frank there, calls heaven and earth to witness that nobody shall ever induce him to go there a second time. The next day after the entertainment comes the councillor's second freak. Early in the morning he leaves the city and comes back the morning after, not, however, to his own house, which during this time is fast locked and bolted, but into this hotel. Here he treats people he has been in the habit of seeing for a whole year as strangers, dines, and afterwards places himself at one of the windows and examines his own house across the way from top to bottom. Who does that house opposite belong to? he then asks the host. The other regularly bows and answers, It belongs to the Councillor of State, Hasten Treffer, at your Excellency's service. But, Professor, here observed I, what is this silly Hasten Treffer of yours to do with our nattes? A moment's patience, Doctor, answered the Professor. The light will soon break in upon you. Hasten Treffer then examines the house and learns that it belongs to Hasten Treffer. Oh, what? he asks. The same that was a student with me at Tipsingen? Then throws open the window, stretches his powdered head out, and calls out, Hey, Centrefa! Hey, Centrefa! Of course, nobody answers, but he remarks, The old fellow will never forgive me if I was not to look in on him for a moment. Then takes up his hat and cane, unlocks his own house, goes in, and all goes on after as before. All of us, the professor proceeded in his story, were greatly astonished at this singular story, and highly delighted at the idea of the next day's merriment. Signor Barigi, however, obliged us to promise that we would not betray him, as he said he was preparing a capital joke to play off on the counsellor. We all met at the table d'hote earlier than usual, and besieged the windows. An old tumble-down carriage, drawn by two blind steeds, came crawling down the street. It stopped before the hotel. There's Hasten Treffer! There's Hasten Treffer! was echoed by every mouth. And we were filled with extravagant merriment when we saw the little man get out, neatly powdered, dressed in an iron-gray surtout, with a huge meerschaum in hand. An escort of at least ten servants followed him in, and in this guise he entered the dining-room. We sat down at once. I have seldom laughed as much as I did then, for the old chap insisted, with the greatest coolness, that he came direct from Carrel, and that he had six days before been extremely well entertained at the Swan Inn at Frankfurt. Barigi must have disappeared before the dessert, for when the councillor left the table, and the other guests, full of curiosity, imitated his example, Barigi was nowhere to be seen. The councillor took his seat at the window. We all followed his example and watched his movements. The house opposite seemed desolate and uninhabited. Grass grew on the threshold. The shutters were closed, and on some of them birds seemed to have built their nests. A fine house that opposite, said the old man to our host, 
who kept standing behind him in the third position. "'Who does it belong to?' "'To the Councillor of State, Hasentreffer, at your Excellency's service.' "'Ah, oh, indeed, that must be the same one that was a fellow student with me,' exclaimed he. "'He would never forgive me if I was not to inform him that I was here.' He opened the window. "'Hey, Sentreffer! Hey, Sentreffer! cried he in a hoarse voice. "'But who can paint our terror when opposite in the empty house which we knew was firmly locked and bolted? A window-shutter was slowly raised, a window opened, and out of it peered the Councillor of State, hey, Sentreffer, in his chintz morning gown and white nightcap, under which a few thin grey locks were visible. This, this exactly was his usual morning costume. Down to the minutest wrinkle on the pallid visage, the figure across the street was precisely the same as the one that stood by our side. But a panic seized us when the figure in the morning gown called out across the street in just the same hoarse voice, "'What do you want? Who are you calling to, hey?' "'Are you the Councillor of State, Hasten Treffer? said the one on our side of the way, pale as death, in a trembling voice, and quaking as he leaned against the window for support. "'I'm the man,' squeaked the other, and nodded his head in a friendly way. "'Have you any commands for me?' "'But I'm the man, too,' said our friend mournfully. "'How can it be possible?' "'You are mistaken, my dear friend,' answered he across the way. "'You are the thirteenth. "'Be good enough just to step across the street to my house "'and let me twist your neck for you. "'It is by no means painful.' "'Waiter, my hat and stick,' said the councillor, pale as death, "'and his voice escaped in mournful tones from his hollow chest. "'The devil is in my house and seeks my soul.' "'A pleasant evening to you, gentlemen,' added he, turning to us with a polite bow, and thereupon left the room. "'What does this mean?' we asked each other. "'Are we all beside ourselves?' The gentleman in the morning gown kept looking quietly out of the window, while our good silly old friend crossed the street at his usual formal pace. At the front door he pulled a huge bunch of keys out of his pocket, "'unlocked the heavy creaking door, "'he of the morning gown looking carelessly on, "'and walked in. "'The latter now withdrew from the window, "'and we saw him go forward to meet our acquaintance at the room door. "'Our host and the ten waiters were all pale with fear and trembled. "'Gentlemen,' said the former, "'God pity poor Hasten Treffer, "'for one of those two must be the devil in human shape.' We laughed at our host, and tried to persuade ourselves that it was a joke of Barigi's, but our host assured us that no one could have obtained access to the house except he was in possession of the councillor's very artificially contrived keys. Also, that Barigi was seated at table not ten minutes before the prodigy happened. How, then, could he have disguised himself so completely in so short a time? even supposing him to have known how to unlock a strange house. He added that the two were so fearfully like one another that he who had lived in the neighbourhood for twenty years could not distinguish the true one from the counterfeit. But for God's sake, gentlemen, do you not hear the horrid shrieks opposite? We rushed to the window. Terrible and fearful voices rang across from the empty house. We fancied we saw the old councillor, pursued by his image in the morning gown, hurry past the window repeatedly. On a sudden, all was quiet. We gazed on each other. The boldest among us proposed to cross over to the house. We all agreed to it. We crossed the street. The huge bell at the old man's door was rung thrice. But nothing could be heard in answer. We sent to the police and to a blacksmith's. The door was broken open. The whole tide of anxious visitors poured up the wide, silent staircase. All the doors were fastened. At length, one was opened. In a splendid apartment, the councillor, his iron-grey frock-coat 
torn to pieces, his neatly dressed hair in horrible disorder, lay dead, strangled on the sofa. Since that time, no traces of Barigi have been found, neither in Stuttgart nor elsewhere. End of From the Memoirs of Satan The Ghost Brahmin by Reverend Lal Bahari Day. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paula Messina. The Ghost Brahmin by Reverend Lal Bahari Day. Once on a time, there lived a poor Brahmin, who, not being a Kulin, found it the hardest thing in the world to get married. He went to rich people and begged of them to give him money that he might marry a wife. And a large sum of money was needed, not so much for the expenses of the wedding as for giving to the parents of the bride. He begged from door to door, flattered many rich folk, and at last succeeded in scraping together the sum needed. The wedding took place in due time, and he brought home his wife to his mother. After a short time, he said to his mother, Mother, I have no means to support you and my wife. I must therefore go to distant countries to get money somehow or other. I may be away for years, for I won't return till I get a good sum. In the meantime, I'll give you what I have. You make the best of it and take care of my wife. The Brahmin, receiving his mother's blessing, set out on his travels. In the evening of that very day, a ghost, assuming the exact appearance of the Brahmin, came into the house. The newly married woman, thinking it was her husband, said to him, How is it that you have returned so soon? You said you might be away for years. Why have you changed your mind? The ghost said, Today is not a lucky day. I have therefore returned home. Besides, I have already got some money. The mother did not doubt but that it was her son. So the ghost lived in the house as if he was its owner, and as if he was the son of the old woman and the husband of the young woman. As the ghost and the Brahmin were exactly like each other in everything, like two peas, the people in the neighborhood all thought that the ghost was the real Brahmin. After some years, the Brahmin returned from his travels, and what was his surprise when he found another like him in the house? The ghost said to the Brahmin, Who are you? What business have you to come to my house? Who am I? replied the Brahmin. Let me ask who you are. This is my house. That is my mother, and this is my wife. The ghost said, Why, herein is a strange thing. Everyone knows that this is my house. That is my wife, and yonder is my mother, and I have lived here for years. And you pretend this is your house, and that woman is your wife. Your head must have got turned, Brahmin. So saying, the ghost drove away the Brahmin from his house. The Brahmin became mute with wonder. He did not know what to do. At last he bethought himself of going to the king and of laying his case before him. The king saw the ghost Brahmin as well as the Brahmin, and the one was the picture of the other. So he was in a fix and did not know how to decide the quarrel. Day after day, the Brahmin went to the king and besought him to give him back his house, his wife, and his mother. And the king, not knowing what to say every time, put him off to the following day. Every day the king tells him to come tomorrow, and every day the Brahmin goes away from the palace, weeping and striking his forehead with the palm of his hand, and saying, What a wicked world this is! I am driven from my own house, and another fellow has taken possession of my house and of my wife. And what a king this is! He does not do justice! Now it came to pass that as the Brahmin went away every day from the court, Outside the town, he passed a spot at which a great many cowboys used to play. 
they let the cows graze on the meadow while they themselves met together under a large tree to play and they played at royalty one cowboy was elected king another prime minister or vizier another kotwal or prefect of the police and others constables every day for several days together they saw the brahmin passing by weeping one day the cowboy king asked his vizier whether he knew why the brahmin wept every day on the vizier not being able to answer the question the cowboy king ordered one of his constables to bring the brahmin to him one of them went and said to the brahmin the king requires your immediate attendance the brahmin replied what for i have just come from the king and he put me off till tomorrow why does he want me again it is our king that wants you our neat herd king rejoined the constable who is neat herd king asked the brahmin come and see was the reply the neat herd king then asked the brahmin why he every day went away weeping the brahmin then told him his sad story the neat herd king after hearing the whole said I understand your case. I will give you again all your rights. Only go to the king and ask his permission for me to decide your case. The Brahmin went back to the king of the country and begged his majesty to send his case to the neat herd king who had offered to decide it. The king, whom the case had greatly puzzled, granted the permission sought. The following morning was fixed for the trial. The neat herd king, who saw through the hole, brought with him next day a file with a narrow neck. The Brahmin and the ghost Brahmin both appeared at the bar. After a great deal of examination of witnesses and of speech making, the neat herd king said, Well, I have heard enough. I'll decide the case at once. Here is this file. Whichever of you will enter into it, shall be declared by the court to be the rightful owner of the house, the title of which is in dispute. Now let me see which of you will enter. The Brahmin said, You are a neat herd, and your intellect is that of a neat herd. What man can enter into such a small file? If you cannot enter, said the neat herd king, then you are not the rightful owner. What do you say, sir, to this, turning to the ghost Brahmin and addressing him? If you can enter into the file, then the house and the wife and the mother become yours. Of course I will enter, said the ghost, and true to his word, to the wonder of all, he made himself into a small creature like an insect, and entered into the file. The neat herd king forthwith corked up the file, and the ghost could not get out. Then, addressing the Brahmin, the neat herd king said, Throw this file into the bottom of the sea, and take possession of your house, wife, and mother. The Brahmin did so, and lived happily for many years, and begat sons and daughters. End of the Ghost Brahmin Jerry Bundler by W. W. Jacobs this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Alan Lord. Jerry Bundler by W. W. Jacobs. It wanted a few nights to Christmas, a festival for which the small market town of Torchester was making extensive preparations. The narrow streets, which had been thronged with people, were now almost deserted. The cheap Jack from London, with the remnant of breath left him after his evening's exertions, was making feeble attempts to blow out his naphtha lamp, and the last shops open were rapidly closing for the night. In the comfortable coffee room of the old boar's head, half a dozen guests, principally commercial travellers, sat talking by the light of the fire. The talk had drifted from trade to politics, from politics to religion, and so, by easy stages, to the supernatural. The three ghost stories, never known to fail before, 
had fallen flat. There was too much noise outside, too much light within. The fourth story was told by an old hand with more success. The streets were quiet, and he had turned the gas out. In the flickering light of the fire, as it shone on the glasses and danced with shadows on the walls, the story proved so enthralling that George, the waiter, whose presence had been forgotten, created a very disagreeable sensation by suddenly starting up from a dark corner and gliding silently from the room. That's what I call a good story, said one of the men, sipping his hot whiskey. Of course, it's an old idea that spirits like to get into the company of human beings. A man told me once that he travelled down the Great Western with a ghost and hadn't the slightest suspicion of it until the inspector came for tickets. My friend said the way that ghost tried to keep up appearances by feeling for it in all its pockets and looking on the floor was quite touching. Ultimately, it gave up and with a faint groan vanished through the ventilator. That'll do, Hurst, said another man. It's not a subject for jesting, said a little old gentleman who had been an attentive listener. I've never seen an apparition myself, but I know people who have, and I consider that they form a very interesting link between us and the afterlife. There's a ghost story connected with this house, you know. Never heard of it, said another speaker, and I've been here some years now. It dates back oh, a long time now, said the old gentleman. You've heard about Jerry Bundler, George? Well, I just heard odds and ends, sir, said the old waiter. But I never put much count to him. There was one chap here what said he saw it, and the governor sacked him prompt. My father was a native of this town, said the old gentleman, and knew the story well. He was a truthful man, man a steady churchgoer, but I've heard him declare that once in his life he saw the appearance of Jerry Bundler in this house. And who was this Bundler? inquired a voice. A London thief, pickpocket, highwayman. Many think he could turn his dishonest hand too, replied the old gentleman. And he was run to earth in this house one Christmas week some eighty years ago. He took his last supper in this very room. And after he had gone up to bed, a couple of Bow Street runners who'd followed him from London but lost the scent of it went upstairs with the landlord and tried the door. It was stout oak and fast. So one went into the yard and by means of a short ladder got onto the window sill, while the other stayed outside the door. Those below in the yard saw the man crouching on the sill and then there was a sudden smash of glass, and with a cry, he fell in a heap on the stones at their feet. Then in the moonlight, they saw the white face of the pickpocket peeping over the sill. And while some stayed in the yard, others ran into the house and helped the other man to break the door in. It was difficult to obtain an entrance even then for it was barred with heavy furniture. But they got in at last, and the first thing that met their eyes was the body of Jerry dangling from the top of the bed by his old handkerchief. Which bedroom was it? asked two or three voices together. The narrator shook his head. That I can't tell you, but the story goes that Jerry still haunts this house. And my father used to declare positively that the last time he slept here, the ghost of Jerry Bundler lowered itself from the top of his bed and tried to strangle him. That'll do, said an uneasy voice. I wish you'd thought to ask your father which bedroom it was. 
what for? inquired the old gentleman. Well, I should take care not to sleep in it, that's all, said the voice shortly. There's nothing to fear, said the other. I don't believe for a moment that ghosts could really hurt one. In fact, my father used to confess that it was only the unpleasantness of the thing that upset him, and that for all practical purposes, Jerry's fingers might have been made of cotton wool, for all the harm they could do. That's all very fine, said the last speaker again. A ghost story is a ghost story, sir. But when a gentleman tells a tale of a ghost in the house in which one is going to sleep, I call it most ungentlemanly. Puh, nonsense, said the old gentleman, rising. Ghosts can't hurt you. For my own part, I should rather like to see one. Good night, gentlemen. Good night, said the others. And I only hope Jerry will pay you a visit, added the nervous man as the door closed. Bring some more whiskey, George, said a stout commercial. I want keeping up when the talk turns this way. Shall I light the gas, Mr Malcolm, said George. No, the fire's very comfortable, said the traveller. Now, gentlemen, any of you know any more? I think we've had enough, said another man. We should be thinking we see spirits next, and we're not all like the old gentleman who's just gone. My old humbug, said Hurst. I should like to put him to the test. Suppose I dress up as Jerry Bundler and go and give him a chance of displaying his courage. Bravo, said Malcolm huskily, drowning one or two faint no's. Just for the joke, gentlemen. No, no, drop it, Hurst, said another man. Only for the joke, said Hurst somewhat eagerly. I've got some things upstairs in which I'm going to play in the rivals. Knee breeches, buckles, and all that sort of thing. It's a rare chance. If you'll wait a bit, I'll give you a full dress rehearsal entitled Jerry Bundler or The Nocturnal Strangler. You won't frighten us, said the commercial with a husky laugh. I don't know that, said Hurst sharply. It's a question of acting, that's all. I'm pretty good, ain't I, Summers? Oh, you're all right, for an amateur, said his friend with a laugh. I'll bet you a level sov you don't frighten me, said the stout traveller. Done, said Hurst. I'll take the bet to frighten you first, and the old gentleman afterwards. These gentlemen shall be the judges. You won't frighten us, sir, said another man, because we're prepared for you. But you better leave the old man alone. It's dangerous play. Well, I'll try you first, said Hurst, springing up. No gas, mind. He ran lightly upstairs to his room leaving the others, most of whom had been drinking somewhat freely, to wrangle about his proceedings. It ended in two of them going to bed. He's crazy on acting, said Summers, lighting his pipe. Thinks he's the equal of anybody, almost. It doesn't matter with us, but I won't let him go to the old man. And he won't mind, so long as he gets an opportunity of acting to us. Well... I hope you'll hurry up, said Malcolm, yawning. It's after twelve now. Nearly half an hour passed. Malcolm drew his watch from his pocket and was busy winding it, when George, the waiter, who had been sent on an errand to the bar, burst suddenly into the room and rushed towards them. He's coming, gentlemen, he said breathlessly. Why, you're frightened, George, said the stout commercial with a chuckle. It was the suddenness of it, said George sheepishly. And besides, I didn't look for seeing him in the bar. There's only a glimmer of light there, and he was sitting on the floor behind the bar. I nearly trod on him. Oh, you'll never make a man, George, said Malcolm. Well, he took me unawares, 
said the waiter. Not that I'd have gone to the bar by myself if I'd known he was there. And I don't believe you would either, sir. Nonsense, said Malcolm. I'll go and fetch him in. You don't know what it's like, sir, said George, catching him by the sleeve. It ain't fit to look at by yourself. It ain't, indeed. It's got the... What's that? They all started at the sound of a smothered cry from the staircase and the sound of somebody running hurriedly along the passage. Before anybody could speak, the door flew open and a figure bursting into the room flung itself gasping and shivering upon them. What is it? What's the matter? demanded Malcolm. Why, it's Mr. Hurst. He shook him roughly and then held some spirit to his lips. Hurst drank it greedily, and with a sharp intake of his breath, gripped him by the arm. Light the gas, George, said Malcolm. The waiter obeyed hastily. Hurst, a ludicrous but pitiable figure in knee breeches and coat, a large wig all awry, and his face a mess of grease paint, clung to him, trembling. Now, what's the matter? asked Malcolm. I've seen it, said Hurst with a hysterical sob. Oh, Lord, I'll never play the fool again, never. Seen what? said the others. Him, it, the ghost, anything, said Hurst wildly. Rot, said Malcolm uneasily. I was coming down the stairs, said Hurst, just capering down, as I thought it ought to do. I felt a tap. He broke off suddenly and peered nervously through the open door into the passage. I thought I saw it again, he whispered. Look at the foot of the stairs. Can you see anything? Nah, there's nothing there, said Malcolm, whose own voice shook a little. Go on, you felt a tap on your shoulder. I turned round and saw it. A little wicked head and a white, dead face. Bah, that's what I saw in the bar, said George. Horrid it was. Devilish. Hurst shuddered and, still retaining his nervous grip on Malcolm's sleeve, dropped into a chair. Well, it's a most unaccountable thing, said the dumbfounded Malcolm, turning round to the others. It's the last time I come to this house. I leave tomorrow said George. I wouldn't go down to that bar again by myself. No, not for fifty pounds. It's talking about the thing that's caused it, I expect, said one of the men. We've all been talking about this and having it in our minds. Practically, we've been forming a spiritualistic circle without knowing it. Hang the old gentleman, said Malcolm heartily. Upon my soul, I'm half afraid to go to bed. It's odd they should both think they saw something. Well, I saw it as plain as I see you, sir, said George solemnly. Perhaps if you keep your eyes turned up the passage, you'll see it for yourself. They followed the direction of his finger, but saw nothing, although one of them fancied that a head peeped round the corner of the wall. Who'll come down to the bar? said Malcolm, looking round. You can go if you like, said one of the others with a faint laugh. We'll wait here for you. The stout traveller walked towards the door and took a few steps up the passage. Then he stopped. All was quite silent, and he walked slowly to the end and looked down fearfully towards the glass partition which shut off the bar. Three times he made as though to go to it. Then he turned back and, glancing over his shoulder, came hurriedly back to the room. Did you see it, sir? whispered George. Don't know, said Malcolm shortly. I fancied I saw something, but it might have been fancy. I'm in the mood to see anything just now. How are you feeling now, sir? Oh, I feel a bit better now, said Hurst, somewhat brusquely, as all eyes were turned upon him. I dare say you think I'm easily scared, but you didn't see it. Not at all, said Malcolm, smiling faintly despite himself. I'm going to bed, said Hurst, 
noticing the smile and resenting it. Will you share my room with me, Summers? No, I will with pleasure, said his friend. Provided you don't mind sleeping with the gas on full all night. He rose from his seat and, bidding the company a friendly good night, left the room with his crestfallen friend. The others saw them to the foot of the stairs and, having heard their door close, returned to the coffee room. Well, I suppose the bet's off, said the stout commercial, poking the fire and then standing with his legs apart on the hearth rug. Though, as far as I can see, I won it. I never saw a man so scared in all my life. Sort of poetic justice about it, isn't there? Never mind about poetry or justice, said one of his listeners. Who's going to sleep with me? I will, said Malcolm affably. And I suppose we share a room together, Mr. Leake, said the third man, turning to the fourth. No, thank you, said the other briskly. I don't believe in ghosts. If anything comes into my room, I shall shoot it. That won't hurt a spirit, Leake, said Malcolm decisively. Well, the noise will be like company to me, said Leake, and I'll wake the house too. But if you're nervous, sir, he added with a grin to the man who had suggested sharing his room, George will be only too pleased to sleep on the doormat inside your room, I know. That I will, sir, said George fervently. And if you gentlemen would only come down with me to the bar to put the gas out, I could never be sufficiently grateful. They went out in a body, with the exception of Leek, peering carefully before them as they went. George turned the light out in the bar, and they returned unmolested to the coffee room, and, avoiding the sardonic smile of Leek, prepared to separate for the night. Give me the candle while you put the gas out, George, said the traveller. The waiter handed it to him and extinguished the gas, and at the same moment all distinctly heard a step in the passage outside. It stopped at the door, and as they watched with bated breath, the door creaked and slowly opened. Malcolm fell back open-mouthed as a white, leering face with sunken eyeballs and close-cropped bullet head appeared at the opening. For a few seconds, the creature stood regarding them, blinking in a strange fashion at the candle. Then, with a sidling movement, it came a little way into the room and stood there as if bewildered. Not a man spoke or moved, but all watched with a horrible fascination as the creature removed its dirty neckcloth and its head rolled on its shoulder. For a minute it paused, and then, holding the rag before it, moved towards Malcolm. The candle went out suddenly with a flash and a bang. There was a smell of powder and something writhing in the darkness on the floor. A faint, choking cough, and then silence. Malcolm was the first to speak. Matches, he said in a strange voice. George struck one. Then he leapt at the gas, and a burner flamed from the match. Malcolm touched the thing on the floor with his foot and found it soft. He looked at his companions. They mouthed inquiries at him, but he shook his head. He lit the candle and, kneeling down, examined the silent thing on the floor. Then he rose swiftly and, dipping his handkerchief in the water jug, bent down again and grimly wiped the white face. Then he sprang back with a cry of incredulous horror, pointing at it. Leek's pistol fell to the floor and he shut out the sight with his hands. But the others, crowding forward, gazed spellbound at the dead face of Hurst. Before a word was spoken, the door opened and Summers hastily entered the room. His eyes fell on the floor. Good God, he cried. You didn't. Nobody spoke. I told him not to, he said in a suffocating voice. I told him not to. I told him. He leaned against the wall, deathly sick. 
put his arms out feebly and fell fainting into the traveller's arms. End of Jerry Bundler Read by Alan Lord The Living Nightmare by Anton M. Oliver This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amy Dunkelberger The Living Nightmare by Anton M. Oliver You mean to tell me, demanded Jim Brown, that those people left town and expect you to stay in that house alone tonight? "'Why, yes,' said Macmillan, preparing to leave. "'They've gone to Virginia and will be back Thursday, "'when the funeral will take place.' "'And they left the body lying in the living room?' "'Of course. Where did you expect them to leave it? On the porch?' "'And you are going to sleep in that house alone with the corpse?' "'Yes. What of it? There's nothing to be afraid of.' "'Taking his hat and coat, Macmillan departed.' "'Pleasant dreams,' called Brown, as the door slammed behind him. The night was cold, and the atmosphere was clear and hard. The snow crackled under his feet as he walked. "'Silly idea,' he muttered, but he couldn't help wondering why the Mitchells, with whom he made his home, had left the house on the same day that Mrs. Mitchell's grandmother had passed away. In his mind he went over Mrs. Mitchell's explanation— she had told him that they were going to Wheeling, the deceased lady's old home, where a sister lived, and would remain there until the funeral. And she had asked, "'You are not afraid to stay here alone, are you?' No, of course he was not afraid, but it was strange that they should leave the corpse in his charge and depart. Then it came to him, funny he hadn't thought of it before, the Mitchells must be superstitious.' They probably had some silly notion about a house being haunted while a corpse was in it, or something of that sort. That must be it, but how ridiculous! Still, the Mitchells were a little queer anyway, reflected Mac, as he turned up the ice-covered path of the Mitchell residence. It stood surrounded by high buildings and stores, in a section of town which in days gone by had been the very heart of the city's social life. It was one of the largest and oldest homes in the city, and now it was an outcast, so to say, among the monuments to industry and progress, built years ago by the husband of the woman who now lay dead within its walls. It was in a style of architecture long since abandoned. Everything about it was high and narrow, the building itself, the windows and doors, the porch columns, and the roof high up among the tree branches. Mac walked unhesitatingly toward the big dark house, but somehow the formidable brick walls that always look so inviting seemed cold and inhospitable tonight. Strange shadows were playing in the windows. He looked up at his own window. He didn't exactly fancy the idea of going past the room where lay the dead woman, he admitted to himself, but he certainly was not afraid. Not he! With grim resolution, he thrust the key which he had taken from his pocket while coming up the walk into the lock of the front door. The huge glass-paneled door squeaked as he did so, and he was almost startled by his own reflection in the shining glass. He turned the key in its lock and threw the door wide open with unnecessary vigor. A hot wave of air greeted him. The house was warm, surprisingly so, considering that it had been unoccupied all day. His heart, for some unexplainable reason, was beating rather fast as he entered the dark hall. He turned sharply to the left and reached for the electric light switch. His hand had often turned that switch, had often found it instantly in the dark, but tonight he had to feel for it. He turned it once twice, three times, but the hall remained dark. The dark suddenly seemed to give him almost physical pain. Listening acutely, he tried to account for this. Why were the lights out? The street lights were on, and there was light in several of the homes he had passed. 
he stood motionless. There was no sound. The dark house was buried in death-like silence. Then, with nerve-shattering suddenness, came a sound as real as that of his heart, which was beating so that the blood was throbbing in his ears. He whirled to face it, but as suddenly as it had started, it stopped. With clenched teeth and damp forehead, Max stood motionless. Then it came again, a sound like the distant scream of a siren. Gradually he collected his senses, and reason took the place of bewilderment. He reached for his matches, and, striking one, he stepped over to the gas chandelier, turned the valve, and presently a blue flame leaped high from the lamp, which had not been adjusted for months. With somewhat trembling hands he turned the air adjustment, then the gas, until finally the familiar yellow light illuminated the hallway. Then he again heard the noise, this time a little louder and nearer. His decision to investigate suddenly left him. He stood motionless, unable to move, for he not only heard, he also felt. Then, with a sudden resolve, he stepped swiftly to his room, which was on the same floor and adjoined the library. The light from the hall cast a long, distorted shadow on the floor before him. It was so still now that the silence surged in his ears. Lighting his own gas lamp, he locked and bolted his door. His pipe lay on the dresser, and he lit it nervously. Then he looked at himself in the mirror. "'How ridiculous!' he said, half aloud with a forced laugh. Then he began slowly to undress." All was quiet and peaceful here in his own room. How foolish to let himself get so excited. The lights had probably gone out all over the city since he had entered the house, and as for that noise, it was probably outdoors somewhere, and in his mind he had associated it with the perfectly harmless corpse lying in the next room. "'Darn Brown,' he murmured. "'He got me all wrought up over nothing with his kidding.' And having finished undressing, he retired, leaving his light on full, however. In spite of the fact that his own explanation of the origin of the strange sounds had, in a measure, satisfied him, he lay awake for a considerable length of time. He was drifting off on the first soft currents of sleep when he suddenly sat up with a jerk. He had heard a noise. His lamp was flickering weirdly, and he could hear its faint singing, barely audible. Yet it seemed to his ears like the mighty rush of steam from a boiler, for his ears were strained to hear a different sound, a sound he must hear again, the source of which he must locate. His body began to ache from sitting rigidly in one position. Still all was silent. Suddenly, with a sense of being jerked to consciousness, he again heard the noise, like the shriek of a siren. It seemed distant, yet close. His heart labored so hard that he could feel its beat all through his body. The shriek continued for several moments, and then all was silent again. He wanted to rise, but he could not. He was not afraid, he told himself, and yet, suddenly... He heard the sound of footsteps, steps that seemed to come from the interior of the wall, pass through his room and die away gradually. Holding his breath, he listened. The big clock in the front room struck the hour of midnight. He counted each beat as it rang through the house. He was wide awake now. The white curtain seemed to glimmer like sunlit snow, and the clock chimes in the deathly silence sounded like those of a mighty tower clock. As the last note died away, Mac suddenly remembered that the clock had been stopped by Mrs. Mitchell as a mark of respect to her who in the adjoining room was awaiting burial. A sudden feeling of relief came over Mac. It was clear now somebody had come back, Mr. Mitchell perhaps. That explained everything. Confidently, Mac got out of bed and, unlocking his door, stepped into the hall. How different everything looked, how natural and homelike. The light that had had such a ghost-like appearance a short time ago 
seemed friendly and quite natural now. At the foot of the stair, Max stopped and called. He called louder and louder, but all remained silent. Suddenly, for some inexplicable reason, he approached the door of the room next to his, seized the doorknob resolutely, and with a sudden push swung the door open. The rays of the gaslight in the hall fell directly into the room, and what they revealed sent a cold shudder of horror through him. Before him stood two empty pedestals. The body had disappeared. Turning violently, he almost ran to the front door and pulled it open. An icy gust of wind hit his thinly clad body. For several moments he stood breathing the cold night air. Then, with a sudden determination, he slammed the big oak door shut. As the door slammed, there came a sharp report, like the snapping of a wire, followed by a thunder and crashing and wailing. The electric light came on, and the same footsteps that had sounded through the house before came closer and closer. He felt a sharp pain, like the thrust of a knife between his shoulder blades, and then he fell in a swoon. Weeks passed before Mac was well again. Excessive exposure had brought on pneumonia. As soon as he recovered, he summoned me to the hospital and begged me to find a new lodging for him and remove his belongings from the Mitchell home. I tried in vain to explain that he had misunderstood Mrs. Mitchell regarding the disposal of the corpse, for they had taken the body with them for burial in Wheeling, and it was not in the house at any time after their departure. But Mac was resolute. He listened indulgently, patiently, then laying his white-hot hand upon my shoulder, he looked earnestly into my eyes, and with a voice that carried conviction he said, I know what I felt in that room that night. It had a hold on me, and it is waiting for me, and I am not going back. Mac is well again now, and one can see him at the club most any night, but whenever anybody starts to speak of the hereafter, he rises and hurriedly leaves the room. End of The Living Nightmare by Anton M. Oliver A Midnight Visitor by John Kendrick Bangs This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ben Dowling A Midnight Visitor by John Kendrick Bangs I do not assert that what I am about to relate is in all its particulars absolutely true. Not, understand me, that it is not true, but I do not feel that I care to make an assertion that is more than likely to be received by a skeptical age with sneers of incredulity. I will content myself with a simple narration of the events of that evening, the memory of which is so indelibly impressed upon my mind, and which, were I able to do so, I should forget without any sentiments of regret whatsoever. The affair happened on the night before I fell ill of typhoid fever, and is about the sole remaining remembrance of that immediate period left to me. Briefly, the story is as follows. Notwithstanding the fact that I was overworked in the practice of my profession, it was an early March, and I was preparing my contributions for the coming Christmas issues of the periodicals for which I write. I had accepted the highly honorable position of entertainment committeeman at one of the small clubs to which I belonged. I accepted the office, supposing that the duties connected with it were of easy performance, and with absolutely no notion that the faith of my fellow committeemen in my judgment was so strong that they would ultimately manifest a desire to leave the whole program for the club's diversion in my hands. This, however, they did and when the month of March assumed command of the calendar, I found myself utterly fagged out and at my wit's end to know what style of entertainment to provide for the club meeting to be held on the evening of the 15th of that month. I had provided already an unusually taking variety of evenings, of which one in particular, called the Martyr's Night, 
in which living authors writhe through selections from their own works, while an inhuman audience, every man of whom had suffered even as the victims then suffered, sat on ten score of camp stools puffing the smoke of twenty-five score of free cigars into their faces, and gloating over their misery, was extremely successful, and had gained for me among my professional brethren the enviable title of Machiavelli Jr. This performance, in fact, was the one now uppermost in the minds of the club members, having been the most recent of the series, and it had been prophesied by many men whose judgment was unassailable that no man, not even I, could ever conceive of anything that could surpass it. Disposed at first to question the accuracy of a prophecy to the effect that I was, like most others of my kind, Possessed of limitations, I came finally to believe that perhaps, after all, these male Cassandras with whom I was thrown were right. Indeed, the more I racked my brains to think of something better than the Martyr's Knight, the more I became convinced that in that achievement I had reached the zenith of my powers. The thing for me to do now was to hook myself securely on to the zenith and stay there. But how to do it? That was the question which drove sleep from my eyes and deprived me for a period of six weeks of my reason, my hair departing immediately upon the restoration thereof, a not uncommon after symptom of typhoid. It was a typical March night, this one upon which the extraordinary incident about to be related took place. It was the kind of night that novelists use when they are handling a mystery that in the abstract would amount to nothing, but which in the concrete of a bit of wild, weird, and windy nocturnalism sends the reader into hysterics. It may be, I shall not attempt to deny it, that had it happened upon any other kind of evening, a soft, mild, balmy June evening, for instance, my own experience would have seemed less worthy of preservation in the amber of publicity. But of that the reader must judge for himself. The fact alone remains that upon the night when my uncanny visitor appeared, the weather department was apparently engaged in getting rid of its remnants. There was a large percentage of withering blast in the general makeup of the evening. There were rain and snow which alternated in pattering upon my window pane and whitening the apology for a wool that stands three blocks from my flat on Madison Square. The wind whistled as it always does upon occasions of this sort, and from all corners of my apartment, after the usual fashion, there seemed to come sounds of a supernatural order, the effect of which was to send cold chills off on their regular trips up and down the spine of their victim. In this instance, myself. I wish that at the time, the hackneyed quality of these sensations had appealed to me. That it did not do so was shown by the highly nervous state in which I found myself as my clock struck eleven. If I could only have realized at that hour that these symptoms were the same old threadbare premonitions of the appearance of a supernatural being. I should have left the house and gone to the club, and so have avoided the visitation then imminent. Had I done this, I should doubtless also have escaped the typhoid, since the doctors attributed that misfortune to the shock of my experience, which, in my then wearied state, I was unable to sustain, and what the escape of typhoid would have meant to me only those who have seen the bills of my physician and druggist for services rendered and prescriptions compounded are aware. That my mind unconsciously took thought of spirits was shown by the fact that when the first chill came upon me, I arose and poured out for myself a stiff bumper of old reserve rye, which I immediately swallowed. But beyond this, I did not go. I simply sat there before my fire and cudgeled my brains for an idea whereby my fellow members at the Gutenberg Club might be amused. How long I sat there, I do not know. It may have been ten minutes, it may have been an hour. I was barely conscious of the time passing, but I do know that the clock in the Dutch Reformed Church steeple at 29th Street and 5th Avenue was clanging at the first stroke of the hour of midnight when my doorbell rang. Theretofore, if I may be allowed the word, the tintinabulation of my doorbell had been invariably pleasing unto me. 
I am fond of company, and company alone was betokened by its ringing, since my creditors gratify their passion for interviews at my office, if perchance they happen to find me there. But on this occasion, I could not at the moment tell why. Its clanging seemed the very essence of discord. It jangled my nervous system, and as it ceased, I was conscious of a feeling of irritability which is utterly at variance with my nature outside of business hours. In the office, for the sake of discipline, I frequently adopt a querulous manner, finding it necessary in dealing with office boys. But the moment I leave shop behind me, I become a different individual entirely and have been called a moteless sunbeam by those who have seen only that side of my character. This, by the way, must be regarded as a confidential communication, since I am at present engaged in preparing a vest pocket edition of the philosophical works of Schopenhauer in the words of one syllable. And were it known that the publisher had entrusted the magnificent pessimism of the illustrious juggler of words and theories to a moteless sunbeam, it might seriously interfere with the sale of the work. And I may say, too, that this request that my confidence be respected is entirely disinterested, inasmuch as I decline to do the work on the royalty plan, insisting upon the payment of a lump sum, considerably in advance. But to return, I heard the bell ring with a sense of profound disgust. I did not wish to see anybody. My whiskey was low, my quinine pills few in number, my chills alone were present in a profusion bordering upon ostentation. I'll pretend not to hear it, I said to myself, resuming my work of gazing at the flickering light of my fire, which, by the way, was the only light in the room. ting ling a ling went the bell, as if in answer to my resolve. Confound the luck! I cried, jumping from my chair and going to the door with the intention of opening it. An intention, however, which was speedily abandoned, for as I approached it, a sickly fear came over me. A sensation I had never before known seemed to take hold of my being, and instead of opening the door, I pushed the bolt to make it more secure. There's a hint for you, whoever you are, I cried. Do you hear that bolt slide, you? I added, tremulously. For from the other side there came no reply only a more violent ringing of the bell. See here, I called out as loudly as I could. Who are you anyhow? What do you want? There was no answer, except from the bell, which began again. Bell wire is too cheap to steal, I called again. If you want wire, go buy it. Don't try pull mine out. It isn't mine anyhow. It belongs to the house. Still, there was no reply only the clanging of the bell. And then my curiosity overcame my fear, and with a quick movement, I threw open the door. Are you satisfied now? I asked angrily, but I addressed an empty vestibule. There was absolutely no one there, and then I sat down on the mat and laughed. I was never so glad to see no one in my life, but my laugh was short-lived. What made the bell ring? I suddenly asked myself, and then the feeling of fear came upon me again. I gathered my somewhat shattered self together, sprang to my feet, and slammed the door with such force that the corridors echoed to the sound, slid the bolt once more, turned the key, moved a heavy chair in front of it, and then fled like a frightened hare to the sideboard in my dining room. There, I grasped the decanter holding my whiskey seizing a glass from the shelf, and started to pour out the usual drum, when the glass fell from my hand and shivered into a thousand pieces on the hardwood floor, for as I poured, I glanced through the open door, and there in my sanctum the flicker of a random flame divulged the form of a being, the eyes of whom seemed fixed on mine, piercing me through and through. To say that I was petrified but dimly expresses the situation. I was granitized, and so I remained, until by a more luminous flicker from the burning wood I perceived that the being wore a flaring red necktie. He is human, I thought, and with the thought the tension on my nervous system relaxed, and I was able to feel the sufficiently well-developed sense of indignation to demand an explanation. 
This is a mighty cool proceeding on your part, I said, leaving the sideboard and walking into the sanctum. Yes, he replied, in a tone that made me jump. It was so extremely sepulchral, a tone that seemed as if it might have been acquired in a damp corner of some cave of the earth. But it's a cool evening. I wonder that a man of your coolness doesn't hire himself out to some refrigerating company, I remarked with a sneer, which would have delighted the soul of Cassius himself. I have thought of it, returned the being calmly, but never went any further. Summer hotel proprietors have always outbid the refrigerating people and they in turn have been laid low by millionaires who have hired me on occasion to freeze out people they don't like but who have persisted in calling i must confess though my dear hiram that you are not much warmer yourself this greeting is hardly what i expected well if you want to make me warmer i retorted hotly just keep on calling me hiram how the deuce did you know of that blot in my scooching, anyhow? I added, for Hiram was one of the crimes of my family that I tried to conceal, my parents having fastened the name of Hiram Spencer Carrington upon me at baptism for no other reason other than my rich bachelor uncle, who subsequently failed and became a charge upon me, was so named. I was standing at the door of the church when you were baptized, returned the visitor, and as you were an interesting baby, I have kept an eye on you ever since. Of course I knew that you discarded Hiram as soon as you got old enough to put away childish things, and since the failure of your uncle, I have been aware that you desired to be known as Spencer Carrington. But to me you are always have been, and always will be, Hiram. Well, don't give it away, I pleaded. I hope to be famous some day, and if the American newspaper paragrapher ever got a hold of the fact that once in my life I was Hiram, I'd have to hire him to let me alone. That's a bad joke, Hiram, said the visitor, and for that reason I like it, though I don't laugh. There is no danger of your becoming famous if you stick to humor of that sort. Well, I'd like to know, I put in, my anger returning, I'd like to know who in Brindisi you are, what in Cairo you want, and what in the name of the seventeen hinges of the gates of Singapore you are doing here at this time of night. When you were a baby, Hiram, you had blue eyes, said my visitor. Bonny blue eyes, as the poet says. What of it? I asked. This, replied my visitor. If you have them now, you can very easily see what I am doing here. I am sitting down and talking to you. Oh, are you? I said with fine scorn. I had not observed that. The fact is, my eyes were so weakened by the brilliance of that necktie of yours that I doubt I could see anything, not even one of my own jokes. It's a scorcher, that tie of yours. In fact, I never saw anything so red in my life. I do not see why you complain of my tie, said the visitor. Your own is just as bad. Blue is never so withering as red. I retorted, at the same time caressing the scarf I wore. Perhaps not, but, uh, if you will look in the glass, Hiram, you will observe that your point is not well taken, said my vis-a-vis -vis calmly. I acted upon the suggestion and looked upon my reflection in the glass, lighting a match to facilitate the operation. I was horrified to observe that my beautiful blue tie, of which I was so proud, had in some manner changed, and was now of the same aggressive hue as was that of my visitor, red even as a brick is red. To grasp it firmly in my hands and tear it from my neck was the work of a moment, and then, in a spirit of rage, I turned upon my companion. "'Say here!' I cried. 
I've had quite enough of you. I can't make you out and I can't say what I want to. You know where the door is. You will oblige me by putting it to proper use. Sit down, Hiram, said he, and don't be foolish and ungrateful. You are behaving in a most extraordinary fashion, destroying your clothing and acting like a madman generally. What was the use of ripping up such a handsome tie like that? I despise loud hues. Red is a jockey's color, I answered. But you did not destroy the red tie, he said with a smile. You tore upon your blue one. Look, there it is on the floor. The red one you still have on. Investigation showed the truth of my visitor's assertion. That flaunting streamer of anarchy still made my neck infamous, and before me on the floor, an almost unrecognizable mass of shreds, lay my cherished cerulean tie. The revelation stunned me. Tears came into my eyes and trickling down over my cheeks, fairly hissed with the feverish heat of my flesh. My muscles relaxed and I fell limp into the chair. You need stimulant said my visitor kindly. Go, take a drop of your old reserve, and then come back here to me. I have something to say to you. Will you join me? I asked faintly. No, returned the visitor. I am so fond of whiskey that I never molest it. That act which is your stimulant is death to the rye. Never realized that, did you? No, I never did, I said meekly. And yet you claim to love it. Bah! he said. And then I obeyed his command, drained my glass to the dregs and returned. What is your mission? I asked, when I had made myself as comfortable as was possible under the circumstances. To relieve you of your woes, he said. You are a homeopath, I observe, said I with a sneer. You are a homeopath in theory and an allopath in practice. I am not usually unintelligent, said he. I failed to comprehend your meaning. Perhaps you express yourself badly. I wish you'd express yourself for Zululand, I retorted hotly. What I mean is, you believe in the similius similibus business, but you prescribe large doses. I don't believe troubles like mine can be cured on your plan. A man can't get rid of his stock by adding to it. Ah, I see. You think I've added to your troubles. I don't think so, I answered, with a fond glance to my ruined tie. I know so. Well, wait until I have laid my plan before you, and see if you won't change your mind, said my visitor significantly. All right, I said. Proceed. Only hurry. I go to bed early, as a rule. It's getting quite early now. It's only one o'clock, said the visitor, ignoring the sarcasm. But I will hasten, as I have several other calls to make before breakfast. Are you a milkman? I asked. You are flippant, he replied. But Hiram, he added, I have come here to aid you in spite of your unworthiness. You want to know what to provide for your club night on the 15th. You want something that'll knock the Marty's night silly. Not exactly that, I replied. I don't want anything so abominably good as to make all the other things I have done seem failures. That is not good business. Would you like to be hailed as the discoverer of genius? Would you like to be the responsible agent for the greatest exhibition of skill in a certain direction ever seen? Would you like to become the most famous impresario the world has ever known? Now, I said, forgetting my dignity under the enthusiasm with which I was inspired by my visitor's words, and infected more or less with his undoubtedly magnetite spirit, now you are shouting. I thought so, Hiram, I thought so. And as to why I am here, I saw you on Wall Street today and read your difficulty at once in your eyes, and I resolved to help you. I am a magician, and one or two little things have happened of late to make me wish to press to digitate in public. 
I knew you were after a show of some kind, and I've come to offer my services. Oh, pfft, I said. The members of the Gutenberg Club are men of brains, not children. Card tricks are hackneyed, and sleight of hand shows Paul. Do they indeed? said the visitor. Well, mine won't. If you don't believe it, I'll prove to you what I can do. I have no paraphernalia, I said. Well, I have, said he, and as he spoke, a pack of cards seemed to grow out of my hands. I must have turned pale at this unexpected happening, for my visitor smiled and said, Don't be frightened. That's only one of my tricks. Now, choose a card, he added, and when you have done so, toss the pack in the air. Don't tell me what the card is. It alone will fall to the floor. Nonsense, said I. It's impossible. Do as I tell you. I did as he told me, to a degree only. I tossed the cards in the air without choosing one, although I made a feint of doing so. Not a card fell back onto the floor. They, every one, disappeared from view in the ceiling. If it had not been for the heavy chair I had rolled in front of the door, I think I should have fled. How's that for a trick? asked my visitor. I said nothing, for the very good reason that my words stuck in my throat. Give me a little creme de menthe, will you, please? he said, after a moment's pause. I haven't a drop in the house, I said, relieved to think that this wonderful being could come down to anything so earthly. Tch, Hiram! He ejaculated, apparently in disgust. Don't be mean, and, above all, don't lie. Why, man, you've got a full bottle of it in your hand. Do you want it all? He was right. Where it came from, I do not know, but beyond question, the graceful, slim-necked bottle was in my right hand, and my left held a liqueur glass of exquisite form. Say, I gasped, as soon as I was able to collect my thoughts, what are your terms? Wait a moment, he answered. Let me do a little mind reading before we arrange preliminaries. I haven't much of a mind to read tonight, I answered wildly. You're right there. It's like a dime novel, that mind of yours tonight. But I'll do the best I can with it. Suppose you think of your favorite poem, and after turning it over in your mind carefully for a few minutes, select two lines from it, concealing them, of course, from me, and I will tell you what they are. Now, my favorite poem, I regret to say, is Lewis Carroll's Jabberwock, a fact I was ashamed to confess to another stranger, so I tried to deceive him by thinking of some other lines. The effort was hardly successful, for the only other lines I could call to mind at the moment were from Rudyard Kipling's rhyme, The Post That Fitted, and which ran, Year by year, in pious patience, vengeful Miss Bothan sits waiting for the Sleary babies to develop Sleary's fits. <laughs> ejaculated my visitor. You're a great Hiram, you are. And then, rising from his chair and walking to my poet's corner, the magician selected two volumes. There, said he, handing me the departmental ditties, you'll find the lines you tried to fool me with. At the foot of page thirteen, look. I looked, and there lay that vile, sleary sentiment, and all the majesty of type, staring me in the eyes. And here, added my visitor, opening Alice in the looking-glass, here is the poem that, to your mind, holds all the philosophy of life. Come to my arms, my beamish boy, he chortled in his joy. I blushed and trembled, blushed that he should discover the weakness of my taste, trembled at his power. I don't blame you for coloring, said the magician, but I thought you said the Gutenberg was made up by men of brains. Do you think you could stay on the rolls a month if they're aware that your poetic ideals are summed up in the Jabberwock and Sleary's fits? My taste might be far worse, I answered. Yes, it might. You might have stooped to liking some of your own verses. I ought to really congratulate you, I suppose, retorted the visitor with a sneering laugh. This roused my ire again. 
Who are you, anyhow, that you come here and take me to task? I demanded angrily. I'll like anything I please, and without asking your permission. If I cared more for the Peterkin papers than I do for Shakespeare, I wouldn't be accountable to you, and that's all there is about it. Never mind who I am, said the visitor. Suffice to say that I am myself. You'll know my name soon enough. In fact, you'll pronounce it involuntarily the first thing when you wake in the morning, and then... Here he shook his head ominously, and I felt myself grow rigid with fright in my chair. Now for the final trick, he said after a moment's pause. Think of where you would most like to be at this moment, and I'll exert my power to put you there. Only close your eyes first. I closed my eyes and wished. When I opened them, I was in the billiard room of the Gutenberg Club with Perkins and Thompson. For heaven's sake, Spencer, they said in surprise. Where did you drop in from? Why, man, you're as white as a sheet. And what a necktie. Take it off. Grab a hold of me, boys, and hold me fast, I pleaded, falling on my knees in terror. If you don't, I believe I'll die. The idea of returning to my sanctum was intolerably dreadful to me. Ha <laughs> ha, laughed the magician, for even as I spoke to Perkins and Thompson, I found myself seated opposite my infernal visitor in my room once more. They couldn't keep you an instant with me summoning you back. His laughter was terrible, his frown was pleasanter, and I felt myself gradually losing control of my senses. Go, I cried, leave me, or you'll have the crime of murder on your conscience. I have no con, he began, but I heard no more. That is the last I remember of that fearful night. I must have fainted and then fallen into a deep slumber. When I waked, it was morning, and I was alone, but undressed and in bed, unconscionably weak and surrounded by medicine bottles of many kinds. The clock on the mantel on the other side of the room indicated that it was after ten o'clock. Great Beelzebub! I cried, taking note of the hour. I have an engagement with Barlow at nine! And then a sweet-faced woman, who, I afterwards learned, was a professional nurse, entered the room, and within an hour I realized two facts. One was that I had lain ill for many days, and that my engagement with Barlow was now for six weeks unfulfilled. The other, that my midnight visitor was not other than... And yet I don't know. His tricks certainly were worthy of that individual, but Perkins and Thompson assert that I had never entered the club that night. And surely, if my visitor was Beelzebub himself, he would not have omitted so important a factor of success as my actual presence in the billiard room on that occasion would have been. And besides, he was altogether too cool to have come from his reputed residence. Altogether, I think the episode most unaccountable, particularly when I reflect that while no trace of my visitor was discoverable in my room the next morning, as my nurse tells me, my blue necktie was, in reality, found upon the floor, crushed and torn into a shapeless bundle of frayed rags. As for the club entertainment, I am told that, despite my absence, it was a wonderful success, redeemed from failure, the treasure of the club said, by the voluntary services of a guest who secured admittance on one of my cards and who executed some sleight-of-hand tricks that made the members tremble, and whose mind-reading feats performed on the club's butler not only made it necessary for him to resign his office, but disclosed to the house committee the whereabouts of several cases of rare wines that had mysteriously disappeared. End of A Midnight Visitor by John Kendrick Bangs The Missing Light by William A. Lewis From the Black Cat, October 1915. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman. The Missing Light by William A. Lewis. Dr. Fred and I invariably spent Thursday evening of each week smoking and conversing. He resided in the north end of Gloucester, I at the south extremity. I did the visiting. One Thursday night I started for my friend's house, passing the Gorman Cottage as I had done habitually. 
To my surprise, I saw a light in the lower windows. The night was cold, crisp, moonlit, and I started along in the middle of the hard, frosted road, well muffled and aglow with the exertion of a two-mile jaunt. I stepped into Dr. Fred's office. He was sitting before a small sheet-iron stove and barely nodded a salutation. I filled my pipe, meanwhile studying the countenance of my abstracted friend. I was surprised to see the light in the Gorman cottage as I came along. Trifles prey upon us in small places, and we comment on them. Hmm, yes, he replied, yawning and stretching himself. He paused, and a sigh escaped him, broken into little pieces. George, what a wonderful, incomprehensible thing fate is. A dog barked, and somebody slammed a door in the house. Dr. Fred started and looked toward the curtained windows. I looked the same way. On the floor I saw blood and several red-stained cloths kicked into a corner. Been operating? He looked at me searchingly a moment, then turned in his chair, rested his elbow on the back, laid his cheek in his palm, crossed one limb with the other. George, I've got something to tell you. He shifted like one unable to be comfortable, thrust his long, slender legs toward the stove hearth, crossed his feet, put his hands into his pockets, dropped his chin onto his breast. When I came to Gloucester ten years ago, I fell in love with a tender little woman, the daughter of a fisherman. Our union was opposed by the hard-headed father. She used to meet me for an evening walk unknown to him, her mother placing a lamp in the sitting-room window and laying the door-key on the sill. We relished our half-stolen meetings until one night, returning to the gate, the light was missing. Fearful that her father had discovered our plan and dreading his aroused anger, with my approval she went to the neighbors and passed the night. The following morning she returned home. Her father was violent, declaring her absence sinful and shameful, ending by driving her from the house. She hastened to seek my counsel, but I had been suddenly called away. I learned she took the next train. Her mother told me she had placed the light as usual, but the oil was lower than she thought. We searched for the girl, but no trace of her could be found. Five years ago the old man died, merciless, unforgiving, unsolicitous to the last. Broken-hearted and hopeless, his wife passed away two years later. Then the home was closed up. Tonight I was eating supper when a caller wished to see me. In my office I found Olive Gorman, trembling, gasping in the collapse of consumption. I clasped her ragged, cold, quivering body to my heart. She tried to speak, but a deluge of lifeblood poured from her blue lips. A moment later, she lay in my arms, dead. We took her down to her old home. Dr. Fred was silent for a little. If there had only been a little more oil in the lamp, he murmured. I laid my pipe down, pressed his hand, and went out. I passed the Gorman cottage. All was dark. Perhaps there wasn't enough oil in the lamp. The End of The Missing Light by William A. Lewis
A Mother of Monsters by Guy de Maupassant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brianne Winchester. A Mother of Monsters by Guy de Maupassant. I recalled this horrible story, the events of which occurred long ago, and this horrible woman, the other day at a fashionable seaside resort where I saw on the beach a well-known young, elegant and charming Parisienne, adored and respected by everyone. I had been invited by a friend to pay him a visit in a little provincial town. He took me about in all directions to do the honors of the place, showed me noted scenes, chateaux, industries, ruins. He pointed out monuments, churches, old carved doorways, enormous or distorted trees, the oak of St. Andrew, and the yew tree of Roquebois. When I had exhausted my admiration and enthusiasm over all the sights, my friend said with a distressed expression on his face that there was nothing left to look at. I breathed freely. I would now be able to rest under the shade of the trees, but all at once he uttered an exclamation. Oh yes, we have the mother of monsters. I must take you to her. Who is that, the mother of monsters? I asked. She is an abominable woman, he replied. A regular demon, a being who voluntarily brings into the world deformed, hideous frightful children monstrosities in fact and then sells them to showmen who exhibit such things these exploiters of freaks come from time to time to find out if she has any fresh monstrosity and if it meets with their approval they carry it away with them paying the mother a compensation she has eleven of this description she is rich you think i am joking romancing exaggerating no my friend i am telling you the truth the exact truth let us go see this woman then I will tell you her history. He took me into one of the suburbs. The woman lived in a pretty little house by the side of the road. It was attractive and well-kept. The garden was filled with fragrant flowers. One might have supposed it to be the residence of a retired lawyer. A maid ushered us into a sort of little country parlor, and the wretch appeared. She was about forty. She was a tall, big woman with hard features, but well-formed, vigorous and healthy, the true type of a robust peasant woman, half animal and half woman. She was aware of her reputation, and received every one with a humility that smacked of hatred. "'What do you gentlemen wish?' she asked. "'They tell me that your last child is just like an ordinary child, that he does not resemble his brothers at all,' replied my friend. "'I wanted to be sure of that. Is it true?' She cast on us a malicious and furious look as she said, "'Oh, no! Oh, no, my poor sir! He is perhaps even uglier than the rest! I have no luck! No luck! They are all like that. It is heartbreaking. How can the good God be so hard on a poor woman who is all alone in the world? How can he? She spoke hurriedly, her eyes cast down with a deprecating air as of a wild beast who was afraid. Her harsh voice became soft, and it seemed strange to hear those tearful falsetto tones issuing from that big, bony frame of unusual strength and with coarse outlines which seemed fitted for violent action and made to utter howls like a wolf. "'We should like to see your little one,' said my friend. I fancied she colored up. I may have been deceived. After a few moments of silence, she said in a louder tone, "'What good will that do you?' "'Why do you not wish to show it to us?' replied my friend. "'There are many people to whom you will show it. You know whom I mean.' She gave a start, and resuming her natural voice and giving free play to her anger, she screamed, was that you who came here to insult me because my children are like animals? Tell me. You shall not see him. No, no, you shall not see him. Go away. Go away. I do not know why you all tried to torment me like that. She walked over toward us, her hands on her hips, at the brutal tone of her voice, a sort of moaning, or rather a mewing. The lamentable cry of an idiot came from the adjoining room. I shivered to the marrow of my bones. We retreated before her. Take care, devil. They called her the devil, said my friend. Take care, some day you will get yourself into trouble through this. She began to tremble, beside herself with fury, shaking her fist and roaring, Be off with you! What will get me into trouble? Be off with you, miscreants! She was about to attack us, but we fled, saddened at what we had seen. When we got outside, my friend said, Well, you have seen her. What do you think of her? Tell me the story of this brute, I replied. And this is what he told me as we walked along the white high road with ripe crops on either side of it which rippled like the sea in the light breeze that passed over them. This woman was once a servant on a farm. She was an honest girl, steady and economical, 
she was never known to have an admirer and never suspected of any frailty but she went astray as so many do she soon found herself in trouble and was tortured with fear and shame wishing to conceal her misfortune she bound her body tightly with a corset of her own invention made of boards and cord the more she developed the more she bound herself with this instrument of torture suffering martyrdom but brave in her sorrow not allowing any one to see or suspect anything she maimed the little unborn being cramping it with that frightful corset and made a monster of it its head was squeezed and elongated to a point and its large eyes seemed popping out of its head its limbs exaggeratedly long and twisted like the stalk of a vine terminated in fingers like the claws of a spider its trunk was tiny and round as a nut the child was born in an open field and when the weeders saw it they fled away screaming and the report spread that she had given birth to a demon from that time on she was called the devil she was driven from the farm and lived on charity under a cloud she brought up the monster whom she hated with a savage hatred and would have strangled perhaps if the priest had not threatened her with arrest one day some travelling showmen heard about the frightful creature and asked to see it so that if it pleased them they might take it away they were pleased and counted out five hundred francs to the mother at first she had refused to let them see the little animal as she was ashamed but when she discovered it had money value and that these people were anxious to get it she began to haggle with them raising her price with all a peasant's persistence she made them draw up a paper in which they promised to pay her four hundred francs a year besides as though they had taken this deformity into their employ incited by the greed of gain she continued to produce these phenomena so as to have an assured income like a bourgeoise some of them were long some short some like crabs all bodies others like lizards several died and she was heartbroken the law tried to interfere but as they had no proof they let her continue to produce her freaks she has at this moment eleven alive and they bring in on average counting good and bad years from five to six thousand francs a year one alone is not placed the one she is unwilling to show us but she will not keep it long for she is known to all showmen in the world who come from time to time to see if she has anything new she even gets bids from them when the monster is valuable my friend was silent a profound disgust stirred my heart and a feeling of rage of regret to think that i had not strangled this brute when i had the opportunity i had forgotten this story when i saw on the beach of a fashionable resort the other day an elegant charming dainty woman surrounded by men who paid her respect as well as admiration i was walking along the beach arm in arm with a friend the resident physician ten minutes later i saw a nursemaid with three children who were rolling in the sand a pair of little crutches lay on the ground and touched my sympathy i then noticed that these three children were all deformed humpbacked or crooked and hideous those are the offspring of that charming woman you saw just now said the doctor i was filled with pity for her as well as for them and exclaimed oh the poor mother how can she ever laugh do not pity her my friend pity the poor children replied the doctor this is the consequence of preserving a slender figure up to the last these little deformities were made by the corset she knows very well that she is risking her life at this game but what does she care as long as she can be beautiful and have admirers and then i recalled that other woman the peasant the devil who sold her children her monsters End of a mother of monsters the other lodgers by ambrose bierce this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman. The Other Lodgers by Ambrose Bierce. In order to take that train, said Colonel Levering, sitting in the Waldorf Astoria Hotel, you will have to remain nearly all night in atlanta that is a fine city but i advise you not to put up at the breathed house one of the principal hotels it is an old wooden building in urgent need of repairs there are breaches in the wall you could throw a cat through the bedrooms have no locks on the doors no furniture but a single chair in each and a bedstead without bedding just a mattress 
even these meagre accommodations you cannot be sure you will have in monopoly you must take your chance of being stowed in with a lot of others sir it is a most abominable hotel the night that i passed in it was an uncomfortable night i got in late and was shown my room on the ground floor by an apologetic night clerk with a tallow candle which he considerately left with me i was worn out by two days and a night of hard railway travel and had not entirely recovered from a gunshot wound in the head received in an altercation rather than look for better quarters i lay down on the mattress without removing my clothing and fell asleep along toward morning i awoke the moon had risen and was shining in the uncurtained window illuminating the room with a soft bluish light which seemed somehow a bit spooky though i dare say it is no uncommon quality all moonlight is that way if you will observe it imagine my surprise and indignation when i saw the floor occupied by at least a dozen other lodgers i sat up earnestly damning the management of the unthinkable hotel and was about to spring from the bed to go and make trouble with the night clerk him of the apologetic manner and the tallow candle when something in the situation affected me with a strange indisposition to move i suppose i was what a story writer might call frozen with terror for these men were obviously all dead they lay on their backs disposed orderly along three sides of the room their feet to the walls against the other wall furthest from the door stood my bed and the chair all the faces were covered but under their white cloths the features of the two bodies that lay in the square patch of moonlight near the window showed in sharp profile as to nose and chin i thought this is a bad dream and tried to cry out as one does in a nightmare but could make no sound at last with a desperate effort i threw my feet to the floor and passed between the two rows of clotted faces and the two bodies that lay nearest the door i escaped from the infernal place and ran to the office the night clerk was there behind the desk sitting in the dim light of another tallow candle just sitting and staring he did not rise my abrupt entrance produced no effect on him though i must have looked a veritable corpse myself it occurred to me then that i had not before really observed the fellow he was a little chap with a colorless face and the whitest blankest eyes i ever saw he had no more expression than the back of my hand his clothing was dirty gray damn you i said what do you mean just the same i was shaking like a leaf in the wind and did not recognize my own voice the night clerk rose bowed apologetically and well he was no longer there and at that moment i felt a hand laid on my shoulder from behind just fancy that if you can unspeakably frightened i turned and saw a portly kind-faced gentleman who asked what is the matter my friend I was not long in telling him, but before I made an end of it, he went pale himself. See here, he said, are you telling the truth? I had now got myself in hand, and terror had given place to indignation. If you dare to doubt it, I said, I'll hammer the life out of you. No, he replied, don't do that. Just sit down till I tell you. This is not a hotel. It used to be. Afterward, it was a hospital. Now it is unoccupied, awaiting a tenant. The room that you mentioned was the dead room. There are always plenty of dead. The fellow that you called the night clerk used to be that. But later, he booked the patients as they were brought in. I don't understand his being here. He's been dead a few weeks and who are you i blurted out oh 
I look after the premises. I happened to be passing just now, and seeing a light in here came to investigate. Let's have a look into that room, he added, lifting a sputtering candle from the desk. I'll see you at the devil first, I said, and I bolted out of the door into the street. Sir, that Brethet house in Atlanta is a beastly place. Don't you stop there. God forbid, your account of it certainly does not suggest comfort. By the way, Colonel, when did that occur? In September, 1864, shortly after the siege. The End of The Other Lodgers by Ambrose Bierce Phantoms by Lawrence R. Dorsey this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amy Dunkelberger. Phantoms by Lawrence R. Dorsey. The only man who knew the story was Carson, and he never told it. He was as hard headed a man as you could find in the country and his pride was that he wasn't superstitious. When Sellers called on him that evening, he left the monstrous tale in Carson's breast. True, he repudiated ten minutes later, the confession made evidently in a moment of weakness. "'You can't go back on your statements like that, Sellers,' the physician said quietly. "'Even if the hop has so undermined your system that it's but a matter of weeks,' You're not insane. You are as sane as I am, and you're lying to me when you try to get out of it like that. Swear to me that you'll never tell. Never tell. All made up of whole cloth. Spun you a yarn. Don't know why. All right, Carson, old man. Promise to forget it. I would promise and welcome, said the other slowly, if it weren't for the victims— the child, man, you know, Sellers, your case is serious. If you die with that on your soul, I guess I'm old-fashioned and all that, but the child, apart from the, the other thing, abandoned, as you say, in the woods. See a priest. Let me call in Father Quinn. My God, Sellers! Sellers laughed a trifle uneasily. The doctor's blue eyes widened with horror. "'You won't see a priest, Sellers?' he pleaded. "'No, damn the priest, damn you, if you believe the rod I gave you a while back. "'I made it up. Always was a bit theatrical. I lied. "'You lie now, Sellers, you know that.' "'And the keen eyes bored to the shrunken soul rattling in the frail body before him. "'Stop lying, man. You are about to die. It's no use blinking the fact.' common decency, even if you have no respect for religion. With an oath, the other turned on his heel and slammed the door behind him. Yes, Martha was dead and gone. There was no doubt about that. Yet, as Sellers glanced uneasily about the one little room comprising the old ramshackle cabin in the midst of the marsh, he had an eerie sensation that she was present. He had a feeling that she was trying to impress her presence on him, that she was vainly trying to communicate with him. This was the third day that he had passed alone in the old cabin since Martha died. But three days. They seemed like years, like years, it seems, since he had returned in his gift from Vallejo to his home above the inlet, and Martha, noting his drunken state, had started the argument. It had degenerated into the usual squabble, for both were of uncertain temper. Martha, womanlike, seeing that she was being worsted in the argument, had pushed him through the door of the cabin, causing him to land full length in the sticky mud outside. Then he had risen in a towering rage, and grabbing a heavy iron bar, had dealt a terrific blow at his wife's head, expecting to see her dodge, as on many similar occasions. But she had slipped and lost her balance, 
and with a crunching, sickening sound the bar had descended on her unprotected head. He could see her now, lying where she had dropped without a cry or groan. Horrified and frightened, he had poured cold water on her upturned face, had slapped and chafed her wrists. Finally, in a frenzy of terror, he had placed his hand over her heart. There was no movement, not even a flutter. Martha was dead, her head crushed in by the frightful blow. He had sought the hypodermic needle again, and his fears had fallen from him. He had picked up the baby and taken it to the outskirts of Sassoon. Someone would find it and give it a home. But as the drug gradually wore off, he had fallen a prey to remorse and fear, and at last had fled to Carson for comfort and counsel. And God pity him, he had not had the courage to go through with it. Sellers straightened up and glanced around. To his fervid imagination, a thousand pairs of eyes seemed watching him. The leaves on the trees and bushes nearby, rustling in the wind, sounded like accusing voices. A crane rose from the swamp with a mighty flapping of wings and a shrill, harsh cry, causing Sellers' flesh to creep and his hair to stand on end. What if the crane had seen and was now trying to attract man's attention to the murderous deed. Martha's body had been disposed of in a shallow grave, quickly dug in the soft, muddy ground. It was covered over with damp earth. Sellers breathed a sigh of relief. All the same, if only the crane hadn't seen. How gloomy and depressing the old cabin seemed. The very air seemed weighted with an unearthly, deathly chill, and those unseen eyes, watching, watching his every movement. He had been aware of their presence for two years and more, long before Martha died. The doctor had said hallucinations, but Sellers knew better. At night, out at his lines or setting his nets, he had been conscious of ghostly whispers and strange murmurs, which quivered in the air about him. He could not shake off that strange sensation that invisible eyes were watching him out of the misty, damp air that hovered over the swamp. The mysterious sounds were more noticeable in foggy or rainy weather. In fact, several times when out late at night, he had seen mist-like shapes dogging his footsteps. He had at last come to the firm conviction that the air around the swamp was inhabited by a peculiar group of phantoms whose forms were almost visible in damp or foggy weather. Foggy, stormy, gloomy, and the wind this evening whistled across the swamp with a mournful intensity, like a legion of demons turned adrift, seeking for some human being to destroy. Every moment Sellers, sitting there, expected to see the cabin torn apart and its debris scattered, broadcast over the swamp. The rain came down in torrents, stripping down the chimney and threatening to extinguish the small fire in the open hearth. If only Martha were not buried so close to the house. Again and again he felt certain that someone was trying to force open the door, Tiptoeing over, he listened intently. He imagined he could see misty shapes peering in through the solitary window. A damp chill was in the room, despite the fire. He rolled a barrel of water against the door, then fastened a large sheet of cardboard across the window. The misty shapes, furious that their view was obstructed, pointed ghostly, accusing fingers in his direction. The night wore on, and Sellers was unafraid. He pulled a writing tablet towards him and began to write, laughing at the foiled phantom shapes outside. He dozed off to sleep, only to awake with a shriek of terror and that strange intangible feeling that the house was surrounded by invisible beings, ready to pounce upon him the moment he stepped outside. And then a cold perspiration stood on his forehead, what if the piece of cardboard which he had fastened across the window should fail to resist their attempts to force it? With terrified eyes, he glanced across the room. 
The cardboard still protected the window, but Martha seemed to be in the room, and so strong was this feeling that, although he could not see her, he caught himself speaking to her and waiting for her to answer. She seemed somehow to be in the room, sewing or knitting in the old familiar way, and yet she was buried in the shallow grave outside the cabin. What a gloomy place the cabin was! He saw something on the threshold, but as he looked again, it was not there. He searched every nook and corner of the room, even going down on his knees and looking under the bed. He could discover nothing. Finally, he decided that it must have been the cat. It was now purring lazily before the hearth, and he gave it a vicious kick and began to prepare hot coffee. But the wind began to rise, and the rain beat against the window pane in a steady downpour. A chill crept over cellars. The cat was mewing eerily. At times the cabin rocked and swayed with the fury of the gale. Again he was sure that Martha was in the room, quite close to him now, seeking to communicate with him. There was a loud rapping at the door, a loud, insistent knocking, as if someone demanded admittance. In a voice trembling with fear, Sellers asked who was there. No response came, but the latch clicked as if someone were trying to open the door. Panic-stricken, Sellers sat at the table, muttering incoherently to himself. He noticed that the cat, with arched back and hair standing straight in the air, dived under the bed and continued to spit and mew. Again, that knocking on the door, making it quiver on its frail hinges. Then the bar that secured it on the inside began to move slowly out of its socket. Sellers half attempted to rise from his chair with the intention of holding the bar in its place, but he was powerless to move. The cat gave a wild screech and dashed through the flame and smoke of the hearth up the wide chimney. A loud click of the latch, and the door swung open. With eyes starting from their sockets, Sellers, nearly crazed with terror, watched several misty shapes circling round the threshold. They changed and drifted in the wind like phantom forms of fog or smoke. The desperate man's hand flew for the revolver in his hip pocket. As he grasped the weapon, the foremost of the phantoms glided up to where he sat. His brain reeled as he felt a pair of ice-cold hands encircle his wrists. His hands were held as in a vise. Sellers tried to struggle to his feet, but other hands forced him with irresistible pressure back into the chair. His elbow knocked the lamp from the table. It overturned on the floor, and at that moment the fire on the hearth went out leaving the room in utter darkness. The rain and wind had suddenly ceased. The cat on the roof was mewing in an agony of terror. Far across the swamp, the bell of one of the channel buoys sent out a mournful sound, like the bell in the belfry of a church as a funeral approaches. The chill, clammy hands that encircled Sellers' wrists with a slow, steady pressure forced the muzzle of his revolver against his forehead. He tried desperately to resist, but he was as putty in the grip of those unseen hands. And then, in a far corner of the room, he saw Martha, and her face was red with blood from the wound he had inflicted. Sellers made a desperate effort to rise from his chair. The thought flashed through his mind that if he could reach her, he would be saved. But in the grip of those uncanny, unearthly forces, he was powerless. The muzzle of the revolver was forced back slowly, irresistibly. Now, like the finger of fate, it pointed directly at his forehead. A pressure on his finger, a flash of fire before his eyes— Martha swayed forward as if to embrace, drifting through space, drifting, drift. Suicide, said Carson at the inquest, a constitution undermined by long and excessive use of alcohol and drugs. Brain snapped. 
Undoubtedly, he was already insane when he killed his wife. But what about the statement in the deceased handwriting containing what purported to be a record of the happenings of the hours immediately preceding his death? asked the coroner. That seems rational enough. Alcohol and drugs, said the doctor shortly. Hallucinations. And he turned abruptly, as if he were glad to have done with the case. For Carson was as hard-headed a man as you could find in the country, and his pride was that he wasn't superstitious. End of Phantoms by Lawrence R. Dorsey Sam's Ghost by W. W. Jacobs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Alan Lord. Sam's Ghost by W. W. Jacobs. Yes, I know, said the night watchman thoughtfully, as he sat with a cold pipe in his mouth, gazing across the river. I've heard it afore. People tell me they don't believe in ghosts. They make a laugh of them. And all I say is, let them take on a night watchman's job. Let them see her all alone of a night, with the water lapping against the posts and the wind moaning in the corners. Especially if a pal of theirs has slipped overboard and there is little nasty bills stuck up just outside in the high street, offering a reward for the body. Twice men have fallen overboard from this jetty, and I've had to stand my watch here the same night, and not farthing more for it. One of the worst and artfulest ghosts I ever had anything to do with was Sam Bullet. He was a waterman at the stairs nearby here, the saw man that gets you to pay for drinks, and drink yours up by mistake, or he had finished his own. The saw man that had always left his backy box at home, but always had a big pipe in his pocket. He fell overboard off of a lighter one evening, and all that his mates could save was his cap. It was only two nights before that he had knocked down an old man and bit a policeman's little finger to the bone, so that, as they pointed out to the widow, perhaps he was taken for a wise purpose. Perhaps he was happier where he was than doing six months. He was the sort of chap that would make himself happy anywhere, says one of them comforting-like. Not without me, says Mrs. Bullet, sobbing and wiping her eyes on something she used for a pocket handkerchief. He never could bear to be away from me. Was there no last words? Only one, says one of the chaps. Joe Peel by name. As he fell overboard, says the other. Mrs. Bullet began to cry again, and say what a good husband he had been. Seventeen years come Michaelmas, she says, and never a cross word. Nothing was too good for me. Nothing I had only to ask to have. What is going now? Says Joe. And we thought we ought to come round and tell you. So as you can tell the police. Says the other chap. That was how I came to hear it first. A policeman told me that night as I stood outside the gate having a quiet pipe. He wasn't shedding tears. His only idea was that Sam had got off too easy. Well, well, I says, trying to pacify him. He won't bite no more fingers. There's no policeman where he's gone to. He went off grumbling and telling me to be careful. And I put my pipe out and walked up and down the wharf, thinking. Only a month before, I'd lent Sam fifteen shillings on a gold watch and chain, what he said an uncle had left him. I wasn't wearing it, because he said his uncle wouldn't like it. But I had it in my pocket. When I took it out under one of the lamps, I wondered what I ought to do. My first idea 
was to take it to Mrs. Bullock. And then, all of a sudden, the thought struck me. Suppose he hadn't come by it honest. I walked up and down again, thinking. If he hadn't, when it was found out, he would blacken his good name and break his poor wife's heart. That's the way I looked at it. And for his sake, and her sake, I determined to stick to it. I felt happier in my mind when I decided on that. When I went round to the bear's head, man had a pint. Either that, I had another. And then I come back to the wharf and put the watch and chain on and went on with my work. Every time I looked down at the chain on my waistcoat, it reminded me of Sam. I looked onto the river and thought of him going down on the ebb. Then I got a sort of lonesome feeling, standing on the end of the jetty all alone. And I went back to the bear's head and had another pint. They didn't find the body. And I was almost forgetting about Sam, when one evening, as I was sitting on a box, waiting to get my breath back to have another go at sweeping, Joe Peel, Sam's mate, came onto the wharf to see me. He came in a mysterious sort of way that I didn't like, looking behind him as though he was afraid of being followed and speaking in a whisper as if he was afraid of being heard. He wasn't a man I liked, and I was glad that the watch and chain was stowed safe away in my trousers' pocket. I've had a shock, watchman, he says. Oh, I says. A shock what shook me all up, he says, working up a shiver. I've seen something what I thought people never could see and what I never want to see again. I've seen Sam. I thought a bit before I spoke. Why, I thought he was drowned, I says. So he is, says Joe. When I say I've seen him, I mean... I have seen his ghost. He began to shiver again, all over. What was it like? I says, very calm. Like Sam, he says, rather short. When was it? I says. Last night, at quarter to twelve, he says. He was standing at my front door, waiting for me. And have you been shivering like that ever since? I says, worse than that, says Joe, looking at me very hard. It's wearing off now, but the ghost gave me a message for you. I put my hand in my trousers pocket and looked at him. Then I walked very slow towards the gate. It gave me a message for you, says Joe, walking beside me. We was always pals, Joe, it says. You and me. And I want you to pay up 15 bob for me, what I borrowed off of Bill, the watchman. I can't rest until it's paid, it says. So here's the 15 bob, watchman. He put his hand in his pocket and takes out 15 bob and holds it out to me. Nah, nah, I says. I can't take your money, Joe Peel. It wouldn't be right. Poor Sam, he's welcome to the 15, Bob. I don't want it. You must take it, says Joe. The ghost said, if you didn't, it will come to me again and again, till you did. And I can't stand any more of it. I can't help your troubles, I says. You must, says Joe. And give Bill the 15, Bob, it says, and he'll give you a gold watch and chain, what I gave him to mine till it was paid. I see his little game then. Go watch and chain, I says laughing. You must have misunderstood it, Joe. I understood it right enough, says Joe, and getting a bit closer to me as I stepped outside the gate. It's your fifteen, Bob. Are you going to give me that watch and chain? Certainly not. I says, I don't know what you mean by a watch and chain. If I had it, when I gave it to anybody, I should give it to Sam's widow, not to you. 
It's nothing to do with her, says Joe, very quick. Sam was most particular about that. I expect you dreamt it all, I says. Where would poor Sam get a gold watch and chain from? And why should he go to you about it? Why didn't he come to me? If he thinks I have got it, let him come to me. Why, I'll go to the police station, says Joe. I'll come with you, I says. But here's a policeman coming along. Let's go to him. I moved towards him, but Joe hung back, and I used him one or two words that would have made any ghost ashamed to know him. He sheared off. I had a word or two with the policeman about the weather, and then I went inside and locked the gate. My idea was that Sam had told Joe about the watching chain before he fell overboard. Joe was a nasty customer, and I could see that I should have to be a bit careful. Some men might have told the police about it, but I never cared much for them. They're like kids in a way, and always asking questions, most of which you can't answer. It was a little bit creepy all alone on the wharf that night. I don't deny it. Twice I thought I heard something coming up on tiptoe behind me. The second time, I was so nervous that I began to sing to keep my spirits up, and I went on singing till three of the hands of the Sue's and Emily, what was lying alongside, came up from the forecastle and offered to fight me. I was thankful when daylight came. Five nights afterwards, I had the shock of my life. It was the first night for some time that there was no craft up. A dark night and a nasty moaning saw wind. I had just lighted the lamp at the corner of the warehouse, what had blown out. I was sitting down to rest before putting the ladder away when I happened to look along the jetty and saw a head coming up over the edge of it. In the light of the lamp, I saw the dead white face of Sam Bullitt's ghost making faces at me. I just caught my breath, sharp like, and then turned and ran for the gate like a racehorse. I'd left the key in the padlock in case of anything happening, but I just gave it one turn flung the wicket open and slammed it in the ghost's face and tumbled out into the road. I ran slap into the arms of a young policeman while I was passing. Nasty, short-tempered chap he was. I don't think I was more glad to see anybody in my life. I hugged him till he nearly lost his breath and then he sat me down on the curbstone and asked me what I meant by it. What? With the excitement and the running, I couldn't speak at first. And when I did, he said I was trying to deceive him. There ain't no such thing as ghosts, he says. You've been drinking. It came up out of the river and run on me like the wind, I says. Why didn't it catch you then, he says, looking me up and down and all round about. Talk sense. He went up to the gate and peeped in, and, uh, watching a moment, stepped inside and walked down the wharf with me following. It was my duty. Besides, I didn't like being left all alone by myself. Twice we walked up and down and all over the wharf. He flashed his lantern into all the dark corners, into empty barrels and boxes, and then he turned and flashed it right into my face and shook his head at me. You've been having a bit of a lark with me, he says, and for two pins I'd take you. Mind, if you say a word about this to anybody, I will. He stalked off with his head in the air and left me all alone in charge of a wolf with a ghost on it. I stayed outside in the street, of course, but every now and then... I fancied I heard something moving about the other side of the gate, 
and once it was so distinct that I run along to the bear's head and knocked him up and asked him for a little brandy for illness. I didn't get it, of course. I didn't expect to. But I had a little conversation with the landlord from his bedroom window. That did me more good than the brandy would have done. Once or twice, I thought he would have fallen out. And many a man has had his license taken away for less than a quarter of what he said to me that night. While well, he thought he had finished, I was going back to bed again. I pointed out to him that he hadn't kissed me good night. And if it hadn't have been for his missus and two grown-up daughters and the potman, I believed he'd have talked to me till daylight. How I got through the rest of the night, I don't know. It seemed to be twenty nights instead of one. But the day came at last, and when the hands came on at six o'clock, they found the gate open and me on duty, same as usual. I slept like a tired child when I got home, and our steak and onions for dinner. I sat down and lit my pipe and tried to think what was to be done. One thing I was quite certain about, I wasn't going to spend another night on that wharf alone. I went out after a bit, as far as the Clarendon Arms, for a breath of fresh air, and I'd just finished a pint and was wondering whether I ought to have another when Ted Dennis came in, and my mind was made up. He'd been in the army all his life, and so far he had never seen anything that had frightened him. I've seen him myself take on men twice his size, just for the love of the thing, and, oh, knocking him silly, stand him a pint out of his own pocket. When I asked him whether he was afraid of ghosts, he laughed so hard that the landlord came from the other end of the bar to see what was the matter. I stood Ted a pint, and I he had finished it, I told him just how things was. I didn't say anything about the watch and chain, because there was no need to. And when we came outside again, I'd engaged an assistant watchman for night and a night. All you got to do, I says, is to keep me company. You didn't turn up till eight o'clock of the night, and you can leave half an hour afore me in the morning. Oh, oh, says Ted, and if I see the ghost, I'll make it wish it had never been born. It was a load off my mind. When I went home and ate a tea, they made my missus talk about the workhouse. Men, all stretches in human shape. What would eat a woman out of house and home if she would let them? I got to the wharf just as it was striking six. And at a quarter to seven... The wicket was pushed open gentle, and the ugly head of Mr. Joe Peel was shoved inside. Hello, I says. What do you want? I want to save your life, he says, in a solemn voice. You was within an inch of death last night, watchman. Ah, oh, I says, careless like. How do you know? The ghost of Sam Bullet told me says Joe. I really chased you up the wharf screaming for help. He came round and told me all about it. It seems fun to you, I says. I wonder why. It was in a terrible temper, says Joe. And his face was awful to look at. Tell the watchman, it says, that if he don't give you the watch and chain, I shall appear to him again and kill him. All right, I says. Looking behind me to where three of the hands of the daisy was sitting on the forecastle smoking. Well, I've got plenty of company tonight. Company won't save you, says Joe. For the last time, are you going to give me that watch and chain or not? Here's your fifteen, Bob. Nah, I says. Even if I had got it, I shouldn't give it to you. And it's no use giving it to the ghost. Because... Being made of air, he hasn't got anywhere to put it. Very good, says Joe, and giving me a black look. I've done all I can to save you, 
But if you won't listen to sense, you won't. You'll see Sam Bullet again, and you'll not only lose the watch and chain, but your life as well. All right, I says, and thank you kindly. But I've got an assistant, as it happens, a man who wants to see a ghost. An assistant, says Joe, staring. An old soldier, I says, a man what likes trouble and danger. His idea is to shoot the ghost and see what happens. Shoot, says Joe. Shoot a poor harmless ghost? Does he want to be hung? Ain't it enough for a poor man to be drowned? But what, you must try and shoot him afterwards? Why, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Where's your heart? He won't be shot if he don't come on my wolf, I says. So I don't mind if he does when I've got somebody with me. I ain't afraid of anything living. I don't mind ghosts when there's two of us. Besides which, the noise of the pistol will wake up off the river. You take care you don't get woke up, says Joe, hardly able to speak for temper. He went off stamping and grinding his teeth. At eight o'clock to the minute, Ted Dennis turned up with his pistol and helped me take care of the wolf. Happy as a skylark he was, and to see him hiding behind a barrel with his pistol ready, waiting for the ghost, almost made me forget the expense of it all. It never came near us that night, and Ted was a bit disappointed next morning as he took his ninepence and went off. Next night was the same, and the next, and then Ted gave up hiding on the wharf for it and sat and snoozed in the office instead. A week went by, and then another, and still there was no sign of Sam Bullitt's ghost, or Joe Peel, and every morning I had to try and work up a smile as I shelled out nightmares for Ted. It nearly ruined me, and worse than that, I couldn't explain why I was short to the missus. First of all, she asked me what I was spending it on. Then she asked me who I was spending it on. It nearly broke up my own. She did smash one kitchen chair and a vase off the parlour mantelpiece, but I wouldn't tell her. And then, led away by some men on strike at Smith's Wharf, Ted went on strike for a bob a night. That was Arthur. He had been with me for three weeks, and when Sadie came, of course, I was more sure than ever, and people came and stood at their doors all the way down our street to listen to the missus taking my character away. I stood it as long as I could, and then when her back was turned, for half a moment, I slipped out. While she'd been talking, I'd been thinking, and it came to me, clear as daylight, that there was no need for me to sacrifice myself any longer, looking after a dead man's watch and chain. I didn't know exactly where Joe Peel lived, but I knew the part, and I peeping into seven public houses. I see the man I wanted sitting by himself in a little bar. I walked in quiet-like and sat down opposite him. Morning, I says. Joe Peel grunted. Have one with me, I says. He grunted again, but not quite so fierce, and I fetched the two pints from the counter and took a seat alongside of him. I've been looking for you, I says. Oh, he says, looking me up and down and all over. Well, you found me now. I want to talk to you about the ghost of poor Sam Bullet, I says. Joe Peel put his mug down sudden and looked at me fierce. Look here, don't you come and try to be funny with me, he says, because I won't have it. I don't want to be funny, I says. What I want to know is, are you in the same mind about that watch and chain as you was the other day? He didn't seem to be able to speak at first. But all the time, he gives a gasp. 
What's the game? He says. What I want to know is, if I give you that watch and chain for 15 bob, will that keep the ghost from hanging around my wharf again? I says. Why, of course, he says, staring. But you ain't been seeing it again, have you? I've not, but I don't want to, I says. If it wants you to have the watch and chain, give me the fifteen bob and it's yours. He looked at me for a moment as if he couldn't believe his eyesight. And then he puts his hand into his trousers pocket and pulls out one shilling and fourpence, half a clay pipe and a bit of lead pencil. That's all I got with me, he says. I'll owe you the rest. You ought to have took the fifteen bob when I had it. There was no help for it. And I was making him swear to give me the rest of the money when he got it. And I shouldn't see the ghost again. I handed the things over to him and came away. He came to the door to see me off. And if ever a man looked puzzled, he did. Pleased at the same time. He was a load off my mind. My conscience told me I'd done right. And I was sending a little boy with a note to Ted Dennis to tell him not to come any more. I felt happier than I had done for a long time. When I got to the wharf that evening, it seemed like a different place. And I was whistling and smiling over my work quite my old way when a young policeman passed. Hello, he says. Have you seen the ghost again? I have not, I says, drawing myself up. Have you? Nah, he says. We missed it. Missed it? I says, staring at him. Yes, he says, nodding. The day I you came out screaming and cuddling me like a frightened baby. It shipped as a B on the Bark Ocean King for Valparaiso. We missed it by a few hours. Next time you see a ghost, knock it down first and go and cuddle the police afterwards. End of Sam's Ghost. Read by Alan Lord. Spirits by J. M. Alvey From Weird Tales, May 1924 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman. Spirits by J. M. Alvey. After sunset, say about an hour after, when the shadows have had time to stretch out to their full length, and before the moon has risen, the road that winds down from Monk's Head Ridge is as lonesome and creepy a place as I have ever known. It was down this little traveled mountain trail that old Uncle Henry Jackson Brown came on his way home from Wednesday night prayer meeting one dark autumn evening. All eyes and ears was Uncle Henry as he plodded along, looking from side to side, his knees jerking up and down under his frock coat, as he took up his big feet, and put them down again, in great haste. For the colored parson at the little church on the ridge had preached that evening the third of a series of blood-curdling sermons on communications with the dead just where the road becomes the loneliest and uncle henry's eyes were bulging the widest and his heart was racing the fastest just there of all places on that deserted highway he stopped terrified and his mouth fell open for straight ahead and directly over the roadway a corpse was hanging from a tree i've been expecting it thought uncle henry i've been a prophesying it to myself i knowed it was going to happen i just felt it in my bones 
Oh, why didn't I go home the other way? Oh, why did I take this here shortcut? Ho, ho, sang the corpse. You're late, brother. You're late. There ain't much blood left. That's a fact. Accuse me, panted Uncle Henry, trembling violently. Accuse me, but I, I don't want no blood. Th thank you. No, sir, not me. What? No blood? cried the corpse with astonishment. You're missing a rare opportunity, brother. A rare opportunity. I hope I didn't appear to be no ways uppish, said Uncle Henry politely, for he remembered the parson's caution about the proper respect that should be shown to departed brethren. But I'm an old man on my way home, sir, and if it's all the same to you, sir, I'd like to hurry on. Yes, sir, I'm in a powerful great hurry. Well, snarled the corpse, you can't go till you take a quart of blood. I only got a little left, and I can't go home myself till I get rid of the last drop. I, I'd rather not. Ho, ho, crowed the hangman, and began to jump up and down and swing back and forth on his rope. Rather not, eh? Ho, ho. It's a rare opportunity, and he says he'd rather not. How much money you got? Two bucks, answered Uncle Henry, his face so white that it showed in the darkness. Two bucks is all I got. And if you please, sir, I'd be much obliged if you'd not do any more of them gyrations. Two bucks echoed the corpse, paying no attention to the old man's request, but continuing to dance around in the air. Ho, ho, two bucks. Come slip it in my pocket. Uncle Henry's knees grew weak, and his heart was crowding his Adam's apple, and his eyes were bulging out by now. Come on, commanded the hanged man. Come slip it in my pocket. Make it snappy, brother, make it snappy. Uncle Henry was too weak to run. He was too frightened to go forward. He stood there, mouth open, back bent, legs sagging, feet rooted to the earth, and stared at the corpse. Hurry up, come slip it in my pocket, and get your blood. I, I'm a-coming, said Uncle Henry meekly standing where he was, however, and trembling all the way down into his walking-stick. I'm a-coming. Very slowly he advanced, one big foot at a time, one step backward for every two steps forward. You're powerful slow about it, remarked the corpse impatiently. Get a move on, man. I can't hang out here all night. Hurry up, brother. Yes, sir, I'm a coming, whispered Uncle Henry. He was close enough now to see the awful figure had no head. The old man shut his eyes and reached out his hand. His heart turned a somersault, and his windpipes snapped shut as he touched the corpse's coat pocket and dropped his two one-dollar bills therein. Immediately, something cold and clammy touched his face and fell slowly to the ground. The hanged man laughed. The old man dropped to his knees, put his hands together, moved his quivering lips in prayer. In his fervor he forgot what had been hanging over his head, and he opened his eyes and turned them heavenward. The corpse had disappeared. Goodbye, Lord, said Uncle Henry, cutting his prayer short. I see my way clear to get home now. Goodbye. He put his hands down to help himself up and touched something cold. It felt familiar, and he picked it up. It was a bottle with a string tied to the neck. Blood, cried Uncle Henry. Two bucks worth of blood. The very idea horrified him. 
the bottle slipped from his shaky hand to the ground and smashed the odor that rose to uncle henry's nose was not that of blood it was a well-known smell spirits cried the old man lord a mighty spirits sure enough go on home you old fool said the voice up in the tree clear out of here i'm gonna let my dummy down again i hear another customer coming down the hill go on get out of here somebody's a profiting by the parson's sermon at any rate mumbled uncle henry as he went sorrowfully on down the monk's head ridge road through the dark the end of spirits by j m alvey the striding place by gertrude atherton this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by kelsey todd st louis missouri september 20th 2021 Weigel, continental and detached, tired early of grouse shooting, to stand propped against a sod fence while his host's workmen routed up the birds with long poles and drove them towards the waiting guns, made him feel himself a parody on the ancestors who had roamed the moors and forest of this west riding of Yorkshire in hot pursuit of game worth the killing. But when in England in August, he always accepted whatever proffered for the season and invited his host to shoot pheasants on his estates in the south. The amusements of life, he argued, should be accepted with the same philosophy as its ills. It had been a bad day. A heavy rain made the moor so spongy that it fairly sprang beneath the feet. Whether or not the grouse had haunts of their own, wherein they were immune from the rheumatism, the bag had been small. The women, too, were an unusually dull lot, with the exception of a new-minded debutante who bothered Weigel at dinner, by demanding the verbal restoration of the vague paintings on the vaulted roof above them. But it was no one of these things that sat on Weigel's mind as, when the other men went up to bed, he let himself out of the castle and sauntered down to the river. His intimate friend, the companion of his boyhood, the chum of his college days, his fellow traveler in many lands, the man for whom he possessed stronger affection than for all men, had mysteriously disappeared two days ago and his track might have sprung to the upper air for all Tracy had left behind him. He had been a guest on the adjoining estate during the past week, shooting with the fervor of the true sportsman, making love in the intervals to Adeline Cavan, and apparently in the best of spirits. As far as was known, there was nothing to lower his mental mercury, for his rent roll was a large one. Miss Cavan blushed whenever he looked at her, and, being one of the best shots in England, he was never happier than in August. The suicide theory was preposterous, all agreed, and there was little reason to believe him murdered. Nevertheless, he had walked out of March Abbey two nights ago without hat or overcoat, and had not been seen since. The country was being patrolled night and day. A hundred keepers and workmen were beating the woods and poking the bogs on the moors, but as yet not so much as a handkerchief had been found. Weigel did not believe for a moment that Wyatt Gifford was dead, and although it was impossible not to be affected by the general uneasiness, he was disposed to be more angry than frightened. At Cambridge, Gifford had been an incorrigible practical joker, and by no means had outgrown the habit. It would be like him to cut across the country in his evening clothes, board a cattle train, and amuse himself touching up the picture of the sensation in West Riding. However, Weigel's affection for his friend was too deep to companion with tranquility in the present state of doubt, and, instead of going to bed early with the other men, he determined to walk until ready for sleep. He went down to the river and followed the path through the woods. There was no moon, but the stars sprinkled their cold light upon the pretty belt of water flowing placidly past wood and ruin, between green masses of overhanging rocks or sloping banks tangled with tree and shrub, leaping occasionally over stones with the harsh notes of an angry scold to recover its equanimity the moment the way was clear again. It was very dark in the depths where Weigel trod. He smiled as he recalled a remark of Gifford's. An English wood is like a good many other things in life, very promising at a distance, 
but a hollow mockery when you get within. You see daylight on both sides, and the sun freckles the very bracken. Our woods need the night to make them seem what they ought to be, what they once were, before our ancestors' descendants demanded so much more money in these so much more various days. Weigel strolled along, smoking, and thinking of his friend, his pranks, many of which had done more credit to his imagination than this, and recalling conversations that had lasted the night through. Just before the end of the London season, they had walked the streets one hot night after a party, discussing the various theories of the soul's destiny. That afternoon, they had met at the coffin of a college friend, whose mind had been a blank for the past three years. Some months previously, they had called at the asylum to see him. His expression had been senile, his face imprinted with the record of debauchery. In death, the face was placid, intelligent, without ignoble lineation. The face of the man they had known at college. Weigel and Gifford had no time to comment there, and the afternoon and evening were full, but, coming forth from the house of festivity together, they had reverted almost at once to the topic. I cherish the theory, Gifford had said, that the soul sometimes lingers in the body after death. During madness, of course, it is an impotent prisoner, albeit a conscious one. Fancy its agony and its horror. What more natural than that, when the life spark goes out, the tortured soul should take possession of the vacant skull and triumph once more for a few hours while old friends look their last? It has had time to repent while compelled to crouch and behold the result of its work, and it has shrived itself into a state of comparative purity. If I had my way, I should stay inside my bones until the coffin had gone to its niche, that I might obviate for my poor old comrade the tragic impersonality of death. And I should like to see justice done to it, as it were, to see it lowered amongst its ancestors with the ceremony and solemnity that are its due. I am afraid that if I dissevered myself too quickly, I should yield to curiosity and hasten to investigate the mysteries of space. You believe in the soul as an independent entity, then? That it and the vital principle are not one and the same? Absolutely. The body and soul are twins, life comrades, sometimes friends, sometimes enemies, but always loyal in the last instance. Some day, when I'm tired of the world, I shall go to India and become a Mahatma solely for the pleasure of receiving proof during life of this independent relationship. Suppose you were not sealed up properly and returned after one of your astral flights to find your earthly part unfit for habitation. It is an experiment I don't think I should care to try, unless even juggling with soul and flesh had palled. That would not be an uninteresting predicament. I should rather enjoy experimenting with broken machinery. The high, wild roar of water smote suddenly upon Weigel's ear and checked his memories. He left the wood and walked out on the huge, slippery stones which nearly closed the river wharf at this point and watched the waters boil down into the narrow pass with their furious, untiring energy. The black quiet of the woods rose high on either side. The stars seemed colder and wider just above. On either hand, the perspective of the river might have run into a rayless cavern, there was no lonelier spot in England, nor one which had the right to claim so many ghosts, if ghosts were there. Weigel was not a coward, but he recalled uncomfortably the tales of those that had been done to death in the Strid. Wordsworth Boy of Aragmond had been disposed of by the practical Whitaker, but countless others, more venturesome than wise, had gone down into that narrow boiling course, never to appear in the still pool a few yards beyond. Below the great rocks which formed the walls of the Strid was believed to be a natural vault, onto whose shelves the dead were drawn. The spot had an ugly fascination. Weigel stood, visioning skeletons, uncoffined and green, the home of the eyeless things which had devoured all that had covered and filled that rattling symbol of man's mortality, and then fell to wondering if anyone had attempted to leap the Strid of late. It was covered with slime. He had never seen it look so treacherous. He shuddered and turned away, impelled, despite his manhood, to flee the spot. As he did so, something tossing in the foam below the fall, something as white, yet independent of it, caught his eye and arrested his step. Then he saw that it was describing contrary motion to the rushing water, an upward-backward motion. 
Weigel stood rigid, breathless. He fancied he heard the crackling of his hair. Was that a hand? It thrust itself still higher above the boiling foam, turned sideways, and four frantic fingers were distinctly visible against the black rock beyond. Weigel's superstitious terror left him. A man was there, struggling to free himself from the suction beneath the strid, swept down, doubtless, but a moment before his arrival, perhaps as he stood with his back to the current. He stepped as close to the edge as he dared. The hand doubled, as if an imprecation, shaking savagely in the face of that force which leaves its creatures to immutable law, then spread wide again, clutching, expanding, crying for help as audibly as the human voice. Weigel dashed to the nearest tree, dragged and twisted off a branch with his strong arms, and returned as swiftly to the strid. The hand was in the same place, still gesticulating as wildly. The body was undoubtedly caught in the rocks below, perhaps already halfway along one of those hideous shelves. Weigel let himself down upon a lower rock, braced his shoulder against the mass beside him, then, leaning out over the water, thrust the branch into the hand. The fingers clutched it convulsively. Weigel tugged powerfully, his own feet dragged perilously near the edge. For a moment, he produced no impression. Then an arm shot above the waters. The blood sprang to Weigel's head. He was choked with the impression that the strid had him in her roaring hold, and he saw nothing. Then the mist cleared. The hand and arm were nearer, although the rest of the body was still concealed by the foam. Weigel peered out with distended eyes. The meager light revealed in the cuffs links of a peculiar device. The fingers clutching the branch were as familiar. Weigel forgot the slippery stones, the terrible death if he stepped too far. He pulled with passionate will and muscle. Memories flung themselves into the hot light of his brain, trooping rapidly upon each other's heels, as in the thought of the drowning. Most of the pleasures of his life, good and bad, were identified in some way with his friend. Scenes of college days, of travel where they had deliberately sought adventure and stood between one another and death upon more occasions than one, of hours of delightful companionship among the treasures of art, and others in the pursuit of pleasure flashed like the changing particles of a kaleidoscope. Weigel had loved several women, but he would have flouted in these moments the thought that he had ever loved any woman as he loved Wyatt Gifford. There were so many charming women in the world, and in the thirty-two years of his life he had never known another man, to whom he had cared to give his intimate friendship. He threw himself on his face. His wrists were cracking. His skin was torn from his hands. The fingers still gripped the stick. There was life in them yet. Suddenly something gave way. The hand swung about, tearing the branch from Weigel's grasp. The body had been liberated and flung outward, though still submerged by the foam and spray. Weigel scrambled to his feet and sprang along the rocks, knowing that the danger from the suction was over and that Gifford must be carried straight to the quiet pool. Gifford was a fish in the water and could live under it longer than most men. If he survived this, it would not be the first time that his pluck and science had saved him from drowning. Weigel reached the pool. A man in his evening clothes floated on it, his face turned towards a projecting rock over which his arm had fallen, upholding the body. The hand that had held the branch hung limply over the rock, its white reflection visible in the black water. Weigel plunged into the shallow pool, lifted Gifford in his arms and returned to the bank. He laid the body down and threw off his coat that he might be the freer to practice the methods of resuscitation. He was glad of the moment's respite. The valiant life in the man might have been exhausted in that last struggle. He had not dared to look at his face, to put his ear to the heart. The hesitation lasted but a moment. There was no time to lose. He turned to his prostrate friend. As he did so, something strange and disagreeable smote his senses. For a half moment, he did not appreciate its nature. Then his teeth cracked together, his feet, his outstretched arms pointed towards the woods. But he sprang to the side of the man and bent down and peered into his face. There was no face. This striding place is called the Strid a name which it took of yore. A thousand years hath it borne the name, and it shall a thousand more. End of The Striding Place To Sup with the Devil by Myron I. Sholnick 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman. Henry and George were spending a friendly evening together, talking pleasantly over their wine glasses about a very unpleasant subject. To Sup with the Devil by Myron I. Sholnick. The two men sat across from each other in soft leather chairs. Flames from the fireplace before them licked upward, and shadows danced on the wall and ceilings. The corners were in complete darkness. I say, George, this wine is exceedingly good. One of the men poured rich red liquid from a large decanter into his goblet. Yes, Henry, it's quite good. Much better than brandy, answered George, swallowing hard and rolling his head. Yes, yes it is, said Henry, sighing deeply, his lips and chin stained from the beverage. Yes, yes, nothing like good wine, nothing like it. As I was saying, smiled George. Oh, yes, Henry nodded, setting his goblet on the table and leaning forward in his seat. Do continue with your story. You were telling me about how you met the devil last week and had an interesting chat with him. He winked mischievously. George shook his head vigorously. And I most certainly did. Yes, met the devil and had an enjoyable chat. He's a splendid chap, you know. Not at all like those pictures you see of him. No horns or red monkey outfit. He dresses most conservatively, wears a black suit, and he has nice gray hair. George patted his head. Nice gray hair. Henry poured himself another cup of wine and sipped it slowly. But what did you talk about? I mean, you have nothing in common at all. Oh, no, George shrugged. But we do. We have much in common. I admire the devil and told him so. And he said that he would be glad to have me come and work for him. Work for him? Yes, he wants me to go with him to his headquarters. But his headquarters are in, uh, well, you know. I know, but I still want to go. He said he would make me a demon, or a ghoul or something. Horrid, don't you think? No, not at all. George gulped down the last of his wine. Quite pleasant, if I may say so. Quite a change from the market and speculation and... He snorted loudly. Those damn commodities that I lost so heavily on yesterday. No, I think I'd enjoy seeing things as a demon or a ghoul or something. What did you see? Oh, you know, graveyards, coffins, and corpses. Henry laughed. Oh, that's amusing, most amusing. George smiled tightly. And you see the dead in hell, the fire and brimstone, and you hear their cries of anguish. It's quite pleasant. Then why don't you go with the devil and be done with it? But I am going to go, Henry. Then go. But I must do something first. It's sort of qualification. Yes. I must kill someone. But that's most naughty, old boy, isn't it? Not when you have good reason. Henry held the decanter and looked at the small amount of wine that was left. He shook his head sadly. But who's going to be your victim? You, answered George. Me, said Henry, smiling. Yes, you. Are you mad? No. Henry stopped smiling and his face grew a trifle pale. He suddenly had a sickening feeling that George wasn't kidding him any more. But why me? George pulled a small revolver from his breast pocket. 
I have it from what I believe to be a thoroughly reliable source, that while I was out of town last week, you were out with my wife. Henry's jaw dropped. Why, that's absurd. George pulled back the safety catch on his gun. I heard that you were out with my wife in a parked car on a dark and lonely road. I heard you were doing things with my wife in a parked car on a dark and lonely road. Sweat glistened on Henry's forehead. Me out with your wife? That's preposterous, and you know it. Now put down that gun. Do you hear me? Put it down. No, I don't hear you smiled George, pulling the trigger. I don't hear you at all. A small hole appeared between Henry's eyes, and he slipped from his chair to the floor. What was left of his goblet of wine spilled on his shirt front. George looked at his dead friend for a moment, then pocketed his gun. How did I do? he called out to a dark corner of the room. A tall, heavy-set man in a black suit stepped out of the darkness, walking toward the fireplace. His silver hair sparkled in the dancing light. Fine, my friend, fine. George sighed contentedly. And now you'll let me go with you? Now I'll let you come with me to hell, said the devil, and I'll make you a demon or a ghoul, he grinned or something. George was breathing heavily, and the nostrils on his thin nose were quivering. Well, what are we waiting for? Let's go. The devil smiled. There's no hurry, my friend. Calm yourself. Here, let us drink some wine. He picked up the decanter and poured what was left in it into two cups. He handed one to George. To our future, said the devil, drinking quickly. To our future, said George, sipping the wine, looking a bit perplexed. The devil's eyes bored into George. What is wrong, my friend? You look puzzled. Well, I was just wondering, George said. You know, just aimlessly wondering. What about? asked the devil. Well, I guess I shouldn't ask, but... But Henry was such a good friend. Are you positive that you saw my wife with him in that parked car last week? The devil shrugged. A shrewd grin pulled at his lips. I could have been wrong about that. You'd never forgive yourself, would you? Wouldn't that be hell? and George realized suddenly, for the first time, that it was, screamed long and heatedly. The End of To Sup with the Devil by Myron I. Shuldnick The Terror by Guy de Maupassant This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen R. Gagan. The Terror by Guy de Maupassant You say you cannot possibly understand it? I believe you. You think I'm losing my mind? Perhaps I am, but for other reasons than those you imagine, my dear friend. Yes, I'm going to be married, and will tell you what has led me to take that step. I may add that I know very little of the girl who is going to become my wife tomorrow. I've only seen her four or five times. I know that there is nothing unpleasing about her, and, and that is enough for my purpose. She is small, fair, and stout. So, of course, the day after tomorrow, I shall ardently wish for a tall, dark, thin woman. She is not rich and belongs to the middle classes. She is a girl such as you may find by the gross well adapted for matrimony, without any apparent faults, and with no particularly striking qualities. People say of her, Mademoiselle La Jolie is a very nice girl, and tomorrow they will say, what a very nice woman Madame Raymond is. She belongs, in a word, to that immense number of girls whom one is glad to have for one's wife, till the moment comes when one discovers 
that one happens to prefer all other women of, to that particular woman whom one has married. Well, you will say to me, what on earth did you get married for? I hardly like to tell you the strange and seemingly improbable reason that urged me on to this senseless act. The fact, however, is that I am afraid of being alone. I don't know how to tell you or to make you understand me, but my state of mind is so wretched that you will pity me and despise me. I do not want to be alone any longer at night. I want to feel that there is someone close to me, touching me, a being who can speak and say something, no matter what it be. I wish to be able to awaken somebody by my side so that I may be able to ask some sudden question, a stupid question even if I feel so inclined, so that I may hear a human voice and feel that there is some waking soul close to me, someone whose reason is at work so that when I hastily light the candle, I may see some human face by my side because, because I'm ashamed to confess it because I'm afraid of being alone. Oh, you don't understand me yet. I am not afraid of any danger. If a man were to come into the room, I should kill him without trembling. I am not afraid of ghosts, nor do I believe in the supernatural. I am not afraid of dead people, for I believe in the total annihilation of every being that disappears from the face of this earth. Well, yes, it must be told, I am afraid of myself, afraid of that horrible sensation of incomprehensible fear. You may laugh if you like. It is terrible, and I cannot get over it. I am afraid of the walls, of the furniture, of the familiar objects, which are animated, as far as I am concerned, by a kind of animal life. Above all, I am afraid of my own dreadful thoughts, of my reason, which seems as if it were about to leave me, driven away by a mysterious and invisible agony. At first I feel a vague uneasiness in my mind, which causes a cold shiver to run all over me. I look around, and of course nothing is to be seen, and I wish that there were something there. No matter what, as long as it were something tangible, I am frightened merely because I cannot understand my own terror. If I speak, I am afraid of my own voice. If I walk, I am afraid of I know not what, behind the door, behind the curtains, in the cupboard or under my bed, and yet all the time I know there is nothing anywhere, and I turn round suddenly because I am afraid of what is behind me, although there is nothing there, and I know it. I become agitated. I fear that my fear increases, and so I shut myself up in my own room, get into bed and hide under the clothes, and there, cowering down, rolled into a ball, I close my eyes in despair and remain thus for an indefinite time, remembering that my candle is alight on the table by my bedside, and that I ought to put it out, and yet I dare not do it. It is very terrible, is it not, to be like that? Formerly I felt nothing of all that. I came home quite calm and went up and down my apartment without anything disturbing my peace of mind. Had anyone told me that I should be attacked by a malady, for I can call it nothing else, of the most improbable fear, such a stupid, terrible malady as it is, I should have laughed outright. I was certainly never afraid of opening the door in the dark. I went to bed slowly, without locking it, and never got up in the middle of the night to make sure that everything was firmly closed. It began last year in a very strange manner on a damp autumn evening. When my servant had left the room, after I had dined, I asked myself what I was going to do. I walked up and down my room for some time, feeling tired without any reason for it, unable to work, and even without energy to read. A fine rain was falling, and I felt unhappy, a prey to those one fits of despondency, without any apparent cause which makes us feel inclined to cry or to talk no matter to whom, so as to shake off our depressing thoughts. I felt that I was alone, and my room seemed to be, to be more empty than ever before. I was in the midst of infinite and overwhelming solitude. What was I to do? I sat down, but a kind of nervous impatience seemed to affect my legs, so I got up and began to walk about again. I was perhaps rather feverish from my hands, which I had clasped behind me, as one often does when walking slowly, almost seemed to burn one another. Then suddenly a cold shiver ran down my back, and I thought the damp air might have penetrated into my rooms, so I lit the fire for the first time that year, and sat down again and looked at the flames. But soon I felt that I could not possibly remain quiet, so I got up again, and determined to go out, to pull myself together, and to find a friend to bear me company. I could not find anyone, so I walked to the boulevard to try and meet some acquaintances or other there. It was wretched everywhere, and the wet pavement glistened in the gaslight 
while the oppressive warmth of the impalpable rain lay heavy over the streets and seemed to obscure the light of the lamps. I went on slowly, saying to myself, I shall not find a soul to talk to. I glanced into several cafés, from the Madeleine as far as the Faubourg Poissonnière, and saw many unhappy-looking individuals sitting at the tables who did not seem to have enough energy left to finish the refreshments they had ordered. For a long time I wandered aimlessly up and down, and about midnight I started for home. I was very calm and very tired. My janitor opened the door at once, and was, which was quite unusual for him, and I thought that another lodger had probably just come in. When I go out, I always double-lock the door of my room, and I found it merely closed, which surprised me. But I suppose that some letters had been brought up for me in the course of the evening. I went in and found my fire still burning so that it lighted up the room a little, and while in the act of taking up the candle, I noticed somebody sitting in my armchair by the fire, warming his feet, with his back towards me. I was not in the slightest degree frightened. I thought, very naturally, that some friend or other had come to see me. No doubt the porter, to whom I had said I was going out, had lent him his own key. In a moment I remembered all the circumstances of my return, how the street door had been opened immediately, and that my own door was only latched and not locked. I could see nothing of my friend but his head, and he had evidently gone to sleep while waiting for me, so I went up to him to rouse him. I saw him quite distinctly. His right arm was hanging down and his legs were crossed. The position of his head which was somewhat inclined to the left of the armchair, seemed to indicate that he was asleep. Who can it be, I asked myself. I could not see clearly as the room was rather dark, so I put out my hand to touch him on the shoulder, and it came in contact with the back of the chair. There was nobody there. The seat was empty. I fairly jumped with fright. For a moment I drew back as if confronted by some terrible danger. Then I turned round again, impelled by an imperious standing upright, panting with fear, so upset that I could not collect my thoughts and ready to faint. But I am a cool man and soon recovered myself. I thought, it is a mere hallucination, that is all. And I immediately began to reflect on this phenomenon. Thoughts fly quickly at such moments. I had been suffering from an hallucination. That was an incontestable fact. My mind had been perfectly lucid and had acted regularly and logically. So there was nothing the matter with the brain. It was only my eyes that had been deceived. They had had a vision, and one of those visions which lead simple folk to believe in miracles. It was a nervous seizure of the optical apparatus. Nothing more. The eyes were rather congested, perhaps. I lit my candle, and when I stooped down to the fire in doing so, I noticed that I was trembling, and I raised myself up with a jump, as if someone had touched me from behind. I was certainly not by any means calm. I walked up and down a little and hummed a tune or two. Then I double-locked the door and felt rather reassured now, at any rate, that no one could come in. I sat down again and thought over my adventure for a long time, and I went to bed and blew out the light. For some minutes all went well. I lay quietly on my back, but presently an irresistible desire seized me to look around the room, and I turned over on my side. My fire was nearly out, and the few glowing embers threw a faint light on the floor by the chair, where I fancy I saw the man sitting again. I quickly struck a match, but I had been mistaken. There was nothing there. I got up, however, and hid the chair behind my bed and tried to get to sleep, as the room was now dark. But I had not forgotten myself for more than five minutes, when in my dream I saw all the scene which I had previously witnessed as clearly as if it were a reality. I woke up with a start, and having lit the candle, sat up in bed, without venturing even to try to go to sleep again. Twice, however, sleep overcame me for a few moments in spite of myself, and twice I saw the same thing again, till I fancied I was going mad. When day broke, however, I thought I was cured and slept peaceably till noon. It was well past and over. I had been feverish, had had the nightmare, I know not what. I had been ill, in fact, but yet thought I was a great fool. I enjoyed myself thoroughly that evening. I dined at a restaurant and afterward went to the theater and then started for home. But as I got near the house, I was once more seized by a strange feeling of uneasiness. I was afraid of seeing him again. I was not afraid of him, not afraid of his presence, in which I did not believe, but I was afraid of being deceived again. I was afraid of some fresh hallucination, afraid least fear should take possession of me. For more than an hour, I wandered up and down the pavement. Then, feeling that I really was too foolish, I returned home. 
I breathed so hard I could hardly get upstairs and remained standing outside my door for more than ten minutes. Then suddenly I had a courageous impulse and my will asserted itself. I inserted my key into the lock and went into the apartment with a candle in my hand. I kicked open my bedroom door, which was partly open, and cast a frightened glance toward the fireplace. There was nothing there. Ah, what a relief. What a delight. What a deliverance. I walked up and down briskly and boldly, but I was not altogether reassured and kept turning around with a jump. The very shadows on the corner disquieted me. I slept badly and was constantly disturbed by imaginary noises, but did not see him. No, that was all over. Since that time, I have been afraid of being alone at night. I feel that the specter is there, close to me, around me, but has not appeared to me again. And supposing it did, what would it matter, since I do not believe in it and know that it is nothing? However, it still worries me because I am constantly thinking of it, his right arm hanging down and his head inclined to the left like a man who was asleep. I don't want to think about it. Why, however, am I so persistently possessed with this idea? His feet were close to the fire. He haunts me. It is very stupid, but who and what is he? I know that he does not exist except in my cowardly imagination, in my fears, in my agony. There, enough of that. Yes, it is all very well for me to reason with myself, to stiffen my backbone, so to say, but I cannot remain at home because I know he is there. I know I shall not see him again. He will not show himself again. That is all over. But he is there all the same in my thoughts. He remains invisible, but that does not prevent his being there. He is behind the doors, in the clothes cupboard, in the wardrobe, under the bed, in every dark corner. If I open the door of the cupboard, if I take the candle to look under the bed and throw a light on the dark places, he is there no longer, but I fear that he is behind me. I turn around certain that I shall not see him, that I shall never see him again. But for all that, he is behind me. It is very stupid. It is dreadful. But what am I to do? I cannot help it. But if there were two of us in the place, I feel certain that he would not be there any longer. For he is there just because I am alone. Simply and solely because I am alone. End of The Terror The Thing by Frank Marion Palmer From Weird Tales, April 1924 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman A Tale of Supernatural Adventure The Thing by Frank Marion Palmer it is easy to recall it, bit by bit, just as it occurred, though it should have been forgotten long ago. I can, even now, visualize the thing as I saw it, in all its frightfulness. Time has accentuated the memory of that haunting half-hour. The immediate result of my enervating experience was a benumbing of the senses a partial paralysis of the mind. The frenzied fear, the gripping horror of it, came to me later, when miles away from the scene of its occurrence. I had retired late. My room, number 307, was on the third floor of a downtown hotel. Which town and which hotel, for good and sufficient reasons, I shall not say. Several cups of strong coffee had rendered sleep out of the question. The weather was warm, but a damp, sticky, smoke-laden liaise, due to the crowded shipping that lay in the harbor below, penetrated everything. I fancy the night was dark, but the electric glare of the city turned the night into day. At last, lulled by the stillness within, and the hum of the city which came to me through the open window, I slept. My sleep was dreamless, leaden unconsciousness, far from refreshing. Then came the introduction to my unusual experience. I could never explain why I heard it so distinctly. 
sound asleep my ears were painfully smitten by a dull heavy sickening smothering explosion i was awake and alert in an instant trying to account for it light of day was palling the electric glare and the objects were plainly visible within the room without my open window i could see through the dark blue murk the outlines of buildings across the street the serrated skyline far above i got up stretched and yawned took a turn around the room lit a cigarette and laid down again i had not accounted for the noise but finally concluded that it came from some natural cause apparently out on the street at any rate I thought no more about it as I lay there enjoying my morning smoke. I was about to doze again when the room was suddenly filled, saturated with the vilest smell of burned powder I have ever encountered. It was absolutely sickening and seemed mingled with the smell of burning human flesh. The stench that hangs over a battlefield the morning after a carnage. So I said to myself, that explosion was in this building, on the third floor, and not far from my room. I was still reclining, and had taken another cigarette, when the thing came into my room, putting an end to all thought of immediate investigation. It came in through the wide-open window from the fire escape. Its shape was that of a human body, entirely nude, perfectly distinct in outline and detail, yet lacking in the extremities, a torso only, so distinct and lifelike that I could see the folds of flesh, the contour of muscles, the pink-yellow color of skin, and yet so transparent was it, the window casing, the figured wallpaper, the outlines of the dresser, and everything it passed were visible through it, as plainly discernible as though it were not there. It floated in, slowly, slowly, as a mist of early morning might enter one's casement, or a wisp of smoke, wafted in on a stray breeze, insubstantial, filmy, yet seeming to have the substance of flesh and blood. The head of my bed was exactly opposite the window and I had splendid vantage for contemplation. I was not long in discovering the incompleteness of that spectral visitor. It lacked hands and forearms. The lower extremities were cut off above the knees, and, to complete the phantasmal horror of it, there was no head upon those broad, powerful shoulders, only the stump of a muscular neck. The awfulness of this armless, legless, headless shape was intensified by the fact that the extremity of each truncated member seemed to drip red blood. All this I saw as it floated into my room through the open window, a ghastly shape that defied description, while I was breathing the stench of a day-old battlefield. And now the last, the most weird detail of all, the most inexplicable, the one that indeed filled me with astonishment, was yet to come. Between my open window and the door, against the wall, stood a dresser surmounted by a large plate-glass mirror. As the thing advanced, floated through my room, to melt, vanish, or draw through the solid panels of my door, it, perforce, must pass by this mirror. So clear was my mind in those trying moments that I had dwelt upon this very fact as the thing advanced, and had speculated as to what the reflection of the spectre would be like. Let science explain this singular phenomenon. I cannot. The reflection of my spectre was no spectre at all. It was the solid, substantial, flesh, blood, and bone 
of a six-foot man, about thirty years of age, not lacking a single member, perfect in color, form, feature, as nude as the day he was born, gracefully floating by the big looking-glass, his eyes closed, a contented smile lighting up his handsome features, much like one asleep, whose face is transfigured by a pleasant dream. And then, just as the figure was floating free of the glass, as the bevel on the edge of the plate began to distort the otherwise perfect lineaments, the head was turned by some odd movement of the body. The eyes opened and looked straight into mine. With a start, I half rose and called out, Arnold! Oh, Arnold! Is it? Can it be? Even as I called, foolishly, idiotically, pleadingly, in a hollow, unnatural voice, I knew there would be, could be, no response. For an instant, fear, fear that he might heed my cry, that he might delay his noiseless flight through my room, gripped my throat, and stilled my voice. But now the apparition, out of the glass, was at the door. Through it I could plainly see the outline of the door casings, and it was becoming less and less. It was gone. The phantom drew through the locked and bolted door as a vapor through the mesh of a sieve. Such was the thing that visited me in my room on the morning of September 7th. As soon as it was gone, my feet touched the floor. I unlocked the door and went into the hall. All was quiet out there. I heard no sound, smelled no burning powder. If there were guests in the other rooms, they all must have been sound asleep. One could have heard a mouse creep in the gloomy hallway. I closed the door and got into bed. When I awoke again, the clanging jar of the street traffic told me it was late. I bathed, shaved, and dressed. As I walked down the hall and took the elevator to the office, I scanned the faces of the late risers. There was no look of surprise, curiosity, consternation, on as single set of features. All was as commonplace as upon any other morning. Nothing unusual had happened. And such was the effect on those passing and repassing guests that my harrowing experience of the early morning began to seem unreal and all but passed for the time out of my memory at the office i paid my bill listened to the commonplace talk of the garrulous clerk and went away without having mentioned a word of my experience on the stage homeward bound a chat with a seatmate and the beauty of the autumn foliage painting the borders of the highway red brown and yellow occupied my attention but when i arrived at maple shadows i was silent no longer i horrified my wife and daughter until they ran away from me then i followed them up that arnold matthews was killed at chateau thierry you told me so said my daughter he was i saw him killed with my own eyes his legs arms and head blown into bits by an exploding bomb dropped from the air not a shred of his clothing remained and this one ugh do go away you make me shudder oh daddy how awful from the sheer lack of an audience i desisted watch the papers tonight and tomorrow I ventured again at the dinner table. A man committed suicide this morning at the Savoy Hotel. How he did it, I am not yet prepared to say. But I should think that, owing to the character of the explosion and the appearance of the thing after, my wife stopped me with a gesture. George, that is not a nice subject for the dinner table. Well, I reiterated, unwilling to be squelched so suddenly 
He killed himself, just the same, in a room across the hall from mine. You'll see. Watch the papers. And this is what we read in the evening paper. Suicide at the Savoy Hotel Arnold Matthews, a guest at the Savoy Hotel, occupying room 308, committed suicide last night, or early this morning. About the middle of the afternoon, when it was found that the man would not respond to repeated knocking, and that the door was locked from the inside, the room was broken into. A gruesome sight met the eyes of the landlord, clerks, and officers of the law. On the bed, in a sitting position, braced against the footboard, and swathed in all the blankets the room contained, was found the dead body of Matthews. Thorough examination of the mutilated body, together with bits of evidence found on the bed and elsewhere in the room, led those present to believe that the deceased had attached a piece of fuse to a large dynamite cap, placed the cap in his mouth, raised his feet and legs from the floor, then, covering himself completely with blankets, sheets, pillows, and his own clothing, the man was entirely naked, lighted the fuse, and deliberately folded his arms, calmly awaiting the end. The bed, floor, walls, and ceiling were bespattered with blood. The body was a ghastly sight. Nothing but the trunk was left to indicate that the remains had once been a human being. Arnold Matthews was about twenty-eight years of age, six feet in height, light complexion, brown hair, and eyes. He was a stranger to the city, and an effort is being made to locate some friend or relative. The motive is still unknown. No one has yet been found who heard the sound of the explosion. This is not strange, as the entire third floor, with the exception of two rooms, Matthew's room and the one opposite, was unoccupied. The officers are trying to locate one G. R. Lawton, an ex-army surgeon, the man who slept in number 307, the room opposite to the one occupied by Arnold Matthews last night. The End of The Thing by Frank Marion Palmer The Vacant Lot by Mary Wilkins This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Veronica Mead The Vacant Lot by Mary Wilkins When it became generally known in Townsend Center that the Townsends were going to move to the city, there was great excitement and dismay. For the Townsends to move was about equivalent to the town's moving. The Townsend ancestors had founded the village a hundred years ago. The first Townsend had kept a wayside hostelry for man and beast known as the Sign of the Leopard. The signboard on which the leopard was painted a bright blue was still extant, and prominently so, being nailed over the present Townsend's front door. This Townsend, by name David, kept the village store. There had been no tavern since the railroad was built through Townsend Center in his father's day. Therefore the family, being outsed by the march of progress from their chosen employment, took up with a general country store as being the next thing to a country tavern, the principal difference consisting in the fact that all the guests were transients, never requiring bedchambers, securing their rest on the tops of sugar and flour barrels and codfish boxes, and the refreshment from stray nibblings at the stock and trade, to the profitless deplenishment of raisins and loaf sugar and crackers and cheese. The flitting of the Townsends from the home of their ancestors was due to a sudden access of wealth from the death of a relative, and the desire of Mrs. Townsend to secure better advantages for her son George, sixteen years old, in the way of education, and for her daughter Adriana, ten years old, better matrimonial opportunities. However, this last inducement for leaving Townsend Center was not openly stated, only ingeniously surmised by the neighbors. 
Sarah Townsend don't think there's anybody in Townsend Center fit for her Adriana to marry, and so she's going to take her to Boston to see if she can't pick up somebody there, they said. Then they wondered what Abel Lyons would do. He had been a humble suitor for Adriana for years, but her mother had not approved, and Adriana, who was dutiful, had repulsed him delicately and rather sadly. He was the only lover whom she had ever had, and she felt sorry and grateful. She was a plain, awkward girl, and had a patient recognition of the fact. But her mother was ambitious, more so than her father, who was rather pugnaciously satisfied with what he had, and not easily disposed to change. However, he yielded to his wife and consented to sell out his business and purchase a house in Boston and move there. David Townsend was curiously unlike the line of ancestors from whom he had come. He had either retrograded or advanced, as one might look at it. His moral character was certainly better, but he had not the fiery spirit and eager grasp at advantage which had distinguished them. Indeed, the old Townsends, though prominent and respected as men of property and influence, had reputations not above suspicions. There was more than one dark whisper regarding them handed down from mother to son in the village, and especially was this true of the first Townsend, he who built the tavern bearing the sign of the Blue Leopard. His portrait, a hideous effort of contemporary art, hung in the garret of David Townsend's home. There was many a tale of wild roistering, if no worse, in that old roadhouse, and high stakes, and quarreling in cups, and blows, and money gotten in evil fashion, and the matter hushed up with a high hand for inquirers by the imperious Townsends, who terrorized everybody. David Townsend terrorized nobody. He had gotten his little competence from his store by honest methods. The exchanging of sterling goods and true weights for country produce and country shillings. He was sober and reliable, with intense self-respect and a decided talent for the management of money. It was principally for this reason that he took great delight in his sudden wealth by legacy. He had thereby greater opportunities for the exercise of his native shrewdness in a bargain. This he evinced in his purchase of a house in Boston. One day in spring the old Townsend house was shut up. The blue leopard was taken carefully down from his lair over the front door. The family chattels were loaded on the train, and the Townsends departed. It was a sad and eventful day for the Townsend Center. A man from Barr had rented the store. David had decided at the last not to sell, and the old familiars congregated in melancholy fashion and talked over the situation. An enormous pride over their departed townsmen became evident. They paraded him, flaunting him like a banner in the eyes of the new man. David is awful smart, they said. There won't nobody get the better of him in the city if he has lived in Townsend Center all his life. He's got his eyes open. Nobody paid for his house in Boston? Well, sir, that house cost $25,000, and David, he bought it for five. Yes, sir, he did. Must have been some out about it, remarked the new man, scowling over his counter. He was beginning to feel his disparaging situation. Not an out, sir, David made sure, aunt. Catching him getting bit, everything, was an apple pie order, hot and cold, water and all, in one of the best locations of the city, real high up street. David, he said the rent in the street was never under a thousand. Yes, sir. David, he got a bargain. Five thousand dollars for a twenty-five thousand dollar house. Some out about it, growled the new man over the counter. However, as his fellow townsman and ally stated, there seemed to be no doubt about the desirableness of the city house which David Townsend had purchased, and the fact that he had secured it for an absurdly low price. The whole family were at first suspicious. It was ascertained that the house had cost a round sum only a few years ago. It was in perfect repair. Nothing whatever was amiss with plumbing, furnace, anything. There was not even a soap factory within smelling distance, as Mrs. Townsend had vaguely surmised. She was sure that she had heard of houses being undesirable for such reasons, but there was no soap factory. They all sniffed and peeked. When the first rainfall came, they looked at the ceiling, confidently expecting to see dark spots where the leaks had commenced, but there were none. They were forced to confess that their suspicions were allayed, that the house was perfect, even overshadowed with the mystery of a lower price than it was worth. That, however, was an additional perfection in the opinion of the Townsends, who had their share of New England thrift. They had lived just one month in their new house, and were happy, although at times somewhat lonely from missing the society of Townsend Center when the trouble began.
the Townsends, although they lived in a fine house in a genteel, almost fashionable part of the city, were true to their antecedents and kept, as they had been accustomed, only one maid. She was the daughter of a farmer on the outskirts of their native village, was middle-aged, and had lived with them for the last ten years. One pleasant Monday morning, she rose early and did the family washing before breakfast, which had been prepared by Mrs. Townsend and Adriana, as was their habit on washing days. The family were seated at the breakfast table in their basement dining room, and this maid, whose name was Cordelia, was hanging out the clothes in the vacant lot. This vacant lot seemed a valuable one, being on a corner. It was rather singular that it had not been built upon. The Townsends had wondered at it and agreed that they would have preferred their own house to be there. They had, however, utilized it as far as possible with their innocent, rural disregard of property rights in unoccupied land. We might just as well hang out our washing in that vacant lot, Mrs. Townsend had told Cordelia the first Monday of their stay in the house. Our little yard ain't half big enough for all our clothes, and it's sunnier there, too. So Cordelia had hung out the wash there for four Mondays, and this was the fifth. The breakfast was about half finished. They had reached the buckwheat cakes, when this maid came rushing into the dining room and stood regarding them, speechless, with a countenance indicative of the utmost horror. She was deadly pale, her hands sodden with soap suds, hung twitching at her sides in the folds of her calico gown. Her very hair which was light and sparse, seemed to bristle with fear. All the Townsends turned and looked at her. David and George rose with a half-defined idea of burglars. Cordelia battles, what is the matter? cried Mrs. Townsend. Adriana gasped for breath and turned as white as the maid. What is the matter? repeated Mrs. Townsend, but the maid was unable to speak. Mrs. Townsend, who could be peremptory, sprang up, ran to the frightened woman, and shook her violently. Cordelia battles, you speak, she said and not stand there staring that way, as if you were struck dumb. What is the matter with you? Then Cordelia spoke in a fainting voice. There's somebody else hanging out clothes in the vacant lot. She gasped and clutched at a chair for support. Who? cried Mrs. Townsend, rousing to indignation, for already she had assumed a proprietorship in the vacant lot. Is it the folks in the next house? I'd like to know what right they have. We are next to that vacant lot. I dunno who it is, gasped Cordelia. Why, we've seen that girl next door go to Mass every morning, said Mrs. Townsend. She's got a fiery red head. Seems as if you might know her by this time, Cordelia. It ain't that girl, gasped Cordelia. Then she added in a horror-stricken voice, I couldn't see who twas. They all stared. Why couldn't you see, demanded her mistress. Are you struck blind? No, ma'am. Then why couldn't you see? All I could see was, Cordelia hesitated, with an expression of the utmost horror. Go on, said Mrs. Townsend, impatiently. All I could see was the shadow of somebody, very slim, hanging out the clothes, and... What? I could see the shadows of the things flapping on their line. You couldn't see the clothes? Only the shadow on the ground. What kind of clothes were they? Queer, replied Cordelia, with a shudder. If I didn't know you so well, I should think you had been drinking, said Mrs. Townsend. Now, Cordelia Battles, I'm going out in that vacant lot and see myself what you're talking about. I can't go, gasped the woman. With that, Mrs. Townsend and all the others, except Adriana, who remained to tremble with the maid, sallied forth into the vacant lot. They had to go out the area gate into the street to reach it. It was nothing unusual in the way of vacant lots. One large poplar tree, the relic of the old forest which had once flourished there, twinkled in one corner. For the rest, it was overgrown with coarse weeds and a few dusty flowers. The Townsend stood just inside the rude board fence, which divided the lot from the street and stared with wonder and horror. For Cordelia had told the truth. They all saw what she had described. The shadow of an exceedingly slim woman moving along the ground with upstretched arms, the shadows of strange, nondescript garments flapping from a shadowy line. But when they looked up for the substance of the shadows, nothing was to be seen except the clear, blue October air. My goodness, gasped Mrs. Townsend. Her face assumed a strange gathering of wrath in the midst of her terror. Suddenly she made a determined move forward, although her husband strove to hold her back. You let me be, she said. She moved forward. Then she recoiled and gave a loud shriek. 
The wet sheet flapped in my face, she cried. Take me away, take me away. Then she fainted. Between them they got her back to the house. It was awful, she moaned when she came to herself, with the family all around her where she lay on the dining room floor. Oh, David, what do you suppose it is? Nothing at all, replied David Townsend stoutly. He was remarkable for courage and staunch belief in actualities. He was now denying to himself that he had seen anything unusual. Oh, there was, moaned his wife. I saw something, said George, in a sullen, boyish face. The maid sobbed convulsively, and so did Adriana for sympathy. We won't talk any about it, said David. Here, Jane, you drink this hot tea. It will do you good. And Cordelia, you hang out the clothes in our own yard. George, you go and put up the line for her. The line is out there, said George, with a jerk of his shoulder. Are you afraid? No, I ain't, replied the boy resentfully, and went out with a pale face. After that, Cordelia hung the Townsend wash in the yard of their own house, standing always with her back to the vacant lot. As for David Townsend, he spent a good deal of his time in the lot watching the shadows, but he came to no explanation, although he strove to satisfy himself with many. I guess the shadows come from the smoke from our chimneys, or else the poplar tree, he said. Why do the shadows come on Monday mornings and no other, demanded his wife. David was silent. Very soon new mysteries arose. One day Cordelia rang the dinner bell at their usual dinner hour, the same as in Townsend Center, high noon, and the family assembled. With amazement, Adriana looked at the dishes on the table. Why, that's queer, she said. What's queer? asked her mother. Cordelia stopped short as she was about setting a tumbler of water beside a plate, and the water slopped over. Why, said Adriana, her face paling, I thought there was boiled dinner. I smelt cabbage cooking. I knew there would something else come up, gasped Cordelia, leaning hard on the back of Adriana's chair. What do you mean? asked Mrs. Townsend sharply. But her own face began to assume the shocked pallor which it was so easy nowadays for all their faces to assume at the merest suggestion of anything out of the common. I smelt cabbage cooking all the morning up in my room, Adriana said faintly, and here's codfish and potatoes for dinner. The Townsends all looked at one another. David rose with an exclamation and rushed out of the room. The others waited tremblingly. When he came back, his face was lowering. What did you? Mrs. Townsend asked hesitatingly. There's some smell of cabbage out there, he admitted reluctantly. Then he looked at her with a challenge. It comes from the next house, he said. Blows over our house. Our house is higher. I don't care. You can never account for such things. Cordelia, said Mrs. Townsend. You go over to the next house and you ask if they've got cabbage for dinner. Cordelia switched out of the room. Her mouth set hard. She came back promptly. Says they never have cabbage, she announced with a gloomy triumph and a conclusive glance at Mr. Townsend. Their girl was real sassy. Oh, father, let's move away. Let's sell the house, cried Adriana in a panic-stricken tone. If you think I'm going to sell a house that I got as cheap as this one because we smell cabbage in a vacant lot, you're mistaken, replied David firmly. It isn't the cabbage alone, said Mrs. Townsend. In a few shadows, added David, I am tired of such nonsense. I thought you had more sense, Jane. One of the boys at school asked me if we lived in the house next to the vacant lawn on Well Street and whistled when I said yes, remarked George. Let him whistle, said Mr. Townsend. After a few hours, the family, stimulated by Mr. Townsend's calm, common sense, agreed that it was exceedingly foolish to be disturbed by a mysterious odor of cabbage. They even laughed at themselves. I suppose we have got so nervous over those shadows hanging out clothes that we notice every little thing, conceded Mrs. Townsend. You will find out some day that that is no more to be regarded than the cabbage, said her husband. You can't account for that wet sheet hitting my face, said Mrs. Townsend, doubtfully. You imagined it. I felt it. That afternoon, things went on as usual in the household, until nearly four o'clock. Adriana went downtown to do some shopping. Mrs. Townsend sat sewing beside the bay window in her room, which is a front one in the third story. George had not got home. Mr. Townsend was writing a letter in the library. Cordelia was busy in the basement. The twilight, which was coming earlier and earlier every night, was beginning to gather, when suddenly there was a loud crash which shook the house from its foundations. Even the dishes on the sideboard rattled, and the glasses rang like bells. 
the pictures on the walls of mrs townsend's room swung out from the walls but that was not all every looking-glass in the house cracked simultaneously as nearly as they could judge from top to bottom then shivered into fragments over the floors mrs townsend was too frightened to scream she sat huddled in her chair gasping for breath her eyes rolling from side to side in incredulous terror turned toward the street she saw a great black group of people crossing it just in front of the vacant lot there was something inexpressibly strange and gloomy about this moving group there was an effect of sweeping wavings and foldings of sable draperies and gleams of deadly white faces then they passed she twisted her head to see and they disappeared in the vacant lot mr townsend came hurrying into her room he was pale and looked at once angry and alarmed did you fall he asked inconsequently as if his wife who was small could have produced such a manifestation by a fall oh david what is it whispered mrs townsend darned if i know said david don't swear it's too awful oh see the looking-glass david i see it the one over the library mantel is broken too oh it is a sign of death cordelia's feet were heard as she staggered on the stairs she almost fell into the room she reeled over to mr townsend and clutched his arm he cast a sideways glance half furious half commiserating at her well what is it all about he asked i don't know what is it oh what is it the looking glass in the kitchen is broken all over the floor oh oh what is it i don't know any more than you do i didn't do it looking glass is broken is a sign of death in the house said cordelia if it's me i hope i'm ready but i'd rather die than be so scared as i've been lately mr townsend shook himself loose and eyed the two trembling women with gathering resolution now look here both of you he said this is nonsense you'll die sure enough of fright if you keep on this way i was a fool myself to be startled everything it is is an earthquake oh david gasped his wife not much reassured it is nothing but an earthquake persisted mr townsend it acted just like that things always are broken on the walls and the middle of the room isn't affected i've read about it suddenly mrs townsend gave a loud shriek and pointed how do you account for that she cried if it's an earthquake oh 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 she was on the verge of hysterics her husband held her firmly by the arm as his eyes followed the direction of her rigid pointing finger cordelia looked also her eyes seeming converged to a bright point of fear on the floor in front of the broken looking-glass lay a mass of black stuff in a gruesome long ridge it's something you drop there almost shouted mr townsend it ain't oh mr townsend dropped his wife's arm and took one stride toward the object it was a very long crape veil he lifted it and it floated out from his arm as if imbued with electricity it's yours he said to his wife oh david i never had one you know oh you know i shouldn't unless you died how came it there i'm darned if i know said david regarding it he was deadly pale but still resentful rather than afraid don't hold it don't i like to know what in the thunder all this means said david he gave the thing an angry toss and it fell on the floor in exactly the same long heap as before cordelia began to weep with racking sobs mrs townsend reached out and caught her husband's hand clutching it hard with ice-cold fingers what's got into this house anyhow he growled you'll have to sell it oh david we can't live here as for my selling a house i paid only five thousand for when it's worth twenty-five for any such nonsense as this i won't david gave one stride toward the black veil but it rose from the floor and moved away before him across the room at exactly the same height as if suspended from a woman's head he pursued it clutching vainly all around the room then he swung himself on his heel with an exclamation and the thing fell to the floor again in the long heap then were heard hurrying feet on the stairs and adriana burst into the room she ran straight to her father and clutched his arm she tried to speak but she chattered unintelligibly her face was blue her father shook her violently adriana do you have more sense he cried oh david how can you talk so sobbed her mother i can't help it i'm mad said he with emphasis what has got into this house and you all anyhow what is it adriana poor child asked her mother only look what has happened here it's an earthquake said her father staunchly nothing to be afraid of how do you account for that 
said Mrs. Townsend in an awful voice, pointing to the veil. Adriana did not look. She was too engrossed with her own terrors. She began to speak in a breathless voice. I was coming by the vacant lot, she panted, and I, I had my new hat in a paper bag and a parcel of blue ribbon and I saw a crowd, an awful, oh, a whole crowd of people with white faces as if they were dressed all in black. Where are they now? I don't know. Oh, Adriana sank gasping feebly into a chair. Get her some water, David, sobbed her mother. David rushed with an impatient exclamation out of the room and returned with a glass of water, which he held to his daughter's lips. Here, drink this, he said roughly. Oh, David, how can you speak so? sobbed his wife. I can't help it. I'm mad clean through, said David. Then there was a hard bound upstairs, and George entered. He was very white, but he grinned at them with an appearance of unconcern. Hello, he said in a shaking voice, which he tried to control. What on earth's to pay in that vacant lot now? Well, what is it? demanded his father. Oh, nothing, only, well, there are lights over it exactly as if there was a house there, just about where the windows would be. It looked as if you could walk right in, but when you look close, there are those old dried-up weeds rattling away on the ground the same as ever. I looked at it and couldn't believe my eyes. A woman saw it, too. She came along just as I did. She gave one look, then she screeched and ran. I waited for someone else, but nobody came. Mr. Townsend rushed out of the room. I dare say it'll be gone when he gets there, began George. Then he stared around the room. What's to pay here? he cried. Oh, George, the whole house shook all at once, and all the looking glasses broke, wailed his mother, and Adriana and Cordelia joined. George whistled with pale lips, then Mr. Townsend entered. Well, asked George, see anything? I don't want to talk, said his father. I stood just about enough. We've got to sell out and go back to Townsend Center, cried his wife in a wild voice. Oh, David, say you'll go back. I won't go back for any such nonsense as this, and sell a $25,000 house for 5000 said he firmly. But that very night, his resolution was shaken. The whole family watched together in the dining room. They were all afraid to go to bed, that is, all except possibly Mr. Townsend. Mrs. Townsend declared firmly that she, for one, would leave that awful house and go back to Townsend Center, whether he came or not, unless they all stayed together and watched and Mr. Townsend yielded. They chose the dining room for the reason that it was nearer the street, should they wish to make their egress hurriedly, and they took up their station around the dining table on which Cordelia had placed a luncheon. It looks exactly as if we were watching with a corpse, she said in a horror-stricken whisper. Hold your tongue if you can't talk sense, said Mr. Townsend. The dining room was very large, finished in oak, with a dark blue paper above the wainscoting. The old sign of the tavern, the Blue Leopard, hung over the mantel shelf. Mr. Townsend had insisted on hanging it there. He had a curious pride in it. The family sat together until after midnight, and nothing unusual happened. Mrs. Townsend began to nod. Mr. Townsend read the paper ostentatiously. Adriana and Cordelia stared with roving eyes about the room, then at each other, as if comparing notes on terror. George had a book, which he studied furtively. All at once, Adriana gave a startled exclamation, and Cordelia echoed her. George whistled faintly. Mrs. Townsend awoke with a start, and Mr. Townsend's paper rattled to the floor. Look, gasped Adriana. The sign of the blue leopard over the shelf glowed as if a lantern hung over it. The radiance was thrown from above. It grew brighter and brighter as they watched. The blue leopard seemed to crouch and spring with life. Then the door into the front hall opened the outer door, which had been carefully locked. It squeaked, and they all recognized it. They sat staring. Mr. Townsend was as transfixed as the rest. They heard the outer door shut. Then the door into the room swung open, and slowly that awful black group of people, which they had seen in the afternoon, entered. The Townsends with one accord rose and huddled together in a far corner. They all held to each other and stared. The people, their faces gleaming with the whiteness of death, their black robes, waving and folding, crossed the room. They were a trifle above mortal height, or seemed so to the terrified eyes which saw them. They reached the mantel shelf, where the signboard hung, 
then a black draped long arm was seen to rise and make a motion as if plying a knocker then the whole company passed out of sight as if through the wall and the room was as before mrs townsend was shaking in a nervous chill adriana was almost fainting cordelia was in hysterics david townsend stood glaring in a curious way at the sign of the blue leopard george stared at him with a look of horror there was something in his father's face which made him forget everything else at last he touched his arm timidly father he whispered david turned and regarded him with a look of rage and fury then his face cleared he passed his hand over his forehead good lord what did come to me he muttered you looked like that awful picture of old tom townsend in the garret in townsend center father whimpered the boy shuddering should think i might look like most any old cuss after such darned work as this growled david but his face was white go and pour out some hot tea for your mother he ordered the boy sharply he himself shook cordelia violently stop such actions he shouted in her ears and shook her again ain't you a church member he demanded what be you afraid of you ain't done nothing wrong have ye then cordelia quoted scripture in a burst of sobs and laughter behold i was sharpened in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me she cried out if i ain't done wrong maybe them has come before me dead and when the evil one and the powers of darkness is abroad i'm liable i'm liable then she laughed loud and long and shrill if you don't hush up said david but still with that white terror and horror on his own face i'll bundle you out in the vacant lot whether or no i mean it then cordelia was quiet after one wild roll of her eyes at him the colour was returning to adriana's cheeks her mother was drinking hot tea in spasmodic gulps it's after midnight she gasped and i don't believe they'll come again to-night do you david no i don't said david conclusively oh david we mustn't stay another night in this awful house we won't to-morrow we'll pack off bag and baggage to townsend center if it takes all the fire department to move us said david adriana smiled in the midst of her terror she thought of abel lyons the next day mr townsend went to the real estate agent who had sold him the house it's no use he said i can't stand it sell the house for what you can get i'll give it away rather than keep it then he added a few strong words as to his opinion on parties who sold him such an establishment but the agent pleaded innocent for the most part all alone i suspected something wrong when the owner who pledged me to secrecy as to his name told me to sell that place for what i could get and did not limit me i had never heard anything but i began to suspect something was wrong then i made a few inquiries and found out that there was a rumor in the neighborhood that there was something out of the usual about the vacant lot i had wondered myself why it wasn't built upon there was a story about its being undertaken once and the contract made and the contractor dying then another man took it and one of the workmen was killed on his way to dig the cellar and the other struck i didn't pay much attention to it i never believed much in that sort of thing anyhow and then too i couldn't find out that there had ever been anything wrong about the house itself except as the people who had lived there were said to have seen and heard queer things in the vacant lot so i thought you might be able to get along especially as you didn't look like a man who was timid and the house was such a bargain as i never handled before but this you tell me is beyond belief do you know the names of the people who formerly owned the vacant lot asked mr townsend i don't know for certain replied the agent for the original owners flourished long before your or my day but i do know that the lot goes by the name of the old gadsden lot what's the matter are you ill no it's nothing replied mr townsend get what you can for the house perhaps another family might not be as troubled as we have been i hope you're not going to leave the city said the agent urbanely i'm going back to townsend center as fast as steam can carry me after we get packed up and out of that cursed house replied mr david townsend he did not tell the agent nor any of his family what had caused him to start when told the name of the former owners of the lot he remembered all at once the story of a ghastly murder which had taken place in the blue leopard the victim's name was gaston and the murder had never been discovered end of the vacant lot by mary wilkins